Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. The 16th June 1991, West Ware Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. A few weeks of driving around didn't do me any good, Jeff thought while he ran back to his parents' house. He ran up to Enfield Village this morning, a round trip of about five miles. Five miles was a typical run for him, but the last mile proved harder than expected. There's no reason to slack off just because you're not a soldier anymore, Airborne. Now suck it up. The world still slept, though the sun was already over the horizon at quarter to six. Multiple groups calling cadence while they ran around Enfield were absent. The silence was abnormal after years of morning PT formations. Walking back into his parents' house also felt unusual to him. It was no longer his house. I Jeff took a quick shower before heading to the kitchen. He started the coffee maker once there and then began mixing waffle batter. Two pounds of locally cured bacon went into the oven to cook. The bacon wouldn't curl and since it was a self-cleaning oven, he didn't have to worry about the spatter. A cantaloupe was his next sacrifice to the gods of breakfast. Can you move to Boston so I can get this kind of service every morning? Kara asked when she entered. She poured herself a mug of coffee, mixing in an unholy amount of sugar and cream. You want any coffee with that? Watch it, Buster. I'll bite your kneecaps. Kara put her coffee mug down to hug her big brother. She enjoyed the relationship they built during high school before he graduated and missed that during the last four years. She knew that they'd never recapture that kind of closeness as adults, but she still wanted to have a good relationship with her brother. Well, doesn't this warm my heart? Marissa asked, smiling at her two children from the doorway. Morning, Mom, they said in stereo. What's on the menu? Waffles, bacon, cantaloupe, juice, coffee, Jeff announced. I'm going to miss this when you move out again, Jeff, Marisa sighed. Jeff raised an eyebrow. What? You were in the army for four years, Jeff. You were wounded in Panama. Lost your best friend in the Iraqi desert. You're still my little boy, but you're not a little boy any longer. You won't be here forever. Jeff smiled sadly at his mother. You're right, Mom. On my run, I saw that Bilzerians is looking for help again. Physical labor was good for me in high school, and it should be good for me now. I might even be able to get out onto the floor helping the customers instead of hiding in the stock area. You should go by anyway. Why? They lost Mr. Bilzerian Sr. a month ago. Jeff closed his eyes. Another death. I'll go by right after breakfast. I'm also going over to Swerve to ask about EMT classes. EMT classes? What brought this on? That accident in Ohio, I ran into one of the firefighters who responded the morning I left. He said I have a future in that line of work, that I have good skills. Plus, I helped a little boy and his mom that day. That felt pretty good. I don't have anything else lined up, so I might as well check that out. I can see you doing that. Kara commented. Jeff walked into Bilzerian's hardware for the first time since high school. Displays stood in different spots advertising different products, but the mix of faint chemical smells was the same. He smiled at the memories. He'd enjoyed working here. Can I help you, sir? A young man asked him. Jeff read the boy's name tag. He blinked in surprise. Charlie? Charlie Bilzerian? Yes, sir. Holy cow! Charlie! It's Jeff Knox. When did you grow up? You were nine just yesterday. Hi, Mr. Knox. Yeah, mom and dad say the same thing. Charlie laughed. I'll be a senior in high school in the fall. A senior? Oh, geez. And what's this Mr. Knox nonsense? Do I look like my dad, Charlie? You used to call me Jeff. They shared a chuckle. I just got home yesterday, Charlie. I'm sorry to hear about your grandfather. Charlie's face turned somber. Thanks, Jeff. I know he was 85, but he was granddad, you know. I do. Time gets all of us eventually. Is your dad here today? He's upstairs trying to clean out granddad's apartment. The Bilzerian family lived above the store for decades. Mr. B, Jr., moved out when he went to college. Mr. B, Sr., lived alone in the apartment after Mrs. Bilzerian died in 1979. Okay, if I go up to see him? 
He'd appreciate seeing you. Every summer I hear him mutter, none of the high school kids I hire have been worth a damn since Jeff Knox. Present company excluded, of course. Yeah, right. The standards are twice as high for me as the third generation Bilzerian in the store. I don't mind though, since I want to be in the business like dad and granddad. How can I lower the boom on someone someday if I don't measure up to begin with? Good attitude, Charlie. That'll serve you well down the road. Don't be too hard on yourself, though. Charlie nodded. Come on through the back. You can use the back stairs by the loading dock. Charlie led him through the stock area. The current crop of summer help stared at the man following Charlie. Go on up. Good to see you again, Jeff. You too, Charlie. Jeff took the stairs two at a time. Charlie? Mr. B's voice called from inside the apartment when Jeff entered the kitchen from the back deck. Is that you? Not quite, Mr. B. Where do you want me to drop the ten pallets of manure? Steve Bilzerian looked down the back hall with surprise on his face. Jeff Knox? How the hell are you? Jeff shook hands with his first boss. Better now that I'm home, sir. Mom told me about your dad this morning, sir. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thanks, Jeff. Have a seat. The two men sat at the kitchen table. To be honest, I'm surprised Dad lived this long. I thought for sure he'd follow right after Mom, but he hung in there. I'm glad Charlie got the chance to know him. I'm glad I got the chance too, sir. I know he helped a lot of people out around here over the years. Steve nodded. He gave a bunch of us our starts, that's for certain. He left a big hole. The two sat in silence for a moment. So, how long are you home for? For good, sir. I'm out of the army. You're out? I figured you for a lifer. And call me Steve. Anyone who's been shot at for our country is old enough to call me Steve. Thanks, Steve. I wanted to retire after my 20. But my best friend died in the Gulf. And that future died with him. What I want has changed. What do you want now, Jeff? Someone to come home to every night, a wife, kids. The same things I wanted before Ken died, but with more conditions. Like, not getting shot at? That would be a good start. What's next for you, then? Studying to be an EMT. Finding a place to live. Asking you for a job. You want to work here again? I loved working here in high school, Steve. Where else can you get paid for working out? Those 50 and 100 pound bags don't move themselves. I could ride herd on the kids you have working here, too. Be the designated asshole? Take the heat off me, in a sense? Sure. I could only offer you five fifty an hour, maybe five seventy five max. Forty hours? Yep. Steve looked around. A light bulb went off in his head. How about this? Five twenty five, and you live here, above the store? At what rent, Steve? None. Steve's answer shocked Jeff. None? The apartment was huge. None, Steve confirmed. You get this place cleaned up, work for me, go to school, and I get a little extra security knowing there's someone I trust upstairs here. We generate heat and hot water for the store anyway, so I'll include that. The electricity would be on you, though. I've been up here almost two hours and haven't accomplished anything. There are too many memories in this apartment for me to work efficiently. You'd be doing Carol and me a huge favor. Carol was Steve's wife. I might get kind of busy going to EMT school and all. I don't know what's involved yet or what else I'll get involved with now that I'm home. What about when I pass my EMT class and want to start working as one somewhere? We figure that out down the road. The rent will still be better than anywhere else around. What do you say? Can I get my cleaning and paint supplies from the store? Right off the stockroom shelves. Just tell me what you take so I can keep track of inventory. You'll have a key to the store and the alarm code. Depending on when your classes are, I might ask you to either open or close. When can I start? Jeff stayed the week at his parents' place before moving to Bilzerian's. Marisa was sad to see him leave, but was glad that he'd be close. He slept on a camping pad while he cleaned up the apartment since he'd already disposed of the mattresses there. The Bilzerian's left for a long summer vacation the week he moved in and left Mike Huntley, the assistant store manager in charge. One of the high school kids tried to act all important when Jeff gathered more cleaning supplies during that first weekend. You can't just come in here and take that. 
I have authorization, Jeff commented, not even turning around. He continued placing supplies in a box. Not from me, you don't. Jeff turned and gave him a stare. Listen up, genius, you don't matter to me. You ain't even on my radar. Do you have the names Panama and the Persian Gulf stored in your brain housing group anywhere? The kid looked confused. That's your skull, genius. You know why those two places are significant? The kid nodded. You may have learned about them in history class, but I know about them because I was there. I watched friends die in both of those places while you popped zits onto the bathroom mirror. I answer to one person here, and that person ain't you. Do you read me, genius? The kid nodded furiously. Jeff returned to the apartment with his cleaning supplies. Jeff restored the apartment to its former glory with a week's hard work. He worked 12 hours a day minimum. The senior Bilzerian smoked throughout the years he lived in the space, as did his late wife. Copious amounts of elbow grease along with a helpful cleaner degreaser removed the years of tobacco smoke residue from the ceilings, walls, and woodwork. Fresh paint and lemon oil finished the job. Jeff even did all minor repairs that went untouched as Mr. Bilzerian Sr. grew older. Jeff now lived free of charge in 2,000 square feet of an immaculate apartment that should command hundreds in rent. Jeff decided to check out a store he discovered down the street after finishing the apartment. The store, named the Haberdashery, was just that, a men's clothing store. One of the owners greeted Jeff and soon had him in front of mirrors checking out new suits. Jeff bought three along with various items to make many more outfits. Jeff promised to return for other items in the future. When he stepped out of the dressing room for the final time, he spotted a familiar figure. That person checked out a display of silk ties. A younger man stepped up to the person and said something. The person turned their back in response. The man stomped away past Jeff muttering, frigid bitch. Jeff smirked and walked over to the person. Disguising his voice, he said, you know if you get three more ties, we can test their strength in my bedroom. The person stiffened and turned. A furious look crossed her face as she did. The look changed to surprise mixed with joy as she recognized him. Jeff, Allison cried, hugging him tightly. Her hugs felt as good as ever, and her kisses were still awesome too. How do you keep surprising me like that? And how long are you home for this time? I'm home for good, Allison. I'm out of the army. You're out? Why? What happened? Are you busy? Come over to my apartment with me. I'll make you lunch and tell you all about it. <laughs> Your apartment? How long have you been home? Two weeks, but I spent a week cleaning the apartment after I moved in. Today's the first day I've been able to venture out since I finished. How come? That's part of the story. Come on, pretty lady. Jeff could see the other man in a mirror while he left with Allison on his arm. The man's mouth hung open in shock. The two friends walked arm in arm the 250 feet to Bilzerian's. Jeff unlocked the private front entrance and gestured for Allison to precede him up the stairs. He knew she trusted him, but she still had a question on her face when she entered the stairwell. He unlocked the upstairs door to the apartment and opened it for her also. Now it was Allison's turn to have her jaw hanging open in shock. White painted walls and gleaming urethaned woodwork greeted her, making the already spacious apartment feel huge. Mr. Bilzerian's furniture was gone, too smoke saturated to keep, which only added to the feeling. He gave her the nickel tour, winding up at the same kitchen table he shared with Steve two weeks earlier. Jeff, this place is amazing. You did a great job and you're right in the center of town. How high is the rent, though? I'm not paying rent, Allison. What? You're not? I'll be working for Steve while I take my EMT class across the street at Swerve this fall. The free rent is part of that, and that includes heat and hot water for the apartment. My hourly rate is a little lower because of it. Where did the EMT thing come from? Jeff told her about the accident in Ohio. Why were you out there? I was on my way home from Spokane. Spokane? Isn't Ken from Spokane? He was, Allison, yes. Was? Her eyes filled with tears as she covered her mouth and shook her head. No. Jeff nodded sadly. 
On the last day of the ground war in Iraq, February 28th, I found out on his birthday. That was Beware the Ides of March writ large. Allison began to cry. She threw herself at Jeff, sobbing. He comforted her the best he could. You went there to pay your respects, didn't you? She asked after sitting back in her chair. Jeff nodded. There's more to the story, Allison. After you guys came down for spring break, Ken's family came to visit before Panama, his parents and his little sister, Keiko. His family? Were they nice? Did you get along with them all right? I'm fluent in Japanese now, Allison. That helped, but yes, they're great people. I also fell in love with Keiko on the spot. When Ken left our unit, he said he was proud to call me a brother in arms. He also said he'd be prouder to call me his brother-in-law one day. You fell in love with her? Yes, Allison, we'll be together at some point after she graduates from UVA in 94. Are you engaged then? No, we're not even dating. I don't understand. Honestly, I'm not sure I do either. But I know we'll be together in the future. What does that mean then? She told me, live, Jeffrey, live. Do not deny yourself love when it presents itself to you, when we parted for the first time. She also told me, there is an old saying, if you can't be with the girl you love, love the girl you're near. For us, it means what we want it to mean. I love you, Allison. I have since 87. I know what I want. Right here, right now, I want to be with you. The question becomes, what do you want, Allison? Allison considered the question in silence before responding. Every time I see you, Jeff, I want more of what we had in high school. I leave for Austin and the University of Texas at the end of August. I want those two months, Jeff. No holds barred. It's our last chance to be together as a couple. One caveat, Allison. If this threatens our friendship at all, at any point it ends. Your friendship is and always has been more important to me than anything else. She sat on his lap and draped her arms around his neck. Let's get friendly. Jeff escorted Allison into the Enfield Grand Hotel two nights later. Tompkins School hosted a young alumni event at the hotel that night. The classes of 1981 to 1991 were considered the young alumni. Allison wore a simple but quite flattering little black dress and heels. Jeff wore his new charcoal gray suit with a white shirt and an 82nd Airborne Division tie. The enamel ribbon bar representing his silver star adorned his lapel. Well, at least the name tags don't clash with my tie, Jeff commented. They both wore ubiquitous, hello, my name is, name tags with their names and graduation year. Allison shook her head. Some things never change. It looks like there's a good turnout, she said as they found a seat. Yeah, they certainly lucked out, all right. Would you like anything to drink? A dry vodka martini? Jeff nodded and walked to the bar. He saw a face there he hadn't seen since he left for basic training. Jesus H. Christ, is it possible for you to get any uglier? Jeff asked. The man he spoke to turned. Looking at you, I'd say yes, it is possible. Good to see you, Jeff. The two friends embraced. You too, Jack. How did things go for you at Johns Hopkins? Magna cum laude, Jack Jarrett replied. I'll start medical school there in the fall. How's Kara and your mom and dad? All doing just fine, thanks. Mom's still at Tompkins, and dad's still a grease monkey to use his own words. Kara will finish her degree in graphic arts at MassArt next year. Jeff paused the conversation to give the bartender his drink order. How's that no account brother of yours? Tom? He's fine. He is still slaving away in the trenches of high finance down in New York City. He says he likes it, but all those numbers make my head hurt. Me? Give me some nasty medical problem any day. What about you? You still working on that history degree? Nope. What? Why not? I finished it, Jack. A Bachelor of Arts in History from American Military University now adorns the wall of my apartment. Thank you very much. Nice. How's the army treating you? Jeff made a face. I'm out, Jack. I finished up after Memorial Day. How come? Come on back to our table and I tell you the whole sad, sordid story. Our? Who are you here with? All shall be revealed. Come on. 
As they made their way to the table, he noted something was missing with his friend. Wait a minute. You're walking without a limp. Yeah, I had surgery about two years ago to lengthen my femur, a sterile piece of coral to bridge the gap, and that solved the whole problem. I even run a couple of miles a day now. That's awesome. Wow, who's that gorgeous blonde over there? Jeff didn't answer. They reached the table and he kissed the blonde when she looked up. Hey, I found this wastrel haunting the bar and offered him a seat. Is that okay? Jack! Allison cried. She sprang up to hug the startled man. Allison, Allison Newbury, my God, you look terrific. You guys are still together? Well, more like together again, Jack. We seem to find each other whenever Jeff decides to come home. I'm off to the University of Texas for my master's in applied physics in the fall, though. Are you starting medical school soon? Jack filled her in on his medical school plans and his medical improvement. Jeff gave Jack the rundown on why he left the army. What are you doing with the history degree, Jeff? Are you going to teach or anything like that? I might get my master's in history someday, but I don't see myself using it. I'm starting EMT class at Swerve in the fall, believe it or not. That's great! Jack did a double take. Hey, look over at the door. Another one of your ladies just entered. Jeff looked. A smile crossed his face. Do you mind if I ask them to join us, Allison? Of course not. Go say hi. Jeff excused himself and approached the couple at the door. <laughs> Mrs. McGain, I presume? Jeff, Pauline exclaimed. She glowed with her early pregnancy. She gave him a long hug and a kiss on the cheek. Frank, you remember Jeff, right? Of course. How are you, Jeff? Frank McGann asked as they shook hands. Ma'am, I'm doing well, Frank. Thanks very much. We've still got room at our table if you guys would like to join us. Who are you sitting with, Jeff? Pauline asked as they returned to the table. Allison Newberry and Jack Jarrett. The mini reunion at the table was a boisterous one. Pauline introduced her husband to everyone. Jeff explained his last four years in the army and why he left again for the newcomers. Allison and Jack did the same for their future schooling. Jeff, this situation with Keiko is a little unusual. Pauline commented to him, so only he could hear. I agree, Pauline. I have to trust that she's honest with her feelings on the whole situation, though. I'm a little nervous that I'll hurt her with any relationship I have between now and whenever. She's the one who told me not to sit on my butt waiting for her, however. I don't want Allison hurt either, which is why I told her up front what's going on. In another time and another place, I could picture Allison and I being together long term. I love her, but we have different futures. Pauline smiled at him. Still the big caring galoot from high school, aren't you? I guess so, he shrugged. As I said to someone once, I'm going to grab life by the throat and wring its neck for all I can squeeze out of it. I want to see how much we can squeeze out of the two months we have before she leaves for graduate school. You sent him what? Ha 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 ha. Allison laughed from across the table. Pauline raised an eyebrow. This degenerate must have told Allison what he put in the care package he sent me while I was in the Gulf, Jeff explained while he hooked a thumb at Jack. Pauline made a, well, give me the punchline, a motion with her hands. He sent me a beach towel, a bottle of suntan oil, and a Speedo. Frank and Pauline started laughing as well. Go ahead and laugh, you two. The joke was on Jack when I sent him something in return. What was that, Jeff? asked Frank. Oh, geez, Jack said, shaking his head. Talk about things you can't unsee. When we returned home, I sent him a picture of me wearing that Speedo while lying on the towel in the middle of the desert. My squad stood behind me in full chemical protection gear and holding their rifles. I was all oiled up and glistening, too. Serves you right, Jack, Pauline laughed. Have you forgotten that when you mess with the bull, you may just get the horns? Thursday, July, 1991. Main Street, Enfield, Massachusetts. Allison walked back into Jeff's apartment while she leafed through a stack of his mail. It was amazing how good she looked dressed in one of his t-shirts and a pair of her shorts. Jeff, you've got a bunch of mail here with those forwarding stickers on it. Allison had slept over the apartment almost every night since the alumni event. They'd talked to the Newburys about that at Jeff's insistence. He didn't want them to feel he was monopolizing her time at home. The Newburys didn't have a problem with it, because Allison was happy. 
she'd have to adjust to a new school and city in under two months. Being with Jeff would keep her relaxed until then. Jeff admitted that he liked the feeling of sharing space with someone he loved. Jeff flipped through the envelopes. Most of them were mail forwarded from Fort Bragg. It was almost all junk mail, though some were bills from companies he'd contact with a change of address. One envelope stood out. An oversized envelope made from heavy paper bore his parents' address in raised printing. Jeff opened it, curious. A wedding invitation written in the traditional form requested he attend with a guest. Jeff smiled when he read the names of the bride and groom. What is it, Jeff? Jeff held the invitation out to Allison. Who are Jenna Ferrier and Oscar Infante? Oscar was a soldier in my platoon until his injury in a training accident. Ken mentioned him when you ladies came down to Fayetteville, though he didn't use Oscar's name. Jenna was his physical therapist. When's the wedding? End of August in Amarillo, it looks like the Saturday before Labor Day weekend, the 24th. That must be where Jenna's from, Amarillo. I remember Oscar being from somewhere further south, either Dallas or Houston. Allison frowned. She knew Jeff would ask her to go to the wedding with him and she wanted to go. Allison and her parents planned to be in Austin by then, however. She'd move into her unit at UT's University Apartments Complex that weekend. Lucky for her, Jeff still looked at the invitation. She changed her expression back to a neutral one before he looked up. You've been working on those boots for over two hours, Allison commented. And that I'll march in the town parade with other veterans tomorrow. I can't be looking like a ragbag. She shot Jeff a blank look. I need to look my best, he clarified. Is there anything I can help you with at least? He put his boots down next to his chair. I'm feeling lonely, he said with a wolfish grin while wagging his eyebrows at her. She looked even better with his t-shirt on the floor. Nice job, Jeff, Tom Cavanaugh offered with a smile. Jeff scowled at him in return. Since when is the tradition to have the veteran who just left the service lead the July 4th formation? Since I volunteered you for it this morning, that's what happens when you miss membership meetings. I'm not even a member of the VFW yet. How can I miss a membership meeting when I'm not part of the membership? That's your problem, Airborne. You figure it out. Jeff shook his head. Great. I leave the military and I still get voluntold to do things related to it. Jeff was still shaking his head when a pair of blondes skipped up to the knot of veterans. Many appreciative eyes followed. Grampy, you looked so handsome marching in the parade, Heather chirped while she hugged Tom. Alice, someone's making a move on your man over here, Jeff commented as more friends and family approached. Heather stepped over to him. He expected to get smacked, but she wrapped him in a hug instead. I'm so sorry, Jeff. Jeff hugged her back to say thanks. Heather and Jane had only recently returned from a trip to Las Vegas to celebrate Jane's retirement from the Air Force. He hadn't seen Heather since her visit to Fayetteville two years ago. Jeff, don't try to get Tom in trouble. He can get into it all by himself. Allison, why do you keep hanging around this pot stirrer again? Alice Cavanaugh asked. I'm not sure, Mrs. Cavanaugh. Alice shot her a look. Alice, sorry. You'd think Allison would have the answer to that question figured out by now, Alice, Jeff said. She's pretty smart. Not if she keeps hanging around you, she's not, Heather added. Jeff stuck his tongue out at her. Heather did the same back to him. Yep, your brother and sister material all right, Jane laughed, joined by Jeff's parents and Kara. Well, I don't know about you comedians, but I need to change. These Class A's won't be very comfortable in the hot sun at the town cookout. You guys want to check out my apartment, or would you like to meet us over at the Common? I want to see the Love Shack, Heather yelled. Love Shack, bye bye. Allison blushed bright red. Jeff whispered a follow-up comment in Allison's ear, which caused her to blush even more. Wait a minute, what did you say to her? Nope, none of your business, Heather, all right. The tour group going to Bilzerian's bachelor pad is leaving. Try to keep up, everyone. Jeff led the whole group down Main Street to Bilzerian's. Wow, you did all of this yourself? Heather asked, gaping at the apartment. Yep, it took me about a week. A friend of Steve Bilzerian gave me some pointers on restoring the woodwork, but the elbow grease was all mine. Before I get changed, can I get anyone a drink? 
Jeff retrieved the requested beverages before darting into his bedroom to change. He emerged wearing a 504th PIR, what I did on my Christmas vacation 1989, t-shirt, shorts, and sneakers. It's a little Spartan up here, Jeff, Jane commented when he reappeared. Living out of a wall locker and duffel bag for four years does that, Jane. I'm sure you know that better than I do. Of course, you Ociphers live differently than us poor enlisted slobs, so maybe not. Jane stuck her tongue out at him. Their relationship could be more relaxed now that they were both out of the military. Jeff smiled back at her. Today's gonna be a good day weather-wise, Allison mentioned as the group stepped back into the sunshine. A perfect day for a cookout. Tomorrow is going to be another story, from what I understand. Gotta love New England, added Kara. 85 degrees and sunny one day, 55 and rainy the next. I know what we can do tomorrow, Jeff smiled. We've already watched you smash baseballs for an hour, hotshot, Heather cracked. Shadab, kid. It's July, why am I walking into an ice rink? There's something inherently wrong about this whole situation, Allison said. Jeff whispered into Allison's ear. The heat coming off her face threatened to melt the ice. What? What do you keep saying to her? Heather demanded. Still none of your business, kiddo, Jeff smiled back. Again, she stuck her tongue out at him. Allison, Heather, Kara, and Jeff sat in the Tompkins Fieldhouse bleachers while they tied their skates. The school kept ice on the rink year-round. Jeff also brought his gloves, a bag of pucks, and a stick with him in addition to his skates. The three young ladies stepped onto the ice and began skating right away. Jeff stepped onto the ice and began to stretch as he learned when he started playing hockey. What time's the game? Heather asked. <laughs> Don't think I won't take you over my knee and paddle you. You wouldn't dare. You wouldn't risk pissing off Allison. I bet she can get pretty jealous. Jeff shook his head while Heather skated away, laughing. He started skating around the edge of the rink after he stretched. The women gathered at center ice and began talking after a few minutes. With no one in his way, Jeff skated harder. The ladies stood at center ice and watched. Man, he's fast. How does he turn backward on the fly like that without falling? I think he misses it. Simon, ladies, let's leave Hans Brinker to his skating. The woman left the ice and arena, preferring to sit in the lobby of the building. It was warmer there. Jeff saw that the ice was empty as the women passed through the doors to the lobby. He shrugged, skated to the bench area, and walked down the rubber runner along the outside of the boards. Jeff dragged a goal onto the ice, closed the boards and returned to the bench. He put his gloves on, picked up his stick in the puck bag before setting pucks down along the inside of the blue line. He stretched again before skating to the right point to face the net he dragged onto the ice. The rink narrowed down to just Jeff and the net. He squared up and fired a rising slap shot at the net. A sharp metallic rang through the arena as he wound up for his next shot. The puck had struck the inside of the post and ricocheted into the net. The follow-on shot did the same. After sounded as puck after puck found post and net. Jeff fired his last shot and bolted for the opposite end of the ice, again skating as hard as he could. He circled behind the far crease and streaked back down the boards. Jeff stopped on a dime next to his net, spraying shaved ice against the glass. He picked a single puck from the group with the blade of his stick and then repeated his trip around the boards. Jeff pushed the puck in front of him as if on a breakaway. He fired one more slap shot as he approached the blue line where he started. The puck found the back of the net just under the crossbar. You gonna try out this season? A familiar voice called. Jeff turned to see Coach Kessler stepping onto the ice. The man skated over and shook his hand. Kara says you're home for good that you're out of the army? Both true, Coach. John, Jeff, John. You don't look like you've lost a step or anything from that shot of yours. First time I've skated or picked up a stick since high school, John. I'm kind of surprised myself. Feels good, though. I've missed it, if truth be told. You're still collecting blondes, I see. Jeff raised an eyebrow. Oh, you mean Heather? Yeah, I guess. There's a raven-haired woman out in Washington State you'll likely meet one day, too. Now it was John Kessler's turn to raise an eyebrow. A battle buddy's little sister. I don't know how I know, but I know she'll be my wife within five years. Don't ask, John. 
I can't explain. And, yes, Allison knows. Your business, not mine, Jeff. You been keeping up with those workouts you used to do? Jeff nodded. 500 each and six miles or so every day. The cadre in the 82nd took a dim view of troops that didn't measure up. I have to join a gym or something soon, though. I need to start hitting the weights again. You're starting an EMT class over at SRVCC in the fall, I hear. Swerve? Yeah. I'm working at Bilzerian's again and living in the apartment upstairs, so I'll walk to and from class. The campus is right across Main Street, after all. What's your class schedule going to be? They run the class Tuesday and Thursday nights. Would you be interested in being my assistant coach this season? We play most of our games on Wednesdays and Fridays. Jeff blinked. Wow, John, are you serious? John nodded. To be honest, I don't think I ever considered being a coach until you asked. Yeah, if we can work out a schedule, yeah, I'd like to try it. Defensive stuff? That and some real-world conditioning. None of this steroid BS that's going around. Yeah, maybe Steve Bilzerian will let me open and I can get my workouts in here before we practice. That might work. I'll ask when he gets back from his vacation next week. Excellent. Let me know. You know where my office is. Now, you've got three lovely ladies waiting on you in the lobby. What are you doing standing here talking to me? Jeff sat on the deck over the store's loading dock, his drink abandoned on the table next to him. The ice in the glass had melted away 15 minutes ago. He looked up into the night sky, searching for his old friend, but clouds behind Bilzerian's obscured his view of Orion tonight. The screen door from the apartment creaked when it opened. An arm snaked gently around him, while a familiar face pressed itself to his. Jeff's hand came up to stroke Allison's arm. Jeff? It's almost three in the morning. What's wrong? I'm sorry, Allison. For what? Because you stopped earlier? Jeff, I know Keiko was honest when she told you to keep yourself open to love while you're apart, but I wonder how kind that was to a person like you. Underneath it all, you're a gentle, caring soul. I think we were both hoping for too much, expecting too much when we ran into each other when you got home. How long have you been awake? I haven't been able to sleep yet. You've been keeping yourself awake overthinking things, haven't you? You deserve better than this, Allison. You deserve someone who's not holding back. I want what I've got, Jeff. I'll find my forever guy, my male version of Keiko someday. Here and now, I want you and what you're able to give. I'm happy, Jeff. That's what matters to me. How, Allison? I don't get it. How are you happy with a guy who's in love with another woman 3,000 miles away? Allison released him. She walked around the chair and sat in his lap as she did in the kitchen a month ago. She draped her arms around his neck and looked him in the eye. Do you love me? She asked. Jeff nodded with pain and sorrow clear on his face. I love you too, you big dummy. If our summer together is limited to stopping at third base, we should be happy with the triple. I'd much prefer that than getting thrown out at home and losing our friendship. I can feel that you love me when you touch me, see it in your eyes when you look at me. I know that my place in your life is your friend and not your wife or lover. Keiko is a lucky woman. I'd better be on your guest list when the time comes. He smiled gratefully at her. I'm the lucky one, Allison, to have you and Heather as my friends still. Come back to bed, Allison whispered before she led him back inside to his bedroom. She held him while he fell into a dreamless sleep. Lift with the legs, boys, Jeff called to the Bilzerian summer stock staff. The staff restocked the bags of mulch, lawn fertilizer, and pet food around the stockroom. Jeff worked with them. He wasn't one to stand back and watch. Eric Dubrant, genius, had given Jeff a wide berth since Steve introduced Jeff as the stockroom foreman to the summer help. Charlie smiled and gave Jeff a thumbs up from the back of the room on that day. There was one small wiry boy that summer named Paul Ezekiel who'd do any job assigned to him without whining about it. Unfortunately, other than Charlie, Paul was the exception rather than the rule among the summer staff. Paul was the only other non-Bilzerian Jeff would recommend for retention after that summer. Jeff asked Paul to help him replace the mulch in front of the store when the stocking was complete. How are things going this summer, Paul? Better now that you're in charge of us. Getting shit before that, were you? 
You could say that. Charlie tried to block some of it, but there was only so much he could do. Why do you think things changed? Because you could snap Dubrant in half like a rotten tree limb. Hey. Because I wouldn't back down when the genius tried to act all superior when I first started cleaning upstairs. That was great, Paul laughed. I thought he was going to shit himself. He won't be big man on campus forever, Paul. There's always someone bigger and badder around. Me? I'm pretty easygoing until you push me, and then I'll go for your throat. Bullies don't like people calling them on their bullshit. Sometimes you get your ass kicked, but you take it and keep stepping. Don't change who you are for anybody. Isn't that what the army did to you, though? Change you? Not so much change me as file the rough edges off the high school kid I was. They do that so you'll fit in the army. Underneath it all, I don't think they change me all that much. And now you date a supermodel. Jeff laughed. Oh, Allison will love you when she hears that. Do you know who Allison was in high school? Paul shook his head. She was our class valedictorian, Paul. Allison will tell you that she was the ugly duckling until our senior year. She was my friend first. She didn't become my girlfriend until after New Year's senior year. And wait until I introduce you to Heather. You know more than one supermodel? Heather's more like my older sister than a girlfriend. She grew up in Greenwich and went to VRHS, but we didn't meet until 88. Do you have any guy friends you hang around with? I used to, Paul. My best friend from Tompkins is in medical school in Baltimore. What about from the army? Paul saw Jeff get a faraway look in his eye. Sorry, I should have known that one. What do you mean? Paul pointed at his right arm. The kanji for Takahashi was visible below Jeff's sleeve. I know what a gold star family is. That day we were moving the ice melt out? When it was about 95 and you had your shirt off? I knew what I was looking at. At lunch, Jeff made two phone calls. Right. Hey Paul, can you hang around a few minutes after we close today? Yeah, Jeff, not a problem. Paul lived only a few streets away and would walk home. Paul waited in the stock area while Jeff locked the front of the store that evening. Jeff waved him to the loading dock when he came back through. Jeff handed Paul a bottle of soda and motioned for him to wait while Jeff ran upstairs. Paul nearly snorted the soda out his nose when two beautiful blondes walked down the stairs from Jeff's apartment with him. Paul knew one blonde was Allison, Jeff's girlfriend. The other woman must be Heather. Both women gave him tight hugs and kisses on the cheek. Paul wouldn't wash his face for weeks now. The four stood on the dock talking for an hour. Paul acquitted himself well, looking the women in the eye while with them and not stammering at all. The topic of discussion ranged from history to physics to sports. Paul kept up with the three older friends. He eventually needed to excuse himself, explaining that he had to leave for a late supper. I bet that kid scores the head cheerleader as his girlfriend this year, Heather mentioned as Paul walked out of sight. No bet, Jeff answered. What would you ladies like for dinner? How about the lasagna we made you? Allison asked. You made me dinner? Yep, your supermodels do more than appear on magazine covers. Come on. Jeff held Allison's hand while driving their rental away from the airport in Amarillo, Texas. Jenna Farrier and Oscar Infante's wedding will take place tomorrow, Saturday, August 24th. Allison would fly to Austin on Sunday and meet her parents there. Sure does get warm down here. Allison said as they collected their bags. They placed them on the luggage cart Jeff retrieved from the hotel. I might start having flashbacks of being at Fort Benning with weather like this. I'll have to remind Oscar about the land that time forgot when we see him. They call it the land that time forgot? Jeff sang. His home is Benning, Georgia, the land that time foregoet. The mud is 18 inches deep. The sun is blazing hoat. Airbo o o orn. Ranger er 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 er. You people are weird. We jumped out of planes voluntarily, remember? Like I said. And you keep hanging around me, why? Allison stopped him just short of the hotel service desk. She pulled him down for a long, soft kiss. Because I love you, Jeff, she whispered. I love you too, Allison. They turned to the desk to find a hotel employee smiling at them. Hi, we're checking in. Last name of Knox? Two nights? Ah, uh, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Knox, the young woman answered. 
Allison had a bemused smile on her face when Jeff looked. She shook her head, which told him not to correct the desk clerk. You're joining us for the Farrier Infante wedding tomorrow? Jeff nodded, and the woman produced paperwork for him to sign. Once completed, she handed him their room key. Allison held her laughter until they were in the elevator. Mrs. Knox, you were in no hurry to correct her either. I noticed that before I shot that look at you. Jeff gathered her into his arms. I wish, Allison, he whispered while he stroked her cheek. I wish. Even though Jeff knew his future was with Keiko, part of him ached because he was hurting his friend. Allison's eyes watered as she put her head on his chest. Don't make me cry. This weekend is supposed to be a happy time. Happy! They held their embrace until the elevator reached their floor. Jeff handed Allison the key before he wrestled the cart out of the cramped space. Sunlight streamed through the window of the hotel room. A great view of the Texas Panhandle's landscape stretched out before them from the edge of Amarillo. Jeff unloaded the cart onto the king-sized bed. Allison would unpack while he brought the cart back to the lobby. Returning the cart took 15 minutes. The elevator stopped at every floor on the way down, as well as the way up. Their room was on the fifth floor. Jeff noted their clothes were hanging in the closet near the door as he re-entered. The empty suitcases sat at the bottom of the closet, too. Jeff's eyes nearly popped out of his head upon stepping into the room proper. At 16, Allison had been a pretty girl. Kathy Stein helped uncover the beautiful girl she became their senior year. At 22, Jeff believed she lived up to the title of supermodel Paul Ezekiel graced her with almost a month ago. His 22-year-old supermodel brainiac girlfriend lay stretched out on the turned-down bed. She seemed to have lost all her clothes before lying down. We've got a few hours before we need to be outside for the wedding rehearsal. Whatever should we do for those few hours, Jeffrey? Time flies when you're having fun. Allison and Jeff stepped into the late afternoon Texas sun just before 5.30. Both had showered and dressed in comfortable clothes for the night's activities. They held hands while they approached a man Jeff hadn't seen in over two years. Oscar smiled and hugged Jeff tightly, ignoring the outstretched hand. He slapped Jeff on the back when they embraced. You look good, Mono, Jeff said, smiling back at Oscar. You too, bro. Oscar's smooth voice was gone, replaced by a rough, raspy one. It was an acceptable trade-off to Jeff. The alternative was almost a funeral and not a wedding for Oscar's family. You remember Jenna, right? How could I forget such a lovely young lady, Oscar? It's good to see you again, Jenna. Jeff kissed Jenna on the cheek. Hey, I used to be the schmooze, remember? Yes, Oscar, but you've reformed yourself. Someone else has to fill the role now. Anyway, Jenna Ferrier, Oscar Infante, please meet Miss Allison Newberry. As of Monday, Allison will be a master's candidate in physics at the University of Texas in Austin. Allison, Jenna Ferrier, and Oscar Infante. It's very nice to meet you both. Oscar Ken told us about the accident when we came down to visit Jeff that March. I'm glad that we're able to celebrate your special day with you tomorrow. Oscar nodded to her. She and Jenna soon drifted off to get acquainted. Oscar bought Jeff a beer. I owe you this at least, Jeff. You owe me a lifetime of happiness with Jenna, Oscar. Nothing more. Salute. Jeff took a swig of his beer. Of course, you could name your firstborn son after me. That'd be nice. So I don't think they'll put asshole Infante on the kid's birth certificate, Jeff. Jeff found it amusing that his actions the day of Oscar's injury meant the Infante household considered him a minor saint. His command of Spanish confirmed it. Thanks to Allison's presence, the younger male cousins considered him a demigod. A saint? He asked Oscar after the rehearsal dinner. You must not have told your family about that cantina in Honduras then? Jesus, would you keep your voice down? Are you trying to get me killed right before my wedding? The next day, Jeff stood with the rest of the groomsmen while Jenna and Oscar exchanged vows. Jeff looked like he was watching the couple getting married. In truth, Jeff watched Allison out of the corner of his eye. He knew you should never upstage the bride on her wedding day, but Allison would draw the eye wearing a trash bag. He'd known her for years, and he still couldn't keep his eyes off her. After all the pomp and ceremony finished, the dancing started. 
Allison and Jeff were on the dance floor when a familiar Elvis song began to play. Wise men say only fools rush in, but I can't help falling in love with you. Shall I stay? Would it be a sin if I can't help falling in love with you? Allison put her head on his chest while they swayed gently to the music. When the song ended, Allison kissed him as hard as she could and darted to the bathroom. Jeff took a deep breath and headed to the bar, blinking rapidly. He ordered a double gin and tonic once there. He almost finished it in one gulp. Doug, when's your wedding? Yoked Oscar when he appeared at Jeff's elbow. There's not going to be a wedding, Oscar. Not for Allison and me. What? This is our last night together. What? Do you mean to tell me you're breaking up after what I just saw? Allison will be eight hours south of here starting tomorrow. I'll be back home in Western Mass. Her future lies elsewhere, while mine's with Ken Takahashi's little sister. All right, now I'm confused. Keiko and her parents came to brag during the summer of 1989. That was just after your injury and a year before Ken pcs to Stewart and the 24th ID. It was love at first sight when we met. I don't know exactly when we'll be together again, but you and Jenna will get a wedding invitation from us one day. But what about Allison? Jeff finished his gin and tonic. The bartender asked if he wanted a refill. Just the tonic water, please, no gin. She nodded, refilled Jeff's glass with tonic water, and moved on to the next customer. Jeff turned back to Oscar. Allison and I have dated off and on since senior year in high school. We've been friends even longer than that. Before we started up again this summer, we both agreed things would end when she left for graduate school, especially in light of things with Keiko. That Elvis song was us to a T Oscar. I think we're both more than just a little in love with each other. Jeff swallowed heavily. Damn, this hurts. Oscar put a companionable arm around the fellow paratrooper. You making time with my guy, Infante? Both men turned to find Allison and Jenna standing behind them. Allison wore a brave face, and her hands were on her hips. Jenna looked sad. Allison must have filled her in as well. Oscar smiled slightly, kissed Allison on the cheek, and then walked off with his wife without saying a word. That left the two friends standing by themselves. Neither said a word for almost a minute. Allison, I... She closed the distance and silenced him with a finger to his lips. She took his hand and led him wordlessly out of the reception. The time spent in the elevator stretched. The silence was uncomfortable, painful. Allison didn't speak until they stood in their room with the door locked behind them. Her dress fell to the floor. Batter up. Jeff helped Allison pack before they went down to breakfast. The silence in the room was more uncomfortable than the silence in the elevator the night before. Jenna and Oscar hosted a going-away meal for their out-of-town guests. Allison and Jeff occupied themselves by talking to others at breakfast, not each other. Neither wanted to say something to the other that would set off the waterworks. Like his last morning with Pauline in 1986, Jeff clung to Allison's hand like a lifeline while he ate. Jeff loaded Allison's two bags into the rental for their trip back to English Field. His flight back to Bradley wasn't until later that evening. His bags were back at the hotel, behind the service desk. The trip to the airport was mercifully short. There were no restrictions in accompanying Allison to her gate. They sat, still holding hands, in the chairs there for a half hour before they called her flight. The end of the road had come. The couple stood and embraced. Jeff, I love you, Allison said in a whisper. She didn't trust her voice at a louder volume. I love you too, Allison. I promise that has not changed, nor will it ever. They called her Roe on the flight. Allison pressed her lips to his in one last passionate kiss. There was a hint of a smile on her lips when they broke the kiss, a smile Jeff wasn't expecting. Good game last night, by the way. Five for five with five triples is pretty impressive. She leaned in to whisper in his ear. Oh, and ensure that tongue of yours. Keiko will like that when the time comes. She leaned back and placed a hand on his cheek, gazing into his eyes. Take care of yourself, Jeffrey Andrew Knox. I'll see you again someday. 07 September 1991, Main Street, Enfield, Massachusetts. 
Jeff unlocked Bilzerian's front door and flipped the sign from closed to open. The steady rain this Saturday fit his mood. He simply existed during the two weeks since Jenna and Oscar's wedding. The apartment was cold and empty without Allison, even in the late summer heat. He would have to be cautious not to dive back into a relationship just to fill the hole in the space or his heart. Paul Ezekiel entered the store and handed Jeff a coffee and bagel from the shop down the street. Jeff made appreciative noises when he accepted the offering. Paul kept his laughter to himself while Jeff inhaled the bagel. The coffee would have disappeared as fast if not for its temperature. Jeff drank hot coffee year round. The other summer staff hours were reduced to one afternoon per week the week before Labor Day. None of them chose to stay. Paul, who didn't play sports, was offered 20 hours a week with more hours implied if he wanted them. Since he was over 15, his hours per week work restriction during school was higher. Paul's school year started the week Jeff returned home. Jeff was glad that Paul decided to keep working. He handpicked the youngster to open the store with him on Saturday mornings. How's the EMT class so far? Paul asked after the usual mini rush of customers at opening. It's a little different than I expected. It turns out that military medics are allowed to do things civilian EMTs here in the Commonwealth aren't. I suppose that's due to the potential for being isolated in military situations. Even if GVMC wasn't around, there are four or five emergency rooms within a 30-minute drive of Enfield. Heck, there's even helicopter evac available to civilians now. Do you like it? I don't see any reason I won't. We haven't gotten into the medicine too much yet. We've only had the two classes. The first night was introductory housekeeping stuff, and the second was a medical legal lecture. I liked the first aid stuff in the army, and I liked how it felt to help that family. Another thing the army taught me about training was that reality doesn't always equal training. In what way? Well, the army took the time to set up scenarios for us, and it was very realistic training. Not everybody does that. Things the army taught us individually started to pile up on us fast during field exercises. Trying to sort things out could get very interesting very quickly. The army set up the training scenarios to show us how things could go sideways so fast and react to unexpected changes. You learn how to anticipate. I'm a big believer in if you train like you'll fight, you'll fight like you train. Their drills are bloodless battles and their battles bloody drills. That kind of thing. Right you are, Josephus. The more you bleed in training, the less you'll bleed in war. You could go on all day like that. Ask me how it's going around Halloween or so. I'll be doing some assistant coaching this fall too. Trying to fill the space? I guess I am, he replied with a look of loss on his face. I'm not talking down to you, Paul, but it's true you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Are you going to serenade me with hairband power ballads today? The EMT class began with actual medical training the following week. Jeff strolled into class the week after that and spotted a new friend who lacked hair. Paired together for their initial CPR training, Jeff suffered from the same kind of hair issue. Gene the Marine, what up, Jarhead? Hey, Airborne, I prefer Devil Dog, you know? Well, entschuldigen Sie bitte, Herr Teufelhunden. What about Leatherneck? Gureine? What about I kick your ass? Which Marine Amphibious unit are you going to get to help you with that? You think I'll need a MAU? I'll do it myself. Pay attention tonight, by the way. You might actually learn something. What? Like how you managed to hang on to that wife of yours. How one of Uncle Sam's misguided children like you manages to keep a woman like that hanging around him is beyond me. Gene Chomsky smiled a crooked smile. It's beyond me too, Jeff. He sighed. Jeff recognized the shift from the playful insults they'd been trading. I'm surprised you and Gene didn't name your little girl something that shortens to Janine, Ginny, Jen or something else along those lines. How old is Elise again? She's almost four, the proud papa replied. It's weird. While I was still in Force Recon, the best part of my day was helo casting into the water or gung-ho shit like that. Now it's coloring a Snoopy coloring book with Elise. That sounds pretty great, Gene. The plates on the Universal Gym crashed together as Jeff finished up his military press reps. 
He'd prefer to use free weights for his workouts, but without someone around to spot him, the Universal was safer. Tompkins would need to have free weights, too. He finished his eight-hour workday at Bilzerian's at two before coming to his alma mater for his workout. I guess pre-workout workout would be more accurate, Jeff thought. After the upper body work, he'd lace up his skates for the on-ice leg work. Suicides on the ice. I must be nuts. Hey! Jeff spun on the stool he sat on. He looked up at the person who yelled at him. A man in his forties scowled at him from the entrance to the weight room. How did you get in here? I opened the door. And just what the hell do you think you're doing in here? Finishing my chest and arms workout. What gives you the right to use my weight room? Jeff looked around. Your weight room? Funny. I don't see a plaque with your name anywhere. Not that I care what your name is at this point. The only plaque I saw is the one outside the door that reads, Gift of the Class of 1966. Don't get smart with me, you little punk. Little? I haven't been working out this hard for eight years to be a little punk still. I better start working out even harder. I'm calling the cops. Okay, ask them to send Jack Dwachik when you talk to them. I haven't seen Jack in a while. And give my compliments to Chief Brewer if you would. Thanks. The man turned a shade of red that almost went with the school colors of black, yellow, and white he wore. He took a step towards Jeff before the door opened behind him. I thought you'd be on the ice by now, Jeff, John Kessler said when he entered. Working on it, John, he answered without taking his eyes off the other man. Well, here's your staff ID. I'm going to grab my skates and I'll join you out at the rink. It'll be easier to go over the defensive plays on the ice anyway. This punk is on staff? The other man asked, incredulous. Punk? This gentleman is an alum, Jay. Jeff Knox, class of 1987. He's one of my former players, a U.S. Army veteran of Panama and the Gulf War, and my assistant coach for this coming season. Oh, he's also Marissa Knox's son and very well remembered here. I suggest you tread lightly. The man turned red again, spun on his heel and left the room. John turned back to Jeff and raised an eyebrow. Didn't take you long. Hey, I don't know what his problem is. I'm a lover, not a fighter. That's Jay Wanamaker, the new soccer coach. He's his problem. And since when do lovers receive the silver star? So you're saying I won't be working with the soccer team then? Over his dead body. Don't tempt me like that, John. Hey, Jeff, you're drawing someone's eye. What are you talking about, Marine? You're seven o'clock. You've got someone checking you out. Jeff and Gene stood in GVMC's ER, working through their state-mandated EMT class observation hours. Gene stepped past Jeff in the direction he indicated, and then turned back to Jeff as if he had forgotten something. Can you see her behind me now? Brunette, maybe about 5'8 or so? The one with the oversized Frankie Says Relax t-shirt. That's her. Very 1983. Gotta go. Damn, jarhead! Jeff muttered to himself while Gene stepped away toward the lobby bathroom. Gene shot him a smirk. Jeff scratched his nose with his middle finger. Gene's laughter cut off when the bathroom door closed. Excuse me, doctor? The brunette asked. Jeff fought not to roll his eyes. He wasn't wearing a lab coat, which seemed to be part of a doctor's uniform even in the ER. He wore an adhesive name tag that read, Jeff, EMT observer. Not that he had any pickup lines, but that one was pretty lame. I'm not a doctor, miss, but may I help you? I'm Trina. Do you know how much longer the wait will be? I'm sorry, miss, but I don't work here. I'm only an observer from a local EMT class. You'll have to ask one of the staff for that information. Oh, how about your phone number then? My phone number? The woman nodded. She also flashed him a coy smile. He tried to figure out how to get out of the situation when Divine Providence smiled upon him. Jeff, trauma coming in, called Jean from behind the front desk. Jean was the nurse he was shadowing for the evening. Sorry, miss, I have to go, he explained before turning for the door to the treatment area. He emerged in the back hallway and stepped over to the PPE. Gowns, face masks, and latex gloves sat piled high on a cart. Jeff pulled gloves from one of the boxes. Whoa there, hero, slow down, Gene said, 
And what about the trauma? The only trauma was going to be to her ego when you turned down her request. Don't ever play poker, by the way. She's here for abdominal cramping with minor vaginal bleeding. Jeff processed that information. Wait, she's here for her period? Got it in one. Trina's a semi-regular. You stay back here, and I'll ask Doc Freeman to talk to her out front in one of the minor treatment rooms. There is an older gentleman with chest pain along that wall. See if Dawn needs a hand. I've already told her I'd send you over to help out. Jeff woke with a snort. A glance at his alarm clock told him it was 2.30 in the morning. Why am I awake? He wondered. It was then that Jeff heard laughter. The laughter sounded like it was coming from the back deck. He slipped out of bed. Jeff. He saw four people on the deck when he peeked out the kitchen window. They had what looked like beer bottles in their hands. Jeff ducked back into the bedroom and dressed in jeans, a t-shirt, and his sneakers without turning on a light. Using a pen light and a closed closet to see, he spun the combination lock of the gun safe there. The safe was an unexpected find when cleaning the apartment. Steve Bilzerian gave that combo to Jeff after emptying the safe. Jeff bought Mr. Bilzerian's 45 and Remington pump shotgun from Steve and placed those weapons back in the safe. He now extracted them again. Jeff grabbed the cordless phone before he left the bedroom. Enfield 911, this call is being recorded. What is the emergency? Four people are drinking on my back deck. I didn't invite them and I don't know who they are. They woke me up. Where are you calling from, sir? There's an apartment above Bilzerian's Hardware, 223 Main Street. That's where I am. They had to have come up my back stairs from the store's loading dock. That's the only way to access the deck without coming through the apartment. Can you stay where you are while I dispatch officers to your location? Yes, I'm still inside observing. I have no intention of going out there. Very good, sir. Hold on. 661 to 34? Jeff heard the unit answer back. 34? 34, Bilzerian's Hardware at 223 Main Street, the back deck off the second floor. We have an uninvited group disturbing. Access via the back stairs from the store's loading dock. 36 will be en route from Station E. 34, received! <laughs> Are you still there, sir? Yes, ma'am. What's your name, sir? Jeff Knox. Any relation to Joe and Marissa? They're my parents. This is Mary Summersworth, Jeff. What are those people doing now? Mary Summersworth was another longtime customer of his dad. Hi, Mrs. Summersworth. They're just standing. Wait, one of them just started smashing a table. They're bringing the table leg to the back door. I think they're going to break in, Mrs. Summersworth. 661 to 34 and 36. Party's about to break into the apartment. Tell your officers I'm armed, please, Mrs. Summersworth. We don't need any surprises when they arrive. Resident advises he is armed. I'm putting the phone down, he advised the police dispatcher. I'm leaving the line open, though. The table leg smashed through the window in the back door. The person holding the table leg slipped, falling against the door and breaking most of the dividers for the window panes. His friends laughed at him. A hand reached through the ruined window and unlocked the deadbolt. That hand twisted the knob from the inside and opened the door. Jeff heard more laughter and a loud, Shh! As the four stepped through the door, broken glass crunched underfoot. Why do we need to be quiet? Old man Bilzerian is stone deaf. One of them hissed. The sound of a shotgun cycling echoed through the kitchen. What was that? One of the other intruders asked. Something you're on the wrong end of, Jeff answered while he flipped on the light. He drew a bead on the man closest to him. On your knees with your hands behind your heads, gentlemen. Hey, listen. I said on your knees now, Jeff thundered while stepping closer. You have three seconds. The man with the shotgun pointed at him knelt in an instant, placing his hands on his head. One of the others took a step towards Jeff as the rest also complied. The muzzle of the shotgun swung towards the man who didn't follow orders. I will blow a hole in your goddamn chest if you take another step. Get down. The other man knelt and sneered at Jeff. Big man, hiding behind that shotgun. Have you forgotten I kicked your ass all through high school without one? You're dumb, Brian, but I didn't think you were that dumb. Jeff lowered the shotgun enough so that his face became visible to the four. 
Missed you at the young alumni gathering this summer. I got over that, though. Brian Cosgrove tried to place the man holding the shotgun but couldn't through his alcohol-induced haze. Who? Let me give you a few hints. We almost got into it in the cafeteria our first day of freshman year, and then once or twice a year until graduation. I flattened your brother's nose at the prom in 85 after he sucker-punched me. You almost died the day you accosted one of my girlfriends. Do I need to go on? Knox? I thought you were in the army? I came back just to add a little sunshine to your life, Brian. Enfield Police! A familiar voice called through the still open door. Come on in, Jack. Jeff's old friend, Jack Dwajic, stepped into the kitchen. A sergeant? Moving up the ladder, are you, Jack? Jeff pointed the shotgun at the ceiling while the officers handcuffed the four intruders. He threatened me, Cosgrove protested when he felt the cuffs close around his wrists. He pointed that shotgun at me and told me he was going to blow a hole in my chest. Really? You're lucky then, Jack responded. Lucky? Yeah. If you broke into my house in the middle of the night, I'd shoot you if you didn't follow orders. Jeff must have been feeling generous tonight. Now let me advise you all of your rights as defined in Miranda v. Arizona. A bleary-eyed Jeff trudged up the back stairs to his apartment just after 8 in the morning. Torn police tape fluttered from the railing in the light early October breeze. An Enfield police officer sat in one of his deck chairs, ensuring no unwanted folks accessed the apartment. Mr. Knox, I'm Officer Asada, the man said while he rose, extending his hand. Jeff? Pete, Mr. Bilzerian came by since he's the landlord, but no one else. I guess your plans for the day just changed? You could say that, Jeff sighed. I had most of the day off with nothing planned. Now I have to replace this door. Then I have to design a better one for the bottom of the stairs. The first I'll get done today. The second will take a little longer. I've got hockey practice at three, so I have to get this door done quickly and try to get more sleep. Semi-pro? Jeff shook his head. Assistant coach at Tompkins. First day of practice and my first day coaching ever. Well, best of luck all around then. Thanks, Pete. Jeff followed the officer down the stairs, closing the damaged door at the bottom the best he could in its condition. He turned into the store while Pete Asada walked to his cruiser. You know, Jeff, I need to talk to you about holding wild parties upstairs. You trying for a career as a comedian now, Steve? Steve laughed. Seriously, what do you need? I'm going to grab one of those steel entry doors over there, Kalk. A level, nails, a hammer. Our friends from last night ruined the back door, and we have to replace it. After that, I need to figure out how to fix the door off the loading dock. We could look at enclosing the stairway too, while we're at it. You need a secure door at the bottom, Steve. That's how they got up there. Just worry about the steel door to the kitchen for now. I'll get someone else working on the stairway. Jeff walked back into the ice arena after practice two weeks after the break-in. He liked to stand in the dark rink and remember the games he played here. He wondered what it would be like being behind the bench and not on it. As Jeff looked around the darkened arena, he noticed someone sitting in the top row of seats up against the wall. Jeff climbed the stairs between the rows of bench seating. The mystery person didn't move. Hey, coach, the person said when Jeff drew near. Darren? It's me, coach. Darren Whitmore was a freshman who tried out for the hockey team. Today was the final roster cut, and Darren hadn't made it. Jeff sat. You okay, Darren? I'm okay, coach. I was just thinking how much fun I've had playing hockey over the years. I'm sorry about today, Darren. It's probably no consolation to you, but Coach Kessler and I spent hours trying to figure out how to keep you on the roster. You tried harder than anyone else out there the last two weeks. It's okay, coach. I knew making the team was a long shot. I've never been the best player on any team I played on, and I know the pyramid gets narrower as you move up. It's just... Darren motioned to the championship banners hanging on the opposite wall. I know it's not easy to win any championship, but I would like to have at least tried at this level. He sighed. I wish I knew what it felt like. 
Jeff sat in silence, gathering his thoughts. I wish there was a way to explain how it feels, Darren. You work all season reaching for that goal, and when you actually do it, I'd say it's like acing a test, but I'm not sure that's the right way to describe it. It doesn't surprise me you were on a championship team. You make things seem pretty effortless. It surprised the hell out of me, let me tell you, and it wasn't effortless, Darren. You know the price we pay, lots of practice. There were hours of running, thousands of push-ups and sit-ups, countless drills, suicides. Where was that? You see the banner over there, the one that says 1984-85? Wait, you went to school here? I guess Coach Kessler and I didn't introduce ourselves very well two weeks ago, did we? I'm from Enfield, Darren. My dad's a mechanic, and he owns a garage on Belchertown Road. Mom's taught middle school math here since 72. My sister and I both graduated from Tompkins, me in 87 and Kara the following year. Coach K was my head coach back then, too. Where did you go to college? American Military University. Where's that? I've never heard of it. A correspondence college that lots of military folks use. I did the coursework via mail while I was in the 82nd Airborne. I have my BA in history, though I never went to college. I finished up my degree at the same time most of my classmates did, too. Huh, Darren said, surprised. You're a boarder here, right? Yeah, I'm from outside of Chicago. Mom went here back in the 60s and met Dad at college. I haven't been here very long, but I like the area so far. So you'd be able to come by here between 4.30 and 5 o'clock, after practice ends every night? It's not like I have anything else to do now other than homework. I usually do my homework after dinner too. Why do you ask? I can work with you after the team finishes most nights. I'm taking a class at the community college here in town so I'll have to watch for conflicts, but I think it's doable. Why would you do that? And what about your girlfriend? The short answer is that someone helped me when I wanted to get better playing sports when I was your age. Now it looks like it's my turn. There's no girlfriend. My most recent girlfriend is at the University of Texas for graduate school. Now, are you ready to stop playing hockey? No. Then meet me here between 4.30 and 5 tomorrow afternoon, ready to work. You may not play this year, but that doesn't stop you from trying out next year. 5 January 1992, Hardwick Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. You've made incredible progress in the two and a half months we've worked together, Darren. I had to, Coach, if I wanted to stop getting shoved into the boards, dropped to the ice, having my pocket picked. Okay, you ready? Darren nodded. Jeff snapped a low pass from the left corner, well to the side of the net. Darren waited in the left slot. He blasted the puck back at the net, sending it through one of the small openings of the target tied over the goal mouth. Jeff fed him pass after pass. Darren placed shot after shot perfectly, changing his targets and scoring goal after goal. Go! Jeff shouted after Darren scored on the last shot. Darren broke for the far end of the ice. Jeff moved behind the net they'd been using, retrieving the puck he reserved. Darren came back down the ice at full speed. Jeff played a defenseman clearing the puck out of his end. Jeff passed the puck to Darren as the freshman curled back, out of the zone. Darren picked up the pass in stride and drove back down the ice. He curled around the far net and came back at Jeff, now playing against Darren. Darren closed on Jeff at full speed. He shifted to his backhand side to pass Jeff. Jeff leaned to follow. Darren popped the puck through Jeff's legs. Darren cut hard to his forehand side and blew by Jeff in a split second. Jeff turned in time to see Darren blast a shot from the top of the face-off circle. The puck entered the net top shelf, just under the crossbar. Yes! Darren yelled, pumping his fist. Darren turned back to Jeff with a wide smile. Jeff skated over and bumped gloves with the freshman and then ruffled his hair. Nice job, it's good to see you're still sharp even after the Christmas break. If you don't make the team next year, I'll eat my jock. Um, ew, coach. All right, maybe not my jock. Maybe one of those pickle-covered abominations you call a hot dog in Chi-Town. Don't knock them till you've tried them, coach. Hey, John, how was your break? Jeff asked John Kessler when he walked into the coach's office the next day. The head coach sat at his desk with his head in his hands. It was good until today, the older man grumbled. Why? What happened? 
Wisniewski's out. Academically ineligible. Almost straight F's on his report card. That's going to leave us short at left wing. Man, the team was well balanced this year, though only average in performance. The team needed a spark of greatness before, but this was going to cause significant problems now. Then a light bulb went off for Jeff. Are we allowed to replace him? Sure, but with who? I've got an idea. I'll fill you in at practice. Darren dropped his books on the desk in his dorm room in Hampton Hall. His first full day of classes following the Christmas break was over. He had about two hours before he needed to meet Coach Knox for his workout session. It was Monday, so that meant on ice leg day. He'd be lucky if he were able to walk back to his room afterward. A knock at Darren's door shook him from his musings. Who is it, he called. Opportunity, came the reply. That sounded like Coach Knox's voice. Darren opened the door and discovered he was right. Grab your stuff and let's hit the ice, kid. What? What do you mean, Coach? Don't we have to wait for practice to be over? Not when you're practicing with the team. Let's go, Whitmore. Move with a purpose. With the team? We're gonna be late if you don't pick it up, Darren. Darren grabbed his already packed hockey bag and slung it over his shoulder. Why am I practicing with the team today? Because there's an open roster spot for a left winger, and I mean to get you on that roster. Let's go. Shag it. Jeff led the way to the field house. He directed Darren into the referee's changing room. Why am I changing in here? You want to spoil my surprise? Get dressed and start stretching. I'll come to get you. Jeff hustled to the coach's office to get changed himself. Where'd you go? You'll see in a few minutes, John. I found you a winger. Okay. Jeff changed in record time. I'll see you on the ice, John. He was out the door before John could say anything. He knocked on the ref's room door two minutes later and stuck his head in. You ready? I'm so nervous I think I'm gonna throw up. Then you're ready, let's go. John Kessler looked behind him when Jeff and Darren emerged from the player's tunnel to the locker rooms. Darren's the player you've been working with for two months? He's your special project? You got anyone else ready to take Wisniewski's spot? Let him prove you wrong, John. I'm telling you this kid's ready. John looked at Jeff like he was shining him on. All right, Darren hit the ice. Darren charged through the boards and joined the team. I hope you're right, Jeff. I don't want to disappoint this kid again. He's a sniper with rockets in his skates now, John. Just wait. John Kessler didn't have to wait long. Darren blew by the defenseman in the first round of drills and ripped a slap shot past the goalie, stick side low. He scored glove side high the next time. The skating drill proved Jeff correct about Darren's speed as well. Son of a bitch. I thought you were feeding me a line of bull, Jeff, but damn. He just needed some fine tuning with skating and shooting. Is he back on the team? Damn right. Jeff sat on the couch in his apartment, reviewing his EMT class notes later that week when his phone rang. Hello? Hi, Jeff. Hey, Mom. What's up? Jeff, have you heard the rumblings at school? Some low-level stuff with Wanamaker's name attached. But what's going on now, Mom? I haven't been paying attention. Jay Wanamaker's trying to get you fired. He's painting you as a violent, out-of-control veteran who's not fit to be working with kids. I guess that doesn't surprise me. Is Wanamaker doing anything else? He was counting to 100 in his head, trying to keep his cool. He's calling for a meeting of the entire high school faculty and staff, then he'll try to have them vote to ask the board of trustees to remove you. Marissa was upset. <laughs> Mom, deep breath, do you think that's really going to go anywhere? When's the meeting? Next Monday, the 13th at 6.30 p.m. It's going to be in the Feldman Auditorium. The gears already turned in Jeff's head. No worries, Mom. I've got this figured out. Jeff and his guest for the meeting entered the Feldman Auditorium just after 6.30 the following Monday evening. His accuser already railed at the pulpit. Jeff marched straight down the center aisle towards Jay Wanamaker. This meeting is for faculty and staff only. Ah, how soon we forget, Mr. Wannabe. It's Wanamaker. Whatever. Did you forget about our first meeting in the weight room? Jeff pulled his school ID from his coat pocket. I believe mine reads staff, like everyone else is in this room, except the sergeant here. 
Anyway, I understand I'm a dangerous and violently unstable veteran who is unsuitable to be around kids? You are. You pointed a gun at four men. Oh, do you mean the four men who broke into my apartment in the middle of the night? Those four men? What, no answer? Streak roll tape. The audio of Jeff's 911 call sounded through the hall, carried by the well-placed speakers and excellent acoustics. When it ended, Jeff took up the story again. As you heard, I remained inside the apartment, just observing until they smashed the window on my door and entered my residence. Then I held them at gunpoint until the police arrived and arrested them. You had no call to do that. You could have left. He had no duty to leave his apartment, Wanamaker, Jack shouted from behind Jeff. He made a disgusted noise before stomping past Jeff. He grabbed the microphone off the podium, causing it to squeal. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sergeant Jack Dwachik of the Enfield Police Department. Mr. Knox is duly licensed to own firearms and has trained in their use. He also knows when not to use them. To answer Mr. Wanamaker's assertion that Mr. Knox should have left his apartment to avoid confrontation, he had no requirement under the law to leave, none. Allow me to quote Massachusetts General Law Chapter 278, Section 8A for you. In the prosecution of a person who is an occupant of a dwelling charged with killing or injuring one who was unlawfully in said dwelling, it shall be a defense that the occupant was in his dwelling at the time of the offense, and that he acted in the reasonable belief that the person unlawfully in said dwelling was about to inflict great bodily injury or death upon said occupant or upon another person lawfully in said dwelling, and that said occupant used reasonable means to defend himself or such other person lawfully in said dwelling. There shall be no duty on said occupant to retreat from such person unlawfully in said dwelling. If that person had taken one more step towards Mr. Knox on the night in question, Mr. Knox would have been justified in pulling the trigger on his shotgun. Instead, the courts arraigned all four intruders on multiple charges, including breaking into and entering Mr. Knox's apartment. The only crimes committed that night were against Mr. Knox. I completely agree, Sergeant, a new voice called. A woman strode down the aisle from the shadows at the back of the auditorium. She smiled at Jeff. Wanamaker she ignored, despite his signaling from behind the podium. Instead, she extended her hand, requesting the microphone. The woman nodded to Jack when he handed it to her. Ladies and gentlemen, I am... Excuse me, Mrs. Hightower? Wanamaker tried to interrupt. Meredith Hightower ignored him. Uh, Meredith Hightower. I am the chair of... Mrs. Hightower, please. The Board of Trustees. Ma'am? Mr. Knox, she yelled, silencing Wanamaker. Yes, ma'am, Jeff answered. You spent some time in my home state of North Carolina while you were in the Army, did you not? Yes, ma'am. If this person interrupts me again, I'd like to ask you to do something. What's that, ma'am? Would you stomp a mud hole in his ass and walk it dry, please? She asked in her best Southern Belle voice. She asked with the sweetest smile ever on her face. It would be my pleasure, ma'am. Now, as I was trying to say, my name is Meredith Hightower, chair of the Board of Trustees. I can see by your faces that most of you are here to support Mr. Knox and that you would have voted down any motion to try and dismiss him. So therefore, I am here to tell you that regardless of the outcome of this meeting, Jeff Knox will remain on the staff here until he chooses to leave us. For those of you who do not know Mr. Knox, allow me to fill you in on who he is. Mr. Knox is a native of this town, of Enfield, and has deep roots in this community. He graduated from this school in 1987, his sister in 1988. Mr. Knox decided to enlist in the United States Army upon graduation, where he volunteered for both the infantry and the paratroops. He is a combat veteran of both Panama and the Persian Gulf. While in the Army, he completed a Bachelor of Arts in History. That's while he exceeded a soldier's requirements. He earned two early promotions and numerous commendations. He chose to come back to Enfield. He chose to return to Tompkins, come back here, and do the same thing you do, make our students' dreams come true. 
He chose to do that by working with our hockey team. You can vote to do whatever you want. The trustees have already met and decided what we're going to do. He stays. Thank you. Good night. Meredith handed the microphone back to Jack and turned up the aisle. Jay Wanamaker darted around the podium and made one more attempt to speak to her. She stopped, looking him in the eye. You may want to update your resume, Mr. Wanamaker. She left the stunned man and continued up the aisle. She walked to the audio-visual booth. Darren Whitmore stood when she entered. Thank you for the phone call, Mr. Whitmore. Of course, Mrs. Hightower. Coach Knox is the reason I have a second chance to play high school hockey. Make the most of it, then. That second chance paid dividends for the team as well. The Black Bears went from a team winning half its games to a team burning up the conference. The addition of Darren was the catalyst the team needed. They stormed the gates during the second half of the season and earned the third seed in the conference tournament in mid-February. They cut through the other teams with ease. Their combined margin of victory over three games was 15 to two. The Western Mass Division II tournament was more of the same for Tompkins. Seeded second, they cut down the seventh seed, Monument Mountain Regional High School from Great Barrington in a lopsided six to one game. Amherst High fell next three to zero. Tompkins hosted the Western Mass final against the eighth seed, their old rival Petersham Preparatory Academy. Petersham, who eliminated first seeded Greenfield in the first round, knew they had nothing to lose. They knocked the higher seeded Bears back on their heels by scoring first at the midpoint of the first period. Jeff slapped Darren on the helmet just before the end of that period. The freshman looked uninspired during his last two shifts. Hey, Jeff growled to Darren when he turned around. Did I waste two months? Was I wasting my time? No, coach. You look like you want to go back to the top row, Jeff said, referring to finding Darren sitting in the dark in October. Are you satisfied with that conference championship? Where's the kid who wanted to play for a state championship? You're playing for the chance to play at the Garden, for the state championship. Either show up for the game or go sit in the locker room. Jeff walked back down to the opposite end of the bench while Darren processed what he said. Darren was the last player off the bench and down the tunnel when the horn sounded to end the period. At the door to the Bears locker room, Darren turned. Coach, can you give us a minute? John Kessler looked over at Jeff with a wry grin. Jeff shrugged and John turned back to the freshman. Go ahead, Mr. Whitmore. Darren disappeared into the locker room. Why does this seem familiar, Mr. Knox? Hey, I just chewed him one for skating like he'd rather be watching the game, John. I never suggested he pull a me. Well, we'll see what kind of results he gets. I may be looking at a future captain. John looked at his former captain for a minute, not saying anything. What? Nothing. Not yet, at least, John thought. Whatever Darren said in the locker room achieved the desired effect. There was ferocity in the Bears' charge when they came out for the second period. Petersham's fire died like someone dumped an extinguisher on it. The one nothing deficit soon became a 4-1 to one lead for Tompkins. The beatings continued in the third period, and Petersham's morale didn't improve. Tompkins already led 6-1 to one when their defense passed the puck to Darren as he curled back up ice. Then... Darren bore down on Petersham's defense as he did to Jeff in January. Come on, kid, Jeff whispered. Fake him right out of his jock. Darren leaned left. The defending player bit on the fake, and Darren cut hard right. His defender fell, and Darren was all alone in seed the blue line. He ripped a shot over the goalie's right shoulder, and the goal lamp lit. Jeff pumped his fist while the Tompkins players celebrated. Was that the move that convinced you? John asked over the roar of the crowd. Indeed it was, John. Jeff looked out over Boston's sprawl the following week. Eight inches of snow covered the city. He was doing the tourist route in a before tonight's game, visiting the Prudential Center's observation deck. So much U.S. history occurred within 20 miles of where Jeff stood. He lived his whole life in Massachusetts, army time accepted and yet he hadn't done any touristy things available in eastern Massachusetts. Maybe he'd visit Concord and Lexington tomorrow if they won tonight. Hey, sailor, you come here often? Asked a friendly voice. 
Your grandfather would wash your mouth out with soap if he heard you call a paratrooper sailor, he replied, hugging Heather. He kissed Jane on the cheek. Pfft. Grampy is a big old softy. Why, I'm the apple of his eye, I am. More like a pain in his ass. What are you ladies doing here? Not that I ever mind seeing you two. You'd best be happy to see us, mister. What are we doing here? We're stalking you, of course. Seriously, though, we just happened by the joint and thought the view from the observation deck would be cool to see. I'm glad you did. How did your internship at Georgetown go, Heather? It was okay. I got a glowing evaluation which will help when I get to graduate school in a year or so. Jeff raised an eyebrow. I want to spend time in Greenwich next year with Mom and my grandparents now that Mom's retired. I'm still angling for my PhD, don't worry. I'm sorry I wasn't here for you at the end of the summer, by the way. Have you heard from Allison? Jeff shrugged. A Christmas card with a letter. I was glad to hear from her. I sent her the same thing. I won't lie to you, Heather. The end of the summer hurt. I love her, and I know she loves me. But we're going to different places. I'm sure you know what your grandfather would say about the situation. Suck it up and drive on airborne? Fits the situation, doesn't it? It does. Now I don't know about you two, but I'd like to see Faneuil Hall and Quincy Market. Are you two coming along? Only if you buy lunch. Tompkins punched their Division II state finals ticket that night with a win over Methuen in the semifinals. They would face Nauset Regional in the finals tonight. As in 1985, Tompkins was on their spring vacation break. Jeff heard there were busloads of Tompkins fans coming. The garden would be loud tonight. John and Jeff reviewed the available tapes of Nauset's games. Next, they developed a strategy they hoped would be effective. That task started the morning after their semifinal win, and they finished up by 11.30 the morning of the finals. Jeff opted to walk to the USS Constitution on that mild March day to tour the historic warship and fill the time. Then he visited the USS Cassin Young, a World War II destroyer also docked at Charlestown. He returned to the hotel at 3 p.m. The minutes ticked by slowly before the pregame dinner. It felt like Jeff was six again and waiting for Christmas. The team gathered at 5.30 for their meal and left for the garden after dinner. Silence filled the locker room while the group dressed. John gave a brief speech after their warm-up skate. Jeff grabbed Darren when they returned to the ice for the 8.05 start. Here it is, Darren. You have the chance you told me you wanted back in October right in front of you. What are you going to do with it? Leave it all on the ice, coach. If I have anything left at the end of the game, I'll have wasted it. Then go out there and win. If Jeff thought Darren was fast before, it seemed he found another gear that night. His teammates adjusted to his increased speed. They hit him for breakaway after breakaway. Only Nosset's goalie kept them in the game. Gee, this looks familiar, doesn't it, John? I'm not as young as I used to be. My heart can't handle that kind of game again. The team skated to a scoreless tie in the first period. John gave the team another little speech during the intermission. Jeff saw Darren whisper to his center while making motions with his hands. Both nodded as they put their helmets back on for the second period. The teams lined up for the face-off to start the period. The center prepared to draw the puck back to his defense, or so it seemed. Instead, he punched the puck forward with his stick. Darren swooped through the circle to collect it before he streaked past the Nauset defense. He buried the puck in the back of the net. The Tompkins crowd went nuts, making the garden sound as if it would shake apart. Darren's counterpart on the right wing scored a minute later. You could see the Nauset warriors deflate while Tompkins celebrated. They never recovered. Tompkins added an empty net goal at the end of the third. Nauset tried pulling their goalie to swing the momentum in the game, but it cost them another goal instead. Tompkins and their fans counted down with the scoreboard. The players spilled over the boards and piled onto each other, while the Valley fans took up the Tompkins fight song once again. Meredith Hightower pounded on the glass alongside her high school classmate, Nora Whitmore. John and Jeff slid themselves out to the pile. Darren Whitmore grabbed Jeff in a hug when he slid near. Holy shit, coach, holy shit. Congratulations, Darren. Thank you for giving me this chance. I didn't give you anything, Darren. You earned this. You earned this with hard work. 
don't ever let yourself think otherwise. One championship as a player and one as an assistant coach. Pretty good, Jeff, Paul Ezekiel commented as they worked together the following weekend. I'm not sure which felt better to win, Paul. Winning with my teammates as a player, or this one, helping one of the players realize a dream. So what's next for you? EMT work? The hockey coach, John, was also my baseball coach in high school. He's asked me to help him out with that as well this year. I'll start looking for an ambulance job after the season. My buddy Gene already works as an EMT out in Springfield. I'll see if his service is hiring at that point. A high school-aged girl walked into the store before either could bring up another topic. Her black hair was cut short, pixie style. Her bright blue eyes locked onto Paul as she passed through the door. She strutted over to the register where both men stood. The beauty pulled Paul down for a long, scorching kiss. Hi, Paul muttered when they untangled themselves. Hi, she responded in a husky, throaty voice. Jeff watched with amusement as well as a bit of wistfulness. Now that you've checked the young lady's tonsils, Paul, do I get to be introduced? Paul cleared his throat. Ah, Jeff, I'd like you to meet Hillary Bynes. Hill, this is Jeff Knox, my supervisor. Very nice to meet you, Miss Bynes, she nodded in reply. Hill's the head cheerleader at VRHS this year, Paul informed him. Man, Heather's gonna be insufferable when she finds out. 26 May 1992, Avocado Street, Springfield, Massachusetts. Well, I'm back in uniform, Jeff thought as he stepped out of his truck for his first day of orientation. He was starting at Connecticut River Valley Ambulance today. Jeff spent part of last night pressing his uniform and shining his boots before his first day. It was a little strange to be wearing a white shirt and navy blue trousers rather than army green, but he'd get over it. Get your ass in gear, new guy, called a voice from across the parking lot. Who said that? Jeff quoted as he stomped across the lot towards the speaker. Who the fuck said that? Who's the slimy little communist shit twinkle toes cocksucker down here who just signed his own death warrant? Gene Chomsky laughed while he shook hands with Jeff. Hey, that was pretty good for an army guy. Do you know how often I wanted to channel my inner gunnery Sergeant Hartman with some new privates in my unit? Probably as often as I wanted to. First day? Yeah, riding third today from six to two. About time you got started, I've already got five months of service on you, Airborne. Yeah, but I've got a state championship title and a district finals appearance on you, Jarhead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. did you bring lunch today or were you going to try and buy it? Buy at least until I know how much room there will be in the ambulance, for a cooler or something. Plus, I want to get a handle on the routine. The only routine I've seen in this job is when you punch in. After that, every day's a little different. Speaking of punching in, I should get inside and find the crew I'm working with. Come on and I'll show you where you need to go. Gene led Jeff into the ambulance station. He pointed out the office's layout to Jeff while they made their way to the crew room. Hey, Bubblehead, Gene called when they entered. Your fresh meat is here. A short, stocky man made his way over to Gene and Jeff. Stu, this is Jeff Knox. We went to SRVCC's EMT class together. Jeff, this is Stu Masterson. Don't let him feed you a line of shit about how the Navy is the best armed service. Don't worry, Gene, I know the Army's the best. He's been here all of five seconds and he's talking shit already? Stu asked Gene. At least this jarhead was in the Navy department, he said to Jeff. Yeah, the men's department of the Navy, Gene shot back. Isn't it time for you to go home? Stu asked. Gene had come off the night shift. Gene waved over his shoulder as he walked away, laughing. Damn Marines, Stu muttered. Where are you from, Jeff? Enfield. You? Davenport, Iowa, if you can believe that. Iowa? How'd you wind up in the birthplace of basketball? A long and convoluted story, Jeff. I'll tell you later, you were in the Army then? Yeah, I did a hitch with the 82nd Airborne after high school. I got out last year and started my EMT class in the fall. After that, I did a little assistant coaching for my high school and worked at a hardware store until I got hired. Did I hear Gene call you Bubblehead, Submariner? Exactly. 
I did a tour on an Ohio-class boomer and a tour on the beach at the sub-school in Groton. Are there a lot of vets in this job? There are three of us prior service folks here at CRVA, and you're number three, Stu replied, as a large man came through the door. Hey, Neil, come meet the new guy who'll be riding with us today. The man walked over. Neil Fournier, meet Jeff Knox. Jeff, Neil Fournier. Good to meet you, Neil. Neil grunted. Stu show you where we keep the fallopian tubes in the truck yet? Fallopian tubes? No. Go find a box with fallopian tubes in the back of the truck. Jeff looked at Stu and gave him a quick wink. Sure. Jeff walked out of the crew room and out to the garage. Instead of looking through an ambulance for a box of fallopian tubes, he found an ambulance with a female EMT checking her vehicle's equipment. Excuse me? Yes? Hi, I'm Jeff Knox. I'm starting today. I was wondering if you could help me out. Hi, Jeff. I'm Connie Willis. What do you need? Jeff explained what Neil asked to find and what he wanted to do in return. Oh, I'm in, she answered with a laugh. Connie followed Jeff back to the crew room. Here you go, Neil. Where's what I asked you to find? It's right here, Jeff replied, indicating Connie. A box with fallopian tubes I found in the back of a truck. Stu sprayed a mouthful of coffee across the floor. He was lucky he didn't hit anyone. The other EMTs in the room laughed while Neil looked like he'd bitten into a lemon. Stu mopped up his coffee, then grabbed Jeff by the elbow. Come on, new guy, time to check the truck. Stu led him back out to the garage and showed him to their assigned ambulance. Co-workers came by to congratulate him on his handling of the hazing ritual. I'm guessing the old left-handed O2 wrench gag isn't going to work on you either. It looks like every job has their FNG rituals, huh? Would that wrench be in the same place where the Navy keeps the sonar return? Yeah, Stu laughed, right next to the screen door for the submarine. Stu showed Jeff the storage layout in the back of the ambulance. He told Jeff he was lucky that car VA standardies at ambulances a few years ago. Try remembering where things were in 10 or 15 different ambulances, all with different layouts. Luckily, they buy the ambulances from the same manufacturer as much as possible. Five minutes later, Neil emerged from the crew room. Hey, new guy, come here, he called from the back of the truck while scowling at Jeff. Jeff stepped out of the back and onto the garage floor. He figured he was about to get it. Neil stared at him for a minute before smiling. That was pretty good. Nice job, kid. Come on. It's time to show you what the job is really like. Paul Ezekiel jogged to Bilzerian's loading dock the following afternoon. He was running late for his after-school shift. Paul approached his one-year review date and hadn't been late for a work shift during that time and didn't want to break his streak. Paul punched in and noted he made it by one minute. He straightened his name tag and stepped out onto the sales floor. I thought you were going to be late, Paul. Hey, I wasn't sure you'd still be working here now that you've got that job in Springfield. I dropped down to about 20 or so hours a week for now. I can't pick up any overtime at the ambulance service until I'm off training. <laughs> it's not like I have a tough commute to get here. So Steve's keeping me on the schedule. <laughs> when did you start? Yesterday, I rode third from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. I was the third member of a crew when the normal staff on an ambulance is two. I observed a lot yesterday. My shift tomorrow will be more hands-on. Anything you weren't expecting? Sure, lots. Like what? Like how much cleaning you have to do. The ambulances are diesel-powered, not gas, generating a lot of black dust you constantly have to clean out of the ambulance. We weren't all that busy yesterday, so I learned how to clean the inside of an ambulance. Sounds very different than what you learned in EMT class. Not too much different than when I finished up my training in the Army, before I reported to Bragg. They teach you the basics in basic, pun intended. And then you do on-the-job training to learn all the little things about the everyday routine. When's your next shift? Tomorrow? There. Tomorrow, 6 to 2 with one of the guys I worked with yesterday. Here. Tomorrow night, 5 to close. But enough about me. How's your young lady? Paul blushed. Jeff punched him in the shoulder. Wear your raincoat. The next day, Jeff worked with Stu Masterson once again. Connie Willis was their partner this time. Jeff held his coffee while he walked through the door and punched in. Good thing you've already got your coffee, Jeff, Connie said as she walked past him with a box of supplies for the ambulance. 
The calls are coming fast and furious already today. Did you already check the truck? He arrived 15 minutes before his shift was supposed to start, but that didn't appear to have been early enough. My car's in the shop, she explained as they walked out to the garage. Again, my neighbor dropped me off, but she had to be at work at 6 also. I've been here since about 5.30. What's wrong with your car? Wish I knew. It's been in and out of the shop over the last month, stalling, no pep, running rough. I'm beginning to think the garage is jerking me around. Are you anywhere near Enfield? About a half an hour away, why? If you can't find a place closer to bring your car to, you could try Valley Automotive on 21 in Enfield, just over the line from Belchertown. Heck, I'd drive 50 miles to have my car running right. Thanks for the tip. You sound like you've been going there for a while. Years. Stu joined them a minute later. They rolled out of the garage and got a call right away. The call itself wasn't very involved, but there was another one right behind it. Jeff learned that we have one coming out when you're done with that is not what you wanted to hear when arriving somewhere. He was glad he brought his lunch today. They finished their third call of the morning and headed to get another coffee when the fourth rolled in. Ambulance 15? Stu's head dropped to the steering wheel and he motioned for Connie to answer the radio. Connie sighed as she picked up the microphone. 15. 15, the River House Nursing Home for the Code. Paramedics en route from the station. Ah. Stu dropped the pretend dramatics and hit the lights while Connie answered. 15 has the River House. She put the microphone down and turned to Jeff, who rode in the back. A cardiac arrest, a code, at a contracted nursing home. Put the oxygen bag and a jump kit on the stretcher to unload as soon as we get there. Grab the shortboard too so we can use it for CPR to put under the patient. Once we get inside, just worry about doing CPR. We'll handle everything else. We're about five minutes away. The medics are 15 and the closest hospital is the one we just left. So that's 10 minutes back there. Jeff nodded and did as Connie directed. He moved carefully while the ambulance wove through traffic. One hand for the ship, one hand for yourself, he reminded himself. Then, pulling on his gloves, he waited for the end of the response. Jeff opened the back doors and hopped out of the ambulance when they arrived. Stu helped him unload the stretcher. Follow me once we find out where the patient is, Jeff. Connie will get the paperwork and meet us wherever we wind up, Stu told him. They stepped through the ambulance entrance into the nursing home. The opening felt like an afterthought as they had to weave around boxes stacked in the small entry. Once inside the nursing home proper, Jeff noticed an odor he knew he'd become very familiar with if he stayed in the ambulance business. Stale urine, feces, and disinfectant. Breathe through your mouth, Stu recommended, noticing the look on his face. It'll help. It's not perfect, but it'll help. Someone stuck their head out of a room further down the hall. In here, the woman called. The three crew members walked to the room in question. Connie didn't bother to stop at the nurse's station since no one was there. They stepped into the room to see a half dozen people standing around a bed. One person did CPR on an older woman. Another used a pocket mask device to perform a type of mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Jeff questioned how effective the CPR was since the woman's torso sank into the bed's mattress with each downstroke. The four other people in the room didn't appear to be doing much of anything. Who's got her paperwork? Connie asked. She had to repeat herself in a louder voice to get someone's attention. Finally, she and one of the onlookers left the room. Jeff looked over at Stu. On our stretcher? Yep, set up on the opposite side of the bed, Stu said, indicating the woman doing CPR. Jeff got the stretcher ready. They moved the patient using the bed's sheet. Once the patient was on the stretcher, Jeff cut the nightgown she wore to expose her chest. He checked his landmarks. Jeff placed one hand on top of the other, locked his elbows and pressed down. He felt and heard several of the patient's ribs break with his first compression. What was that? One of the nursing home staff asked. Her ribs, Stu answered while he secured the stretcher's straps around their patient. You broke her ribs? The woman asked in horror, gaping at Jeff. 
A common outcome with CPR, especially in the elderly, Stu answered. Does she have osteoporosis at all? Stu started to pull the stretcher out of the room. Jeff rechecked his landmarks and continued CPR. I don't know. She's not my patient. They never are, Jeff heard Stu mutter under his breath. Connie noticed her partners approaching. She stuffed the paperwork back into the envelope she'd been handed. She'll be at Western General, she said to the nurse at the desk. The patient goes to Riverside. Not today. Riverside's across the river in town, a 25-minute ride from here. Western is 10. A patient in cardiac arrest goes to the closest hospital. But of course, you and I have had that discussion before. Connie walked away with Jeff and Stu before the woman could answer. She took over ventilations, and Jeff continued his compressions. They threaded their way back through the ambulance entrance. Jeff stopped his compressions in the narrow space because they wouldn't have fit otherwise. Another ambulance backed in as they emerged into the sunshine. Jeff restarted CPR while Connie and Stu pulled the medic's stretcher out of their ambulance. They loaded it into Ambulance 15. Jeff, jump in the back of 21 here and guide the head of the stretcher. Once it's locked in, restart CPR. Jeff did as instructed. Connie got in, hooked up the BVM to oxygen, and began ventilating the patient again. One of the paramedics opened the tube roll while he sat in the seat near the patient's head. Hold CPR, the medic said. Jeff stopped. He watched as the medic inserted a flat metal blade with a handle into the patient's mouth. Jeff saw the patient's jaw lift, and the medic inserted a long plastic tube. The medic put down the metal blade and put his stethoscope on. Bag, he said while he listened. Then, finally, he heard what he wanted to hear because he took off his scope and said, restart CPR. Jeff did so. Lines in, the other medic reported. A 20 in the right AC. I got a thousand bag hanging, running wide. Monitor shows assist delay. Epi is going in. She paused, inserted a different syringe into the IV, and announced, atropine going in. The first medic nodded. He looked over at Connie and said, we're good. We're heading to Western? Yep, here's her paperwork. It says Riverside, but I told the staff we were going to Western. I'll drive, and Stu will follow us. This is Jeff. It's his second day, his first intercept, and his first response. Don't break him. He seems like a good guy. Connie hopped out of the side of the ambulance and shut the door. Jeff? I'm Neil, and this is Christy, the first medic said, introducing his partner and himself. Nice to meet you both. Jeff replied between compressions. Jeff, Connie's a good driver, but you're still going to get tossed around a bit because you're standing, Christy said as they heard the truck shift into drive. If you need to, hold on to that bar on the ceiling with your top hand and do compressions one-handed. It looks like your arms are long enough. Jeff nodded as the truck began to move. When it moved forward wasn't the problem. He could brace himself when they moved forward. Any lateral movement sent Jeff off balance. He followed Christie's suggestion. Told you, she smiled. You know what the technical term for that bar is? He shook his head. That's the oh shit bar. Jeff chuckled and shook his head again. You didn't know this was going to be your introductory class in EMS black humor, did you? No, it does remind me of the humor we had in the airborne, though. Neil continued to pump breaths into their patient's lungs. Jeff switched his compression arm. You were in the airborne? Neil asked. Yeah, got out almost exactly a year ago. But this is your first week in EMS? Why the delay? Christy asked. Neil was busy calling the hospital on the radio. When I got home last summer, a group of friends and I went by my old high school one rainy day to skate. I ran into my former hockey coach, who asked if I wanted to be an assistant coach for him. Of course, I couldn't pass that up. John was also my baseball coach in high school, so he asked if I would help him during baseball. So once we lost in the baseball district finals, I applied here. Gene Chomsky and I were in the same EMT class. Wait, where did you go to school? She asked as she injected another medication into the IV. No change in rhythm, Neil. The second epi's going in. Neil nodded while he finished giving his report. Swift River Valley Community College. No, high school, where did you coach? Second atropine, Neil. 
Oh, Tompkins and Enfield. That's why you look familiar. I was at the state finals. I used to play in high school myself. But Jesus, your left wing was phenomenal. What a speed demon. Darren? Yeah, we call him Streak. Would you believe he didn't make the team at the start of the season? You're kidding! They put any further discussion on hold as they backed into the ambulance bay at Western General Medical Center's emergency room. Christy took down the IV bag. She clamped it off before putting it on the patient's abdomen. The cardiac monitor went on the patient's legs. Christy looped a stretcher strap through its handle. Jeff guessed that was to keep it from falling. Christy asked Jeff to lift his hands while covering the patient with a sheet, leaving her face visible. Always maintain the patient's dignity even on calls like this, Christy advised him. You never know when the family will be waiting for you when you open the back doors. The last thing you need to do is pull grandma out of the ambulance naked in front of them. You help steer the stretcher. I'll do the compressions on the way in. I'm okay, he said. I can keep going. I'm sure you can, but I'm lighter than you. So it'll be easier for me to stand on the bottom stretcher rail and do compressions while you push the stretcher. The reverse wouldn't work so well. He guessed she weighed 100 pounds lighter than his 215. As soon as Connie put the truck in park, Stu opened the back doors. Christy told Jeff to hop out and help unload the stretcher. Once Neil said they were all set, Stu and Jeff rolled the stretcher into the ER. Room 2, a nurse told them when they entered. Room 2 was right off the ambulance bay. Inside, Jeff helped move the patient over to the hospital stretcher after Christy and Neil ensured everything was ready. Connie took their stretcher outside after telling him to stay and listen. Neil was giving his report when Jeff turned his attention back to the room. 78-year-old female found pulseless and apneic in her bed at Riverhouse Nursing Home about 30 minutes ago. Unknown downtime. CPR in progress upon BLS arrival. Though the patient was still on the bed and staff there had nothing under the patient while they did compressions. So ineffective compressions? Interrupted the ER doctor. I'd have to say so, Doc. BLS started CPR on their stretcher with good support underneath, dropped an OPA, and began ventilating the patient. They emerged from the facility as we arrived. She's got a 7.0 tube, 21 at the lips, good breath sounds, missed in the tube, no epigastric sounds, and I saw the tube go through the cords. She's got a 20 in her right AC. We gave her about 350 of fluid, but only two epas and two atropines because we were so close. She's been asystolic the whole time. No allergies in the med lists with your nurse. They wanted us to take her to Riverside, so I doubt she's in your system. Riverside? They wanted you to drive across the city at this time of day? We told the staff we were coming here. They didn't seem happy. As your medical director, I would have been unhappy if you drove across the city, passing hospitals on the way, with a cardiac arrest. So you guys did the right thing. Good job. Neil nodded and waved Jeff out of the room. They walked back out to the ambulance bay, where Stu, Connie, and Christy cleaned the back of paramedic 21. Hey, Jeff, you doing okay? Connie asked. <laughs> Jeff was puzzled. Yeah. Why? Your first code. First time doing CPR. They'll pronounce her pretty soon, I would imagine. Connie, I was in Panama in the Gulf War. Three members of my squad died in an ambush in Panama. I helped out at a highway accident with two deaths in Ohio last June. You might say, this ain't my first rodeo. Sir June, 1992, Avocado Street, Springfield, Massachusetts. Jeff checked out his ambulance in advance of a 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. shift with Connie Willis. Whoever used Ambulance 13 before them forgot how to restock after calls. Jeff had quickly learned that one of the biggest lies in EMS is, the truck's all set. You checked your truck every shift especially if the off-going crew told you that about your vehicle. If your partner said that, however, you took them at their word. Trusting your partner was essential. Hey! Jeff looked up to see Connie climbing into the truck. Hey, Connie, how are you today? When were you going to tell me your dad owns Valley Automotive? She asked, casting him the evil eye. I didn't want to color your perception by letting you know it was dad's shop. Is your car running better now? Better, it's running better than when I bought it and he barely charged me anything. Was it the distributor cap? That and bad spark plug wires you knew, didn't you? 
Dad taught me well. When did you figure it out? I didn't. When your father handed me the invoice, I was stunned at how low it was. He said to me, Jeff let me know a friend would be bringing her car in and what its problem might be. Your dad hooked a thumb at the wall behind the counter when I asked who he meant. You'd think I would have noticed the 8x10 photos of you under that flag when I walked in. I don't know, Connie. I tend to blend into the background. Right, she snorted. Dude, you'd turn my head. I should be so lucky, Connie. She looked at him for a long moment. <laughs> it doesn't bother you. <laughs> what? That I'm gay? That you're this close to me for eight or more hours a day and I'm gay? Why? Does it rub off? Is it contagious? Connie gave him another look. Look, do we work well together? Most of his shifts were with Connie now that he was off orientation. I think we do. It's only been about a week, but I like working with you already. Does it need to be more complicated than that, Connie? My best friend died at 22, killed on the last day of fighting in the Gulf War. Ken was my roommate in the army for nearly three years. He mentioned a single girlfriend in all that time. Ken was looking forward to meeting a woman and settling down, but never got that chance. We get, what, maybe 80 years on this earth if we're lucky. So why should I care how someone else is happy so long as it doesn't affect anyone else? Plus, you have to look on the bright side. The bright side being, I can help you spot chicks and vice versa. Guten Morgen, Frau Noka, Jeff said as he pushed his stretcher into a nursing home bedroom. This was their first call of the day. Frau Noki was Mrs. Gertrude Noki, a patient he met during training. They'd taken an instant liking to each other. Frau Noki was a chronic renal failure patient, someone whose own kidneys didn't work. She needed kidney dialysis to filter the urine from her bloodstream. She usually lived at home with her husband, Edgar. She resided at Pioneer Valley Nursing and Rehab while rehabbing from a mild heart attack before returning home. Guten Morgen, Gottfried, she replied with a smile. She liked to use the German equivalents of CRVA's staff's names with them once in a while. A thin, older gentleman wearing an A2 leather flight jacket sat next to her bed. The jacket appeared to be an original World War II issue item. Captain, Jeff acknowledged the man with a nod. Sergeant, how are you this morning? Edgar Noke asked in return. Edgar Noke was once Captain Edgar Noke, U.S. Army Air Forces. He'd been a B-17 navigator and was a veteran of 20 bombing missions over occupied Europe. He met Gertrude Osterland while supporting the U.S. occupation troops in Germany after the war. They returned to the United States and married in 1946. They had five children and 11 grandchildren. Heartbroken now, sir, I thought I'd get diese schöne Dame aus Deutschland all to myself today. Yet here you are. I'll arm wrestle you for her. What, and have you tear mine off and beat me with it? No thanks, sir. I don't know, Edgar. His accent is better than your... Trudy, don't you start... Okay, Mrs. Noke, the warden signed your release. Oh, good morning, Mr. Noke. Hi, Connie. It was a good morning until your partner started talking about absconding with my war prize. Well, that would leave the door open for me, so I can't say that I share your level of concern. Connie batted her eyelashes at the older man. Well, my spirits seem to have suddenly improved. Maybe this won't be such a bad day after all. All four in the room laughed. The Noakes were favorites of the staff of CRVA, and they were still deeply in love after nearly five decades. The crews expected this kind of banter when they picked Mrs. Noke up at home. The crews were sure that it occurred all the time. The Noke household must have been a wonderful place to grow up. Mr. Noke stood as Jeff got the stretcher ready for Mrs. Noke. <laughs> well, Liebchen, I'm off to change the locks and throw your stuff in the street. That's what you kids do at the end of a relationship these days, right, Connie? That's what I did to the last loser I dated, sir. Sounds like a fool to me if he warranted such an occurrence, my dear Constance, Mr. Noak said, tipping his cap. He kissed his wife after she settled onto the stretcher. I'll see you tonight, Trudy. Love you. Ich liebe dich auch, Edgar. Mrs. Noak smiled while her husband left the room. She looked like a girl of 19 when she did. She once told Jeff that's how old she'd been when she met the dashing Captain Edgar Noak in 1945. Mrs. Noak still had a hint of that smile, 
as Ambulance 13 started its 15-minute ride to Riverside Hospital's dialysis unit. I hope my future wife and I will be as happy as you and the captain after 50 years, Frau Noki, Jeff said, while he rode on the bench seat next to the stretcher. Mrs. Noak sighed, the smile expanding again. There are times when I still have to pinch myself, Jeff. Germany at the end of the war was not a happy place. There was so much fear of what the Allies would do once it was over. Edgar brought me here to America, and I've never regretted coming. I certainly haven't regretted becoming his wife. What about you, Jeff? There must be a young lady in your life. Well, that's a strange story, ma'am. Jeff told her of Keiko, Allison, Heather, and the strange relationships that bound them, both individually and collectively, to him. My, my, Jeff, quite the ladies' man, aren't you? Jeff chuckled. What a difference a decade makes, ma'am. Ten years ago, I couldn't get a girl to say my name if I tripped her in the hallway. Since high school, the other events in my life have been direct results of deciding to change how I was in 1983. These ladies? The fates have smiled on me. Jeff, Mrs. Noak said, looking at him like she was explaining something significant to one of her grandchildren. You don't think that they're all part of your life for the same reason? They're there because of who you are. Hey, Jeff, called Bill Harris, CRVA's operations manager, when Jeff passed through the office the following week. Jeff walked over to Bill's office. Hey, Bill, what's up? You interested in any overtime on the 4th of July? Overtime pay plus double time for a holiday? Free money. Ah, uh, yeah, the hardware store where I work part-time will be closed that day, so I wouldn't lose hours there. You're working two jobs? You've been working here less than a month and you're already adjusting to EMS life? Jeff laughed. Well, I worked at the store in high school and live in the apartment above the store now. It's a great commute. I'll bet. Anyway, the overtime would be in your hometown of Enfield. The towns asked for a truck to cover so their fire department ambulance could participate in their planned events. Since you're from Enfield, you might be interested. I also figured you would know how to find the addresses of any calls you get better than the rest of us. Yeah, I'm interested. I've never seen the town do this before. Something new that the select board wants to try. I think the sheriff's department, the state police, and the other fire departments in the area are going to help out too. With July 4th falling on a Saturday this year, the towns in the valley would hold a weekend-long celebration by spreading their celebrations out. However, Enfield was the town holding their celebrations on the actual holiday. What time do we have to be in Enfield that day? The parade steps off at 9 o'clock, so 8. That way you can get to their fire station and check in. So get here at 7 to check the truck and drive back? Or earlier? 6.30 to be safe. We figure you'll finish in town by 4 or 5 in the afternoon. The town's going to let you eat at the cookout they're having on the common, too. You'll have to stay available from there. Sounds good. Who am I working with? Jeff smiled at the answer. So you woke up at 5.30 a.m., left Enfield well before 6, got to CRVA for 6.30, checked the truck so we could leave by 7.15, and get back to where you started by 8.00? All of that so you could go to a cookout you would have been at anyway? Yes, but you left out three essential pieces of information. And what would those be? One, I'm getting paid to go to the cookout now. Two, we can post at my apartment if we want to. Three, I get to work with you, Bubblehead. I'm gonna kick your ass if you try to hold my hand, Stu Masterson warned him. I'm sure I'll get to hold hands with prettier people today, Stu. Sorry to disappoint you. You didn't tell me you had a brother. You didn't tell me you were missing your two front teeth either. I'm not. What are you talking about? You mean you're not... yet. Stu chuckled. Where are we going, hotshot? Jeff waved him up Route 21 towards the center. They checked in with the duty officer at the fire station, picked up a portable radio, and headed for the town common. Jeff directed Stu to the shady spot the police reserved for them. They'd be right across the street from where the cuckoo would be. Stu and Jeff checked the ambulance one more time and then did what any good EMT would do while waiting for something to do. Take a nap. 
They stretched out in the back of the ambulance after they checked the function of the radio first. They also set their alarms on their watches so they'd wake up before the volunteers arrived to set up the cookout. I wonder how loud the snoring got in here, Stu asked, rubbing his face two hours later. Doesn't matter, we slept through it. We would have been up in an instant if dispatch called us too. Well, let's see if anyone's here yet. The two stepped out of the truck. Crossing the street, Stu and Jeff saw that no one was there yet. They stood on the sidewalk gazing across the expanse of green. Two pickups arrived a few minutes later, and the occupants began to unload a large flat charcoal grill. Jeff and Stu pitched in. They helped set up everything before the parade ended at the other end of the common. They sat off to the side, allowing town residents to line up for the cookout first. Jeff spotted familiar faces in the crowd almost every minute. How could he not after spending his whole life here? So when Jeff spotted the faces he hoped to see in the line, he led Stu to them. Jeff snuck up behind one girl and blew into her ear. She swatted at her ear and then turned to see who was there. After punching Jeff in the chest, she hugged him. I thought you said you weren't coming, you big meanie. I said I was working, Kara, not that I wasn't coming. He released his little sister and hugged their mom. His father, Heather, Jane, and Alice were next. He pretended he was about to hug Tom, but Tom drew his fist back. Jeff smiled and shook his hand instead. Jeff turned to introduce Stu to his family, but Stu was staring at Kara mesmerized. Jeff snapped his fingers in Stu's face. That startled Stu from his reverie. Now that you're back with us, Stu, I'd like to introduce my family and friends. This is my mom, Marisa, my father, Joe, and my little sister, Kara. I'll get you a towel to wipe the drool off your chin in a minute. By the way, the beautiful young ladies here are Heather Donnelly, her mother, Jane Donnelly, and her mother, Alice Cavanaugh. The ugly old bastard with them is Alice's husband, Tom Cavanaugh. Everyone, this is my partner for the day, Stu Masterson. I'm not ugly, Mr. I'm about to get pounded, Tom protested. I have a face weathered by experience. Yeah, I've experienced it way too often for my liking, that's for sure, Jeff shot back. I wonder whether I'll survive another encounter. That's it. No food for you. All right, all right, Miss America, I apologize. Jeff could see Stu out of the corner of his eye. Stu glanced over at Kara about once a second. Kara looked back, blushing. Jeff bit his lip so he wouldn't laugh at them. He glanced over at Heather and saw her doing the same. The older adults talked amongst themselves and didn't see what was going on. Everyone collected their food and drifted off in groups. The adults went one way, Kara and Stu another. Heather and Jeff wandered off toward his ambulance. So what was that all about? I don't know, Heather, but it reminds me of those episodes of the monkeys growing up. You know, the ones where Davy Jones got those cheesy sparkles in his eyes, and so did the girl. And you didn't get them when you met Keiko. It sounds like you did. Oh, I'm sure they were the biggest ever. So how was your plan to stay home this year received? Heather shrugged while they sat on the back step of the ambulance. It wasn't well received at first, but Grammy and Grampy understood once I explained things. Mom's been okay with it since March. I told her I'm committed to getting into BU next fall in 93. So anyway, how's the job going? I like it so far. I've been working with some great partners, like Stu. There's certainly a lot to learn, and everyone's been great about answering my questions. Do you think you'll stay in ambulance work? I think so. It's only been about a month, but I like it. There's a family that everyone in our service adores, one of our regular patients and their family. I love the fact that we get to know our regulars and build a rapport with them. I know that's not always the case, but making that connection is neat. Our patient is trying to teach me German. Heather smiled. Yeah, the Nokis are great people. Jeff tried to keep his face neutral. Who? Heather patted him on the arm. Mr. Noak and Grampy go to a lot of the same World War II veterans events. I've known them for years. He told us you likely wouldn't be able to say anything because of privacy laws. Mr. and Mrs. Noak love how you guys all join right in with their playful talk when you pick her up and drop her off. They know you guys have a serious job, but both love how you don't take yourselves too seriously. 
Jeff still didn't reply. Heather patted his arm again. I'll change the subject, sorry. Are you coaching again next season? John hasn't officially asked me yet, but he's also still on his vacation. I really enjoyed coaching last year. Not just because we won the state championship in hockey, or went to districts in baseball either. I'd like to coach again this year if he wants me back. Like that's going to be a real problem. The two friends chatted back and forth about inconsequential things while they ate. Then, as they finished, a group of eight or nine-year-old kids ran up to the back of the ambulance. They asked if they could look inside. Heather held her hand out for Jeff's plate, which he gave her. He nodded when she motioned towards the trash can. Jeff turned and waved the kids into the back of the ambulance for a guided tour. When Heather returned, she could only smile at Jeff's demeanor around the kids. He had them all laughing and excitedly raising their hands when he asked them questions. The kids may remember the parade and the cookout the town held today, but their favorite memories would be of the man who took the time to show them his ambulance. Heather smiled along with the parents gathered on the sidewalk. Jeff would be the best father ever. After the cookout broke up about one o'clock that afternoon, everyone assembled at Jeff's apartment on Main Street. He thought ahead enough to block off Bilzarian's parking lot with a heavy chain and padlock to keep other people from filling the lot. There was plenty of room in the lot for two cars and his van-style ambulance. You've got furniture, Jane exclaimed when they trooped in from the kitchen. Yeah, it's like I'm a real grown-up now. There's still so much space up here though, Jeff. Alice added. Well, it's just me here. Any extra stuff I've got is being stored in the unused bedroom there. I wanted to have some furniture in the front room for when the sun's coming through those windows. I needed some in here to relax and watch TV or, like now, have friends over. There's still a lot of room for just one person, though. It feels like a cavern without someone else sharing the space with me. What about raising a family here, Jeff? Marissa asked. Wow, no softball questions from you, Mom. Honestly, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I know who your daughter-in-law will be, but other than that, I've only spent about a week with Keiko. I still have a whole lot I need to get to know about her. And vice versa. I know Keiko wants to teach English at the high school level. I think she wants kids like I do, but we haven't talked about that yet. If she does, I don't know how many or how soon. I don't know where Keiko will want to live either. That might be here, Spokane or somewhere else. A lot of questions we still need to answer, Mom. To answer your question more directly though, the Bilzerians did it. If we chose to, we could too, at least for a while. The bedroom I'm using could easily be the master, and the other two could hold bunk beds or two singles each. We're near Center Elementary, Enfield Middle and SRVCC. Valley Regional or Tompkins aren't too far away either. We'll have to see where the future takes us. We can't wait to meet her, Jeff. Yeah, no. Thanks, Jane. I'm looking forward to making the introductions myself. Hey, Jeff said to his partner while they drove back to Springfield. You okay, Stu? Stu didn't answer right away. Instead, he twisted his hands around the wheel, the vinyl squeaking while his skin moved across it, and his knuckles were white. Stu, I can't know if there's a problem if we don't talk about whatever it is. Jeff, I... Stu stopped and tried again. I want to date Kara. Okay. Does Kara want to date you? She says she does. Then what's the problem, bud? You're my partner. Yes, I am. So? Jeff, this is your little sister we're talking about. Stu, it's obvious you like her, and I'm reasonably certain she feels the same way. You two spent three hours by yourselves out on the deck back of my apartment. Kara's a big girl and can take care of herself. Do you plan on hurting her? No, do I look like I have a death wish? No, but you can never tell. After all, you're one of those guys who liked riding around inside an underwater Coke can. As opposed to jumping out of a perfectly good aircraft? Okay, so we're both a little twisted. Stu, go out with her. Get to know her. See if there's anything there. If this is the chance for you both to find happiness, then so be it. Thanks, Jeff. Your sister? Connie asked during their next shift together, Tuesday the 7th. Yeah, it was kind of comical. What did you tell him? To shit or get off the pot. Why do you men always go for the bathroom humor? 
That's mild compared to the EMS humor I've seen so far. Maybe it's a repressed fascination with our wee-wees? Connie rolled her eyes. The radio, which played in the background while they drove around, ran a story that caught Jeff's attention. He snapped upright and turned up the volume. Again, in our lead story out of Iraq, there are reports of violence across much of the country's southern half. Shia and Sunni groups are attacking each other in what can only be termed a prelude to a wide-scale civil war. In contrast, the Kurds in the north seem to have taken charge in that region without significant conflict. The provisional government, which announced itself last week, based out of the northern city of Mosul, has been able to keep the violence out of their territory. In an announcement, the Kurdish Transitional Authority urged residents of their region to reject the violence in other areas and live together in peace. The KTA states all residents will be welcomed into the political entity of Kurdistan so long as they work for the peaceful advancement of their new nation. There has been no sign of Saddam Hussein since the outbreak of violence. There also has yet to be a reaction to the news from any United States official. 15th of September, 1992, Avocado Street, Springfield, Massachusetts. So this is a simple lifting test with the stair chair, Connie explained to a new EMT a week later. Don Ebersol was new to Carvier. Jeff wasn't quite sure what to make of her yet. He only met her five minutes ago. We'll run through this twice, once with Jeff as your partner, once with me. Rescue Randy here weighs 150 pounds. We'll use him again when we evaluate your mechanics while lifting the stretcher and doing other forms of lifting required on this job. Randy was a weighted training mannequin most commonly used by fire departments. If dropped, he wouldn't complain much. Jeff looks like he could lift Randy all by himself, the new girl said while giving him an appraising look. Jeff wasn't sure he liked the look she gave him. Maybe so, but this is a team sport, he reminded her in a stern voice. You could seriously injure your partner or your patient if you don't or can't. Do this right. I want to be able to pick up my kids later in life and maybe sit down for longer than five minutes too. Everyone else he worked with proved to him long ago that they could pull their weight on this job, no pun intended. He'd have no patience for someone who couldn't, and neither would any of the people who trained him. Don's eyes widened before she swallowed and nodded. Jeff and Connie reviewed proper body mechanics before the test. Don needed a few pointers during the two stair chair repetitions, and she needed more help with the stretcher. Neither he nor Connie said anything about the graphite grease on parts of the stretcher to Don. It was something for rookies to learn on their own. After testing her on four and aft lifts, which she needed more work on, they sent Dawn off to the office to finish her new hire paperwork. I don't know about this one, Connie said to Jeff in a low voice once they were alone. Yeah, I'm not sure about the vibe I get from her either. Where'd she take her EMT class? The vibe or the fact that she looked at you like a starving woman staring at a medium rare steak. Anyway, she took her class at Stick during the spring semester. Stick was Springfield Technical Community College. Any feedback from them about her? The usual, which meant they'd heard nothing. Dawn owned an EMT card and a pulse. End of story. Is she training with you? Is that why you're foisting me off on Jean after today? He asked. Yeah, she is. You're super thrilled, aren't you? Good partners are hard to come by, Jeff. I trust you'll have my back when we go somewhere. Regardless of the call, your situational awareness is outstanding and your skills are top-notch. She'll have to prove all of that to me, and quickly. And I, got I don't know what they were thinking when they let us work together. I can't imagine why they would concentrate all of this awesomeness in one truck either, Gene, Jeff replied. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> Dude, are you high? Why don't you just say the Q word? Damn, I thought we were friends. Gene had just violated a primary EMS rule, don't poke the bear. His asking, what's the worst that could happen, did just that. Jeff's reply highlighted another EMS superstition. Unimaginable horrors would befall any EMS provider who dared utter the dreaded Q word, quiet. Ambulance 15, crackled the radio. Jeff looked at Gene, holding both hands towards the radio to say, you see? Gene laughed and picked up the microphone. 15. 15. Western General Medical Center, 4th floor, 
Patient Hamlin is returning to the river house, requesting a 1330 pickup. Bring in your oxygen. 15 received. The river house? The river house? See what you did? You know I hate that place, Gene. It's going to take me a week to get that smell out of my nose. Oh, suck it up, would you? Guten Abend, Frau Noke. Hi, Jeff. Trudy. Noke responded in a weary voice. She also answered in English, which was unusual. Are you okay, ma'am? We took extra off her tonight, explained the dialysis nurse. Jeff nodded. Dialysis was hard on a person. Taking more water weight off of Mrs. Noak than normal always seemed to increase her post-treatment fatigue. Is the new scale ready or do you need us to use the regular scale? Facilities finished the new scale today, so tonight would be a good night not to move Trudy more than you have to. Okay, thanks. Frau Noke, I will weigh the stretcher instead of this wheelchair, and I'll be back. Jean will be over in a moment. Mrs. Noke nodded with her eyes closed. Jeff put the wheelchair away, then maneuvered his empty stretcher over to the industrial-sized scale the dialysis unit installed to accommodate stretcher patients. The manager had found it at a local shipping business that was closing and lobbied for the hospital to purchase it. They've got it working? asked Jean from behind Jeff. Yeah, the staff took some extra weight off Mrs. Noak today, so weighing her while on the stretcher will be a big help. Jeff and Jean moved Mrs. Noak onto the stretcher with the utmost care. First they weighed her, and then Jeff returned to her nurse and reported the after-treatment weight. Mrs. Noak asked to have the stretcher's head lowered most of the way, after Jean and Jeff loaded her into the ambulance. Jeff backed into the Noak's driveway 20 minutes later. The lights for their back deck snapped on at the sound of the backup alarm. She slept the whole way here, Jean reported when he stepped out of the ambulance. The two EMTs unloaded their patient from the truck without jostling her. They then wheeled her up the ramp behind her house. Glad I convinced Paul this ramp was a good idea, Mr. Noak commented when Jeff and Jean wheeled his wife to the slider off the deck. Paul was the Noki's oldest son, a builder, and brought a crew to his parents' house during Mrs. Noki's stay at the nursing home. They built the ramp in a week, having it ready well before Mrs. Noki's return. Liebchen, are you okay? Mr. Noak asked, stroking her hair. Yeah, Edgar, I'm just tired. Boys, would you put me in my chair in the living room? They did as she asked. Is that okay, ma'am? Jean asked once she was in her favorite chair. She nodded. Jeff and I will see you Saturday night. You take care. Thank you, Eugen, Mrs. Noak replied. Mrs. Noak pronounced Eugen. Eugen. Mr. Noak walked them out to the deck. Thanks for taking care of my Trudy tonight, boys. Of course, sir. Will she be all right? Don't worry too much, Jeff. She'll bounce back after an hour or two. We're glad to hear that, sir. She's just about everyone's favorite patient at Carvier. We know, Jeff. Mr. Noak smiled. We're lucky to have people like you two and the rest at your company taking such good care of her. So you boys have a good night. Jeff and Jean wheeled the stretcher back out to the ambulance. Man, they've become like grandparents to everyone at CRVA. That they have, Jean. Let's hope they'll be around a long time. Hey, Jeff, how was the night? Connie Willis asked Jeff when he emerged from the bunk room at CRVA. Jeff cast her a dark look. It sucked. Thanks. He and Neil were coming off an overnight shift. They'd worked the only ambulance staffed at the basic life support level at CRVA overnight. Every time we laid down, the radio seemed to go off. Dastardly Dave had a horrible night, too. Dave Amorosino was the overnight dispatcher at CRVA. If they'd been busy, he'd been more so. That good, huh? We went to the river house three times, Connie. Jeff saw a faint smile on Connie's face. She knew how much he hated that place. Well, hopefully you can get back to what EMS actually stands for next week earn money sleeping. Jeff grunted his agreement. Where's your partner checking the truck? She'd have to be here first. Connie's voice conveyed her annoyance with Don Ebersoli. The woman managed not to get fired in the two months she worked there, but Don wasn't going to win employee of the year either. It was five minutes before the scheduled start of their shift. Even though you couldn't punch in until your start time, 
the company custom was to be on site 15 minutes early. By the way, have I told you Don thinks you're yummy? Connie, I'm already so tired I'm going to throw up. Don't help. Connie teased Jeff about her partner's infatuation with him every chance she got. She knew Jeff didn't feel the same way. But if you spent time with her, Jeff, you'd feel the same way, she crooned, batting her eyelashes. The same way I do now, you mean? Whenever Jeff was around Don, she managed to open her mouth and say something that turned him off just a little more. Don't worry, I'll protect you. I'm taking one for the team working with Don, you know? I'm telling you, Jean. Lately, I feel like someone's watching me while I'm at the apartment. You're just paranoid. That doesn't mean someone's not out to get me. You remember the break-in at the office two weeks ago? The one where they hit the personnel office? Yep. Gene, please don't repeat this, but Bill Harris told me whoever broke into the office only opened the file drawer holding the employee files. They didn't touch anything else in the office but that filing cabinet. The thieves only removed my file from the drawer. Nothing was missing from the file, but things were out of order. Okay, that's a little creepy. You think? Keep your head on a swivel, Jeff. The concerned conversation ended when they arrived at Riverside Hospital. Mrs. Noak greeted them with a wide smile. Guten Abend, boys. Hi, Mrs. Noak, Jean replied. You're looking ready to run the Boston Marathon tonight. Did they not have to take too much off you today? No, not too much today, you again. Mrs. Noak hopped up and walked over to the scale under her own power. If they could have gotten away with it, Jeff and Jean would have let Mrs. Noak ride in the front seat of the ambulance rather than strapped to the stretcher in the back. Now, Mrs. Noak, you let us help you to the door. There could be some ice we don't see in this darkness, Jean admonished her when they arrived at her house. It was almost six at night in early December. Sunset was nearly an hour ago. Don't you be jackrabbiting on us. I'll behave, Eugen, she promised him with a pat on his hand. The front porch lights were off when Jeff backed into the driveway, as were most house lights. Nunyer Noak always turned them on before the ambulance crew returned his wife, if it was after dark. A bad feeling washed over Jeff. Frau Noka, was Mr. Noak going anywhere this evening? Jeff asked when he opened the back doors of the ambulance. Nein, Gottfried, was his los. Your porch lights are off. Mr. Noak probably just forgot to turn them on. I'll grab one of our flashlights. Jeff and Jean wheeled Mrs. Noak to the front door on the stretcher. They helped her to her feet and turned to open the door. It was locked. Jeff's feeling of dread grew. Do you have your keys, ma'am? She handed them to Jeff with a look of concern on her face. Jeff opened the door and turned on the lights to the living room. Edgar Noke sat in his recliner, bolt upright. He was pale and sweaty, and his breathing was labored. Jean, oxygen and jump kit, Jeff called while he knelt next to the man. Jean dashed away to retrieve those items. Edgar, Mrs. Noak gasped in a voice full of fear. Mein geliebter Edgar. Tears already streamed down her face. Edgar Noak's pulse was rapid, irregular, thready. Jeff heard wetness in his breathing. Jean rushed back in with the two items Jeff requested. Without being told, he placed a non-rebreather mask on Mr. Noak, giving him 100% oxygen. Captain, are you having any pain? Mr. Noak nodded, pointing to his chest. Mrs. Noak, Jean called. Mrs. Noak? She looked over at him. Does Edgar take any medications? Medications, she repeated, dazed. Yes, ma'am, she nodded. Could you show me where they are, please? She led Jean into the kitchen and opened a cabinet. Inside were pill bottles for both. More importantly, there were pre-typed lists of medication names and prescribed dosages for Edgar and Trudy. On the list for Edgar was the other information Jean needed, NKDA. Edgar had no known drug allergies. Back in the living room, Jeff raised the portable radio. 15 to dispatch, any ALS available for this address? A 76-year-old male with chest pain, rails, and pedal edema. 15, 21 is tied up. I'll check with Western General's medics. When Jean turned back to the living room in the kitchen, he spotted the Noak's small personal phone book. Ma'am, we'll bring this with us so you can call family. Mrs. Noak nodded. We're ready to put him on the stretcher, Jean. 
Jeff reported when they returned. 21's unavailable. Dispatch is checking on Western's medics. Gene snorted. We can be at Riverside before they even cross the bridge, so let's get moving. They lifted Mr. Noak onto the stretcher. Mrs. Noak clung to his hand. Jeff asked her to wait inside while they passed through the front door. They wouldn't fit if Mrs. Noak still held Mr. Noak's hand. Jeff placed her hand back in Mr. Noak's to give her something to hold on to once outside. Jean helped Mrs. Noak into the front passenger seat when they reached the truck, then helped Jeff load Mr. Noak. Jeff connected his patient to the truck's oxygen tank once inside. Jean closed the doors behind them. Mr. Noak grabbed Jeff's hand when they rolled out of the driveway, lights spinning. Take care of my Trudy, Jeff, Mr. Noak gasped. You're going to be around for many more years, Captain, Jeff assured the man. Jeff rechecked Mr. Noak's VTOL signs before picking up the radio to call the hospital. Jeff gave a short, curt report and hung up the microphone. We'll be at the hospital in about five minutes, sir. Mr. Noak nodded. Three minutes later, Gene backed the ambulance into the ER at Riverside Hospital. He helped Mrs. Noak to the back of the truck, then helped Jeff unload her husband. Mr. Noak still had chest pain, but his color had improved with the oxygen. Mrs. Noak clung to her husband's hand as they walked into the ER. Staff directed the new arrivals to a room. Neither Jeff nor Jean recognized the nurse who entered to take their report and pulled the privacy curtain over the doorway. She looked bored. Nah. Jeff tried to give her a report while she pulled the oxygen mask off Mr. Noak. She ignored everyone in the room as she roughly pulled Mr. Noak's shirt off. Jeff grew more annoyed with each passing second. He could tell Jean felt the same way. Mrs. Noak was upset with the treatment of her husband of 46 years. Where's the IV? The nurse snapped, interrupting the report she was ignoring. Mr. Noak looked like he was having more distress again. We're a basic life support ambulance, Jeff informed her. BLS isn't allowed to start IVs. Did he get any nitro then? BLS isn't allowed to administer medications either. Damn lazy ambulance drivers the woman muttered. Storm clouds gathered over the heads of both Jean and Jeff. They both hated that term. Finally, Jeff stopped giving his report, stepped out of the room, and looked around. He recognized a few other nurses at the desk and walked over. Sally, would you mind coming over to room six before Nurse Ratched kills my patient? The woman looked up. She didn't remember the name of the EMT who made the request, but she recognized him. He was a competent provider, who'd always given her good reports that matched his patient's condition. Is something wrong? The battle axe in there just pulled a non-rebreather off a diaphoretic chest pain patient with shortness of breath, audible rails, and pedal edema. Without listening to my report or getting any vitals, she then proceeded to manhandle him while trying to undress him. She then called my partner and me, damn lazy ambulance drivers because we didn't start an IV or give nitro. But of course, as basic EMTs, we aren't allowed to start IVs or give medications. Shit, she didn't say that, did she? Sally asked in a pained voice while she rose. The other four nurses rose as well. There were very few things that could piss off an EMT so quick as calling them an ambulance driver. She most certainly did. Great, come on ladies. I'll get Dr. Caswell, one of her colleagues said as she headed in the other direction. Jeff, Sally, and the three other nurses hustled back to room six and pulled open the curtain. Mr. Noak was as pale as when they walked into his house. He manhandled himself upright, holding onto the bed rails while the rude nurse tried to make him lie down. Sally stepped over and pulled the back of the hospital stretcher as far upright as she could. She then wedged a pillow behind Mr. Noak. The oxygen went back on next. What are you doing? The first nurse asked in a none too polite tone. Keeping you from killing your patient, Sally muttered while putting Mr. Noak on the cardiac monitor. What are you talking about? <laughs> Did you listen to a single word they were telling you? They didn't even start an IV. They're not allowed to. What? The other ambulance drivers who've been through here today have started them. Outside. What are you? In the hall now. As the two women stepped out, Dr. Caswell stepped in. Jeff gave him the report he'd tried to provide the nurse. He made sure to note that they were a BLS crew. Jeff could hear the two nurses starting to go at it in the hall. 
Dr. Caswell nodded at Jeff's report and asked the nurses for various things. Establishing an IV, giving the patient nitroglycerin, and taking a 12-lead EKG. Jeff liked Dr. Caswell because he asked for something. Jeff knelt next to Mrs. Noak. Frau Noak, do you want to call your children? Things will be pretty busy in here for a while. Mrs. Noak nodded, and Jeff helped her to her feet. He escorted her to the nurse's station, where they asked to use the phone. Jean sat with Mrs. Noak while Jeff wrote his paperwork. They stayed with her until Paul Noak arrived 30 minutes later. Jeff and Jean loaded their stretcher back in their truck. They signaled clear and received the okay to return to the station. The ordinarily chatty pair were silent on the trip back. The following two crews to transport Mrs. Noak reported her listless behavior, the seeming lack of interest in life. A week before Christmas, the Noak home was still undecorated. Longtime CRVA employees mentioned how the house was always decked out well before the holiday. Christmas was Mrs. Noak's favorite time of the year. Mr. Noak survived, but he experienced an AMI, an acute myocardial infarction, EMS speak for a heart attack. Riverside sent Mr. Noak to the operating room for a quadruple bypass the night Gene and Jeff brought him to the hospital. Mr. Noak was now in rehab. Gene and Jeff dropped Mrs. Noak off at home on Thursday the 17th. The youngest Noak, Molly, would stay with her mother that night. At Mrs. Noak's request, Jeff and Jean brought her right to her bedroom. After her door closed, Jeff, Jean, and Molly stood in the kitchen, speaking in hushed tones. I'm worried about Mom. We are too, Molly. All of us at CRVA are worried about both of your parents. I wish there was something we could do to help them. Jean looked into the living room. I think there is. What? Molly asked. It was Christmas Eve. Usually, Trudy Noki would be happy about this day, but this year, she didn't care. Her Edgar was still at Pioneer Valley Nursing and Rehab. Her friends from CRVA and her family tried everything to lift her spirits since Edgar's heart attack, but they couldn't fix the hole in her heart. She missed her life partner. She wasn't ready for him to leave. The Noak house was almost dark when Jean and Jeff brought her home. The only exception was the blazing porch lights. Mrs. Noak said nothing while the pair unloaded her from the ambulance. She'd said nothing on the ride home either. Finally, they assisted her to her feet and escorted her inside. Jean snapped on the lights when they entered the house. About time you got home, Trudy. For the first time in weeks, Jean and Jeff saw a reaction from Mrs. Noak. Her head snapped up as disbelief and joy spread across her face. Tears fell from her eyes while she almost sprinted across the living room to her Edgar who sat in his favorite chair. He held her in his arms as she sobbed with happiness. We bist du hier here gekommen, Mrs. Noki gasped. How did I get here? Stu and Fran brought me home, Mr. Noki replied, motioning to the CRVA crew standing in their kitchen. Someone had to show everyone where you keep the Christmas decorations. Decorations? She asked as she looked around the house. In her haste to get to Edgar, Trudy hadn't noticed the decorations placed around the house the candles in the windows, or the tree standing in the living room. Her favorite ornaments decorated a tree covered in a waterfall of lights. All of their children were there, as well as their grandchildren. They'd been secreted away in the bedrooms upstairs until she walked into the house. A wondrous sound carried by the cold winter air came from outside, a lone woman's voice singing. Edgar nudged Trudy back towards the door, encouraging her with a nod. Stille Nacht, heilige Nacht, alles schläft, einsam wacht. Nur das traute hochheilige Paar, holder Knab im lockigen Haar, schlafe in himmlischer Ruh, schlafe in himmlischer Ruh. Just before Trudy reached the door, many voices joined the original soloist. They repeated the verse in English. Silent night, holy night, and all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Trudy Noak stood speechless in her doorway. Ambulances lined the street. Standing outside in their snowy front yard was almost the entire roster of EMTs and paramedics from CRVA. The on-duty staff wore their uniforms. Half of the crowd wore off-duty clothes. 
having given up part of their Christmas Eve for this surprise. A week of practices in the garage at work allowed their voices to blend well. They sang the entire hymn for their favorite patient. Tears traced down Trudy's cheeks again. The people who transported her to and from dialysis over the last three years trooped up to the door. One by one, they wished her and her family a Merry Christmas before melting away into the night. The sound of diesel engines faded away as the ambulances left, their crews heading back to await another request for help. The last person from the front yard to wish her a Merry Christmas was Connie Willis. She helped her favorite patient back into the house. How? How did you do this? Who came up with this idea? Molly's always been the little troublemaker mom, so blame her, Jerry Noak said. Jerry was the third of the five Noak children. Hey, I had help on this one. Gene had the original idea, but he, Jeff, and I fleshed it out last week. Connie heard about it and added the part with the ambulance company folks singing outside. Connie, who was the person who was singing at first? That was beautiful, Mrs. Noak asked. Instead of answering the question, Connie began to sing the song in its original German. Trudy closed her eyes and let the lyrics wash over her, remembering her childhood in Germany. Then, she added her voice to Connie's. By the third verse, Edgar and their children sang with them, reliving memories of Christmas's past. The grandchildren sat enraptured by the sound, along with Jean and Jeff. Trudy opened her eyes at the end of the hymn and squeezed Connie's hand. Connie smiled and squeezed back. Then, she walked over to Mr. Noak, hugged him, and left the house without a word. A crew will be by Saturday afternoon to bring Mr. Noak back to Pioneer Valley, Jean explained. He hasn't finished his rehab, but we were able to get him a weekend pass. Merry Christmas. I can't thank you two enough. Merry Christmas. Trudy Noak gave them both hugs and big kisses on their cheeks before they left. Jean and Jeff closed the front door behind them. They found Connie sitting in the back of their running ambulance. She sniffled as she smiled at them. You okay? Jeff asked her when Jean left the Noak's house. Jeff sat on the rear bench seat with Connie while Jean drove. She nodded. I'm glad we could do that for them. That's probably the best Christmas memory I've had in a few years. Your family threw you out around this time of year, didn't they? Because of your lifestyle choice? Connie nodded. She stopped being surprised at how perceptive Jeff was soon after they'd started working together. Five years ago tonight, I just finished my EMT class at Stick and was waiting for my test results to come back. I worked afternoons at a crappy little convenience store across town. I came home, and they had changed the locks. I was over 18 and the apartment lease was in my parents' names. The cops couldn't do anything. Luckily, I owned my car, not my parents. The police called around, but CRVA was the only place to offer me a place for the night. Bill Harris was the medic that night and made sure I ate dinner with the on-duty crews. I parked in random parking lots the next couple nights until I found my apartment. I had nothing but the clothes I was wearing, literally. CRVA had just gotten new beds in the bunk room, so they gave me a mattress and bed frame. That kept me off the floor of my apartment at night. The thrift store was a helpful spot, too. I got a lot of what I needed there. My test results came in after New Year's 1988. I got hired at Carvier, and I've never looked back. My family eventually moved to Montana from what I've learned. I refuse to allow myself to fail. They win if I fail. What are you doing tomorrow? Sitting around my apartment doing very little, she shrugged. Jeff shook his head. You're coming to my parents' house and eating with my family and our friends. I'll call mom and let her know when we get back to the station. You're a little thing, so I can't imagine you'll eat too much. Why would you do that? I consider you my friend, Connie. The thought of one of my friends being alone on Christmas doesn't sit very well with me. Gene's going to be with his in-laws, and everyone else we work with is either working or with their families tomorrow, too. You and I somehow have tomorrow off. Where do you live? I'll swing by after I get out tomorrow. A month later, Gene and Jeff worked an overtime shift together. They both picked up an open overnight shift. The payer weren't ready to go to bed yet, so they cruised around Springfield. The city sported three inches of new powdery snow, 
thanks to a fast-moving storm that came through that day. It almost looks pretty, commented Jean, looking out the passenger's window, until it starts to get all dirty. How's the whole paranoia thing going? Jeff rolled his eyes. I keep my bedroom shades pulled and my 45 and a quick-access handgun safe by the bed. Overkill much? I was starting to think so until I found a footprint on the ledge outside one of my bedroom windows. Not a man's footprint, either. What are you doing about that? I had a private conversation with a friend who's a sergeant on the force in Enfield. The police can't do much. At best, it's trespassing right now. So I put those anti-pigeon spikes on the ledges near the back deck. That's about it for now. I come to work, do my coaching at Tompkins, and live my life. I'm trying not to let it bother me too much. How's the coaching? Gene wasn't able to finish his question. Ambulance 15? Jeff picked up the microphone. 15. 15 for the fire standby. 58 Pearl Street in Springfield. 58 Pearl Street, stage in the parking lot behind the building between Worthington and Winter. Jeff stomped on the gas as soon as he heard the address and hit the lights. 15 has 58 Pearl Street. What's the rush, Speedy Gonzalez? Gene asked. That's Connie's apartment building, Gene. Gene said nothing in reply. Instead, he pulled on some gloves while his face set in a grim mask. Ambulance 15 arrived at the parking lot in under five minutes. The police kept the public out of the lot and off the street between it and the fire building. Red lights from the fire trucks mixed with the blue from the assembled police cruisers, which created swaths of color that appeared and disappeared. Radio transmissions echoed off the buildings and through the space. Ambulance 15 was the only ambulance on the backside of the building. Jeff parked the truck before setting the emergency brake and ignition kill switch. He removed the key from the ignition, but the ambulance continued to run. A touch of the brake pedal without the keys in the ignition would cause the engine to stop. The two partners locked the truck after removing their stretcher and equipment. Then, they crossed the street to report into secondary command at the back of the building. Hey, Chief. Ambulance 15 from Connecticut Valley. Where do you want us? The deputy fire chief looked over at them. Actually, can you guys check that girl over there first? We think she lives in the building, but she won't answer our questions. All she has on is that overcoat, her pajamas, and slippers. It was 25 degrees that night. Right away, chief, Jeff said. They approached the woman who stood staring at the fire, unmoving. When they drew closer, they both knew she lived in the building on fire. Connie. Connie turned to them, her face blank. There were dried or frozen tear tracks on her face. Jeff and Jean scrambled to lower the stretcher and get it ready for their friend. Once clear, they had Connie sit and swaddled her in all the blankets they had. Jean waited with Connie while Jeff talked to the deputy chief. She lives in the building, chief, or did. Nobody was going to be living in the building for some time. All floors were now fully involved. She works with us. If she's hurt, we'll go to Western with her. If not, we'll take her to our station for now. Jeff gave the chief Connie's name, work address, and which apartment had been hers. Man, this job can be hard enough when you're on our side of it, let alone the side of the people we try to help. Tell her I said good luck. Let us know if she needs anything. Will do, Chief, thanks. Jeff hustled back over to Jean and Connie. They wheeled the stretcher over to Ambulance 15 and unlocked it before loading Connie inside. They shut the back doors before the stored heat escaped. Jeff opened the cab, shut off the emergency lights, then returned to the back. Jean checked Connie's feet. They'd arrived in time to save her from a cold injury. Jean, I'll take this one if you want to get us to the station. You sure? Yeah, I'll explain later. The emergency lights are off, but the e-brake is on. Jean took the keys from Jeff and gave Connie a gentle smile before climbing out of the truck. Jeff heard the emergency brake release. The truck began to roll out of the parking lot. He brushed a lock of Connie's hair out of her face. She finally acknowledged Jeff's presence. She looked him in the eye and her lip began to tremble. Finally, she broke down in his arms. He held her for long minutes. It's all gone, Jeff, she whispered. Everything I had is gone, just like five years ago. 
Your clothes and things might be gone, Connie, but you have something you didn't have five years ago. Friends. You have friends who will help you through this. Connie said nothing but clung to him while they rode to CRVA's garage. They got Connie set up on the extra bed in the bunk room once back at the station. Jeff contacted Bill Harris since Connie was supposed to work in the morning. I'll fill her shift myself if I have to, Bill said to Jeff over the phone. We need to find her somewhere to go. The Red Cross means well, but they must have about ten families to place. She can stay with me, Bill. I have the space. I probably can line up some clothes and things for her by tomorrow, too. Really? Sure, think triple-decker-sized apartment. I've got a good couch and two unused bedrooms. But of course, I have to clear it with my landlord, but I don't think it's going to be a problem. Jeff packed his things and loaded his truck the following morning. He let it warm up in the parking lot while he went back in to collect his new roomatee. Connie looked at Forlorn as she watched the day shift report in and the night shift get ready to go. Neither truck on the overnight, neither Jeff's, nor the medic's, got a call after the fire standby so everyone had gotten a good night's sleep at least. Connie sat alone in the crew room when Jeff returned. Hey, you ready to go, Connie? Go? Where would I go, Jeff? My home's gone. My clothes are gone. My car might be gone too, for all I know. I've got plenty of room, Connie. You can stay with me for as long as you need to. I'll square it with my landlord. We'll check on your car later today after we get you something to eat and something to wear. Jeff, I... Hey, after Christmas, you already know my family likes you. Dad's always got a used car or two at the shop. He can sell you one if necessary. Bill will get you an emergency uniform issue when he gets in and bring it by my place. Your friends are going to help you out. And before you say anything, this isn't charity. Your friends are helping you to your feet. Come on, let's go get breakfast. 27th of February, 1993, Avocado Street, Springfield, Massachusetts. Jeff parked his truck at Connecticut River Valley Ambulance's headquarters and grabbed his coat and stethoscope. For an industrial area, CRVA's garage wasn't in too bad of a spot. Nestled at the end of a dead-end street and up against the Connecticut River, it was easy to forget where you were. The road noise from nearby Interstate 91 was the only hint you might be near civilization. Jeff inhaled a lungful of crisp winter air as he exited his truck. The air near CRVA's garage was clean today, owing to the southwest wind coming up the river. The winter sun tried its best to warm the air, but the mid-twenties temperature won that battle. However, the weak sun did at least keep the pavement clear. The crews wouldn't eat their dinners along the riverfront, as they did in the summer, though. Jeff entered through the employee entrance and stepped into the crew room. He checked the ambulance assignments to ensure he and Jean would use Ambulance 15 for their shift. Jean entered a minute later, and they traded their standard greetings and insults. They heard yelling coming from the front office while they punched in. Whoever yelled probably made the front office staff deaf. They walked towards the front of the building and heard aloud before they reached the office door. Jeff and Jean entered in time to see Don Ebersole stomping away from the building. The front door flapped open in the breeze, and its hydraulic closing arm hung twisted and useless from the frame. Bill Harris, Stu Masterson, and Connie Willis all scowled at the sight. Stu wore his street clothes, while Connie and Bill wore their uniforms. Bill sighed and waved everyone towards the crew room. People, may I have your attention, please? Bill called to the other crews. They looked at him curious. Dawn Ebersole is no longer employed at Connecticut River Valley Ambulance. Please do not allow her access to company property or vehicles as of this date. If she does show up here, please notify me, the on-duty supervisor, or the local police as necessary. Bill motioned the original group from the office out to the garage. Then, at the back of Ambulance 15, he explained what happened to Jean and Jeff in low tones. Guys, I rode third with Connie and Don today. Unfortunately, unlike the two of you, Don has not made the progress we like to see in new employees over the five months she's been here. Based on the reports I've gotten from Stu and Connie, she started to backslide. Watching her performance today, she appeared to me like a misplaced rookie. Her skills were marginal. Even worse, she showed little empathy for our patients. Back here in my office, we showed her the facts. We had stacks of signed preceptor reports, 
which Dawn countersigned, detailing her initial progress and then her regression. I wanted to offer her an extended probationary period until she started spewing invective. Invective? Jean asked before Jeff could. She called me a fucking dyke, Connie said with anger evident in her voice. We've worked together for five months and she knows that I'm gay, but she didn't say a word about it until just now. So she'd better not ever cross my path again. Her shifts will be open for a while. Our other trainees are already assigned other shifts. We don't have anyone else in the pipeline at the moment. So we won't get another surge of applications until the next batch of local EMT classes finishes, based on experience. They talked for a few more minutes until Stu needed to leave for his son's basketball game. Connie, does she know where you live? Jeff asked. I don't believe so, no. Just watch your surroundings back at the apartment. I wouldn't put anything past Dawn at this point. I'm glad you were home today, Jeff. I don't know what I would have done. You would have called my dad eventually, Jeff replied while the Valley Automotive flatbed pulled away with Connie's car. Sure, an hour from now when I stop freaking out, what did you say it might be? Hopefully just the transmission shift solenoids. Those control the flow of the transmission fluid and make the car shift. Dad'll have it figured out pretty quick, and fixing it shouldn't take more than a few hours if that's what it is. Shouldn't be too expensive, in that case either. Well, with Steve not charging me much in rent, I've been able to build up my savings. So as long as it's not the actual transmission, I'll be able to handle it. Steve knew you needed to get your feet back under you over the past two and a half months. Don't sweat it. Let's get back inside if we're going to keep chatting. It's too cold out here to be standing around this parking lot. Connie noticed the message light blinking on the answering machine when they entered the kitchen from the back deck. She pressed the button and the messages began to play. Connie, Jeff, it's Bill Harris. Call Carvier when you get this message. Connie, Jeff, it's Stu Masterson and it's about 10.30 on Wednesday morning. Call the office as soon as you get this. Guys, it's Bill again. Would you please call in as soon as you get this message? We were only outside for 30 minutes. I wonder what's so important, Connie asked as she dialed Carvier's number. Hey Paul, it's Connie Willis. We... Wow, whatever it is, I'm being transferred to Bill Harris already. Hey, Bill. It's Connie. Yeah, he's here with me. Why? Jeff saw Connie's face fall when she received the answer to her question. No! She wailed. Oh, no. Okay. We'll be there. Bye, Bill. What's the matter? Jeff, they coded Mr. Noak this morning. She replied while a tear tracked down her face. He's dead. There's a preliminary meeting about him at Sarvier at 2 p.m. The two roommates didn't get much accomplished around the apartment before they left for the meeting. A somber Connie and Jeff joined a silent crowd in the crew room at CRVA later that afternoon. The Noke family hadn't announced any arrangements yet, but the company came up with a plan to honor Mr. Noke at his funeral. Hey Jeff, Paul and Dispatch got a message for you from your dad. Neil Fournier informed him before he and Connie left an hour later. Thanks, Neil, Jeff replied as he read the note Neil handed him. Connie, your car's ready. We'll stop at my dad's garage on the way back to the apartment. Seems like you were right again, that it wasn't as bad as I thought. Hold off on your exuberance until dad hands you the bill. You're a real wet blanket, you know. I do what I can. Thirty minutes later, Joe Knox handed Connie an invoice for her car's repair. Mr. Knox, you only charged me for parts. What about the time you spent working on the car? Your labor costs? Joseph spent barely half an hour working on your car. Joseph was Jerry Gulbicki's son. A skilled mechanic, his work enhanced Valley Automotive's already stellar reputation. And you're what? Less than three months out from that fire? So let this be our way of helping you out a bit more. Okay, okay, Connie relented. But full price next time. You can't keep the lights on here if you keep giving away your time. With Jeff out of the house, we're still saving money on food. So I don't have to work as hard here. Jeff gave his father the finger. Your mother would wash your mouth out with soap if she saw that. For what? I didn't say anything. Go on, Git. Some of us have work to do. Jeff followed Connie back to Bilzerian's and saw no trouble with Connie's car on the way. 
She reported none after they parked their vehicles. Hey, did you check the mail before we left? She asked him. No, I thought you did, he answered before they walked to the street. There was a mail slot in the door to the front staircase. The lights from the common and the businesses lit the center of town while the daytime faded to night. Connie and Jeff collected their mail and walked up the stairs after securing the front door. Jeff pulled the shades down before turning on the lights there. It's been about a month since you told me you felt that someone was watching you. So why are you still pulling the shades and curtains before you turn on the lights? Part of it is a habit now, I suppose, Connie. Part of it's not wanting to give the enemy a chance to study our movements. Enemy? Sounds pretty paranoid, I know, but... Connie laughed at him. Jeff started making dinner, one of his specialties, spaghetti carbonara. I don't know how you can eat this stuff and keep your girlish figure, she said, while he plated the cheesy bacon and pea lace pasta 30 minutes later. I'll run an extra mile tomorrow, he quipped as he sat. Before tasting a single forkful of the meal, they heard a muffled from the back of the building. Wait! Jeff barked when Connie moved towards the door to the back deck. He darted into his bedroom and returned with the same shotgun and 45 he used to defend himself almost a year earlier. The hair on the back of my neck's been standing up since we came home. Kill the lights. Connie didn't question him and did as he asked. With the lights off, Jeff used a window over the driveway to check the back parking lot. He waved Connie into the living room area and turned off those lights. Jeff picked up the cordless phone. Enfield 911, this call is being recorded. What is your emergency? Mrs. Summersworth, it's Jeff Knox at Bilzerian's again. Jeff, more trouble at your place? Yes, ma'am. 223 Main Street, Bilzerian's parking lot for two cars on fire. My car? Connie cried. She tried to push past Jeff, but he forced her to the same window he looked out earlier. Jeff also blocked her path to the back door. Don't go out there, Connie. I don't like this. Jeff, are you still there? I'm here, Mrs. Summersworth. I was keeping my roommate from going out to our back deck. Something's wrong with this whole situation, and it's got me on edge. They refill propane tanks at Bilzerian's. Where are you parked in relation to their storage tank? Opposite side of the lot, ma'am. Our vehicles are well away from the propane. The burning vehicles are an 83 Chevy K10 pickup and an 83 Chevy Chevette hatchback. There's a hydrant just down the street in front of 219 Main. Jeff heard the first fire engine pull down the driveway. He listened to their radio call over the phone also. The fire department's here, Mrs. Summersworth, so I'll let you go. Ask the officers responding to check the door off the loading dock again, please. Will do, Jeff. Call back if you need something. Jeff hung up. Now Connie questioned him. Jeff, what's going on? Why won't you let me out there? Do you remember the car fire they had off Division Street in Springfield right after I started at CRVA last year? He asked in a hushed voice. Vaguely, why? She replied in the same quiet voice. A former boyfriend set his ex-girlfriend's car on fire and then stabbed her when she came out of her apartment to look. The lights on the deck are out. Someone is waiting for us outside, Connie. I can feel it. Okay, you're weirding me out now. Why didn't you say something earlier? I wasn't kidding earlier when you asked me why I always pull the shades after dark. I had a vague feeling, but I wasn't sure. So now, I don't want whoever is out there to know where we are, what we're doing, or that we're armed. You think somebody is waiting for us out there? Jeff could hear the fear creeping into Connie's voice. I wasn't sure until our cars caught fire, but now, absolutely. Anyone coming in here uninvited is getting a load of double-aught buck right in the chest, followed by a slug. If anything happens, I want you in your room with the deadbolt locked. Jeff installed a lock for Connie when she moved in, though she'd never used it. Now, Connie curled herself into a ball on the floor outside her room while Jeff stood guard over her. Five minutes later, Jeff heard yelling on the back deck. Male voices barked commands over and over for about 30 seconds, then silence. A minute after that, someone knocked on the back door. Jeff, it's Jack, a welcome voice called. The lights on the deck were still out, even though the switch for them was on. So Jack Dwachik, 
lit his face with his flashlight so Jeff could see him. Jeff unlocked and opened the door. We have to stop meeting like this, he said. Yeah, when you invite me over, why are there always intruders and firearms involved? Jack asked, pointing to the shotgun Jeff held at a low ready position and the 45 in his waistband. Where's that dyke bitch, Jeff? A loud, coarse voice shouted. I'm gonna kill her. I'm the one who's interested in you. I'm the one who's interested in men. Mac Jeff pointed his flashlight in the direction of the voice. The beam lit the snarling face of a woman he hoped he'd never see again. An aluminum softball bat lay next to her. Don Ebersole, he sighed. You know who this woman is? Don Ebersole. She used to work for the same ambulance company in Springfield that Connie and I do. Unfortunately, she was fired about two months ago. It was that bitch in there who got me fired. I'm gonna kill her. Come out here, bitch. I'm gonna give you what you've got coming to you. Pete, did we Mirandize her? Jack asked one of the officers holding her down. Sure did, Sarge, as soon as we took her down. Spontaneous utterance, then. You two get her out of here. The two other officers wrestled the small, angry woman down the stairs. Can I come in, Jeff? Jeff opened the screen door, and his old friend stepped in. Jeff turned the kitchen lights on. Connie no longer sat on the floor, and her room's door was closed. Jeff ran through the sequence of the day's events for Jack. Jack asked him a few questions for clarification, then asked Jeff to sign a statement. Jeff quickly agreed and inquired about a restraining order against Dawn. And I'm sure Steve Bilzerian will ask for at least a criminal trespass warning against her as well, Jack. He's got it as soon as he asks. It's a good thing that you parked your vehicles across the lot from that propane tank. I hate to think about what could have happened if the fire had been next to it. An explosion from a tank that size could have leveled the whole business district. Do you need to speak to Connie? I do, yes. Jeff knocked on Connie's door, but there was no answer. Then finally, a sheet of paper with a signed statement slid its way out from under the door. This is good enough for tonight, Jeff. I'll be in touch if we need more. It's clear to me that woman intended to ambush you and your roommate tonight. There are signs that she forced the door downstairs. She unscrewed the light bulbs over the deck, and she was lying in wait for the two of you. I think you threw off her plans when you used the front door. She lit your cars on fire and planned to attack when you came out to the fire. I'm glad you had a hunch on this. I'd rather not investigate a double homicide, especially the deaths of people I know. Jeff shook his head. Unreal. All right, thanks, Jack. Keep in touch. You think they'll keep her locked up for a while? No bail is a guarantee on this, and so's your request for an emergency restraining order. You'll have to go to court in Northampton to have that extended past 48 hours. She's going to buy a 30-day evaluation committal at Bridgewater, at least. Bridgewater State Hospital is where the Commonwealth sends defendants who need mental health evaluations before trial. Odds are you'll never have to see her again if you're lucky. Jeff thanked Jack and showed him out the back door. The deck would remain off limits until the police processed the crime scene, possibly into tomorrow morning, so Connie and Jeff would have to enter and exit via the front stairs. After locking up, Jeff made another attempt to talk with Connie to no avail. He'd have to borrow a car from his dad to get to work tomorrow. A phone call to his parents' house confirmed a couple he could borrow at his father's garage. Joe would pick Jeff up an hour before his scheduled shift for the drive to the garage. Jeff unloaded the shotgun. He put it and the shells back into the gun safe. The loaded 45 went under his pillow. The following day, Jeff found Connie's door still closed. CRVA hadn't called looking for her after 6 a.m., so Jeff guessed she called out for her shift. Jeff dressed and walked to the Valley Credit Union branch, where he did his banking. The manager assured Jeff could get a cashier's check for a new vehicle whenever Jeff needed it. The manager also told him he'd deliver it personally anywhere in the valley to facilitate the process. There was plenty of money in Jeff's account to cover a new vehicle. Jeff walked back to Bill Zarian's to talk with Steve. The car fire blackened the spot where he and Connie had parked, but repair costs would be minimal since the lot was cinders and not pavement. Left unsaid was any concern Steve might have over Jeff's second violent incident in two years. Jeff returned to the apartment to find Connie's door still closed. 
He sighed and went about preparing for his shift. Jeff prepared his uniform, packed a dinner, then ate his lunch. After lunch, he shaved, showered, and changed. Finally, he waited for his father on the store's loading dock. At CRVA, Jeff learned he was correct about that morning. Connie called out for her scheduled shift the night before, citing the need to secure another vehicle. Jeff's shift with Gene was unremarkable. All transfers and no responses. Mr. Noakes' wake would be the following evening in Springfield. The funeral would be Friday morning. Gene, Stu, and Jeff planned to wear uniforms of their respective armed services to both. CRVA staff, who weren't veterans, would wear their work uniforms with ties, work jackets, and white gloves. When Jeff returned home at midnight, Connie's door stood open, but her belongings were gone. An envelope with his name sat on the coffee table in the living room. With it was her apartment and room keys. The envelope held a thank you card and a check. Dear Jeff, I'm sorry to do this to you, Jeff, but I have to go. 1993 is shaping up to be a horrific year for me, and I need to start over somewhere else. I'm leaving the state. I'm hoping that I can start over in another place. Trying to start over here hasn't been good for me. I don't know if I can ever forget the hateful words my family said to me five years ago or the hateful words that woman said last night. Her words cut through the brave front I put on after CRVA fired her. That's all it ever was, a front. Her words then, as well as last night, scared me in reality. They'll haunt me for years, that I know. I'll never forget though how you made me laugh during the first moment we met. How you were my friend regardless of who I was. How you took me in without hesitation or how you were ready to protect me last night. I know you would have given your life to keep me safe, so please don't ever think that I'm not grateful for that. Would you please thank everyone at CRVA, Mr. Bilzerian, and most importantly, your family for their kindness through the years. Please also tell them I'm sorry I slipped away like a thief in the night. If I ever have children, I hope they grow up to be as fiercely loyal to their friends as you are. If our paths ever cross again, Please don't hate me too much. Auf Wiedersehen, my friend, Connie. Jeff stared blankly at the card in his hands. He didn't hate many people, and Connie Willis would never be on that list. Don Ebersole, however, was now firmly on that list, along with Connie's family. He'd better never run into either because the results wouldn't be pretty. Connie included a cashier's check with the card made out to Steve Bilzerian for $1,500. The check was to make up for the rent Connie felt she owed him. Jeff knew Steve wouldn't take it, but that he would donate it to an appropriate charity in Connie's name. Vaya con Dios, mi amiga, Jeff whispered. She's gone? Stu asked the following evening. Jeff nodded and handed over a copy of the card. Stu and Jean read it while they waited in line at Mr. Noak's wake. They stood between the veterans and the rest of CRVA's staff, since they were both. Jeff indicated Stu and Jean should pass Connie's note down the line of Carve employees when they tried to hand it back. Jeff already gave Bill Harris a copy. Where is she? In the wind, Stu, in the wind. In the note, she didn't say where she was headed, and Enfield PD tells me her license plate is listed as canceled, plate not returned. There's no other vehicle listed in her name in the registry database. My guess is she hopped a bus or train going somewhere. We won't have any way to track Connie unless she gets in legal trouble. Man, now I really hate that crazy bitch, Stu said, meaning Dawn. She's the one who torched your cars, and she was waiting outside your apartment with a bat the other night? Yep, she was arraigned today and shipped off to Bridgewater State for evaluation. It won't take them the whole 30 days to figure out she's nuts. It's my guess she's a lock for not guilty by reason of insanity. So Don will be at Bridgewater for a long time. The following Monday morning, Bill Harris held another company-wide meeting in the crew room at CRVA. As you all know, CRVA is a privately owned business. Mr. Dupuy has owned this company for the past 15 years. Many of you have been here since he bought it. A few of you were here even before that. However, there are no Dupuy children to continue family ownership so Mr. Dupuy has agreed to sell Car V to Westover Regional EMS. Over the next three months, the two companies' operations will merge, 
The name of the combined company will continue as Westover Regional EMS. Stunned silence settled over the staff. In contrast to the name, Westover Regional wasn't based anywhere near the Air Force Base. Instead, their base was in Westfield, Massachusetts, on the opposite side of Springfield and the Connecticut River. Moreover, REMS didn't have a stellar reputation for taking care of its employees. CRVA was one of the best around in that regard. Some of you may not be aware, but we are not employees of Connecticut River Valley Ambulance, Inc. We are employees of Hampshire Staffing, which leases our services to CRVA. What does that mean for us? It means that we will be required to apply for jobs with REMS and interview with them. Anyone ultimately hired by Westover Regional will have their length of service at CRVA transfer to REMS, credited at 50% for seniority purposes. If the part about reapplying for jobs they already held generated rumblings in the room, the seniority news created an uproar. REMS would treat employees with 20 years of service as 10-year employees. They knew they would be reminded of their loss of seniority by their new peers. The application process will begin in approximately two weeks. Are there any questions? The room erupted. Everyone began talking at once, but Jeff ignored it all. Mr. Noakes' death was an open wound for him, exacerbated by Connie's flight. Mr. Noakes' wake and funeral left that wound raw and weeping. Today's news was salt rubbed into it by sandpaper. Jeff worried more was around the corner. Later that week, Jeff's concerns proved justified. Jeff, I'm going to be moving in with Nancy and her family in Deerfield, Mrs. Noak informed him on the way home from dialysis Saturday night. Nancy was the oldest Noak daughter. Gone was Trudy's cheerful, playful banter of the past year. Gone, too, were her attempts to help him learn German. Instead, the conversation was bland and businesslike. Jeff closed his eyes. The fabric of his stable life was fraying at an alarming rate. When, ma'am? A month or so. Nancy's home has an in-law apartment attached and I'll be moving into it. I'm changing my dialysis treatments to a center up there. Deerfield wasn't too far in the scheme of things, only 30 or so miles up Interstate 91 from Springfield. Will we still be picking you up, ma'am? Trudy Noak looked away. I take it that's a no? She shook her head. The ambulance service the center contracts with has an office in Deerfield. We'll use them once I move there. Well, Shisa. The brakes just didn't go our way this season, John. Jeff remarked when Amherst High School eliminated them from their conference's baseball playoff race. Unfortunately, the 1992-93 hockey season hadn't been very successful for Tompkins this winter either. Both teams were young and showed promise, however. No, they didn't, John sighed. We'll get them next year. There won't be a next year, Jeff, not here, at least not for me. John, Jeff asked, his voice full of concern. Hmm? John hummed in reply, turning to his assistant coach. Oh, not that, Jeff. Health-wise, I'm fine, other than the kids giving Carrie and me gray hair. John's kids were in their early teens. No, I meant that I won't be returning to Tompkins next year. Not returning? What are you going to do, John? You've been here a dozen years. Man, I I've been offered the athletic director's position at a private school up in Vermont, just over the line from Greenfield. They've got a solid hockey program there that needs a coach as well, so they're going to let me wear both hats. They have a good baseball coach already. So endeth my coaching career, Jeff muttered. Only if you want to end. You're good, Jeff. I can easily see you coaching in the future. Thanks, John, but I'm enjoying being an EMT, and I'm starting to consider becoming a paramedic. Maybe once I go to paramedic school, have kids and settle down... I'll coach again, but until then, I won't have the time to devote to coaching that the kids would deserve. Have you told the teams? <laughs> I'll have to before the school year ends. I wouldn't want them to find out after the summer when I'm suddenly not here. Jeff walked down the front stairs to answer the doorbell one early afternoon in mid-May. He looked through the peephole in the front door before opening it. Jack Dwachik and Owen Bud Ozelink, Enfield's fire chief, stood on the sidewalk. Jeff invited the men inside and offered them something to drink. They accepted water since they were both on duty. Mr. Knox, while I don't know you, I've known your father for many years. 
Jack tells me the apple doesn't fall far from the tree with you. Thank you, Chief, but I'm afraid I still don't understand why you're here. The fire chief handed Jeff an envelope, which bore the logo of Westover Regional EMS. The letter inside, written by Rems's general manager, stated that departments should not now nor ever hire one Jeffrey Knox. In addition, the letter detailed Jeff's abuse of an unnamed female, which led to her breakdown and admission to an unspecified mental hospital. Mr. Knox, when I opened that letter, I was stunned. As I said, I know your father, and I've heard kids talk about how willing you were to show them your ambulance on the common last year. I've also talked to Jack here. Fortunately, this letter does not describe the person I'm sitting across from. I checked with the surrounding departments, and they all received the same letter. Jeff couldn't speak. It took all of his composure not to crumple the letter and envelope in his hands into a tight ball. Instead, he closed his eyes and began counting to 100. Jeff, Jack said, Bud and I had the town clerk certify receipt of that letter and notarize five copies for you. We brought those copies, 10 unnotarized copies, and every document we could find that refutes the allegations in that letter. Jack handed Jeff a packet containing copies of the letter Jack mentioned and a notarized sworn statement from the town clerk detailing the time and date Enfield received the letter from Rems. The packet also held a copy of the police report from the night Don Ebersole set Jeff's truck on fire and a copy of the official information from the state fire marshal's office about the fire. Jeff held the documents in his hands as he finished counting to 100. Gentlemen, thank you for these documents. I have one question for you. What is it, Jeff? Jeff smiled. It was not a friendly smile. Do you know any good lawyers? Rems accepted Jeff's application, which surprised him. He would report to the Rems office on the Thursday before Memorial Day for his interview. Jeff and two other gentlemen walked into Rems's office five minutes before the appointed time on the specified date. Thirty minutes after the scheduled appointment was supposed to start, a secretary ushered Jeff into the general manager's office for his interview. The manager didn't rise from his desk, nor did he shake Jeff's hand when Jeff offered it to him. He didn't offer Jeff a seat either. This won't take long, Knox, the man said. He held up Jeff's application for employment and dropped it into the trash can next to his desk. It'll be a cold day in hell before you work here. It'll be a cold day in hell before you work in EMS anywhere in this state. If I have my way, you'll never work EMS anywhere in New England ever again. Your harassment of and baseless allegations against my cousin caused her so much pain and anguish she had to check herself into a mental hospital for treatment. Get out of here and don't ever show your face around me again. Jeff didn't say a word before he spun on his heel. Instead, he walked to the office door he left open but didn't step through. Gentlemen, would you join us, please? The two men who accompanied Jeff rose from their seats in the lobby. They stepped into the general manager's office over the protests of his secretary. Jeff nodded to one of the men. Mr. Ebersole, my name is Harry Ouellette. I am Mr. Knox's lawyer. Your cousin is a criminal and a liar. Harry lifted a leather briefcase onto Sean Ebersole's desk with a solid and pushed Ebersole's nameplate and desk set out of the way. Harry snapped open the brass latches, opened the briefcase, and extracted a bundle of documents. He threw the blue-bound stack onto the desk in front of Ebersole. That is a cease and desist order from the court of Hamden County, barring you from mailing any further libelous correspondence or uttering further slanderous statements, defaming my client. Harry threw another stack at him. That is a certified copy of an incident report from the Enfield Police Department detailing how Wani Down Ebersole illegally trespassed onto private property. She then broke into a secured area on that property, destroyed other privately owned property legally located there, and intended to assault my client to cause bodily harm to him and one other person. More paper flew. A certified copy of a state fire marshal's office report that states that a fire on that property that same night was intentionally set. Forensic examination of the clothes your cousin wore that night indicates she set that fire. At her arraignment, your cousin's spontaneous utterance of I'm gonna kill her was introduced as evidence of intent against her. 
It was admissible because Enfield police had already read her rights to her when she made those statements. Your cousin didn't check herself into a mental health facility. She was remanded there on a court-ordered evaluation. That evaluation determined she was competent to stand trial. Your cousin entered pleas of guilty on multiple counts in Hampshire County District Court yesterday, and the court will sentence her in two weeks. Your cousin is headed for a long stretch at the women's prison in Framingham. Harry nodded to the other gentleman with them. That gentleman stepped forward. The six-pointed star of the Hamden County Sheriff's Department hung from his coat's breast pocket. The deputy produced a large manila envelope. Sean Ebersole, you've been served. The envelope hit the desk with a resounding... Harry spoke again. My client has authorized a civil suit against Westover Regional Emergency Medical Services, and you personally for defamation of character, lost wages, and mental anguish. Have a nice day. The three men trapped out of the office, leaving a stunned Sean Ebersole in their wake. News of Jeff's confrontation with Sean Ebersole spread around both CRVA and REMS. The door between the reception area and Ebersole's office remained open during the event, and two CRVA employees waiting for interviews heard every word. UREMS reeled when CRVA employees began rescinding their applications. UREMS employees fed up with how their company treated them resigned as well. Several smaller EMS agencies around Springfield experienced considerable surges in employment applications. Jeff's employment at CRVA ended on Saturday, June 5, 1993. The date corresponded with Trudy Noak's final dialysis treatment in Springfield before moving to her daughter's house in Deerfield. Dispatch assigned Jean and Jeff to transport her home following her treatment. The staff at Riverside Hospital's outpatient dialysis unit gave Trudy a big send-off. She was a favorite patient there, too. As Ambulance 15 left the hospital, Trudy noticed a long line of vehicles following the ambulance through traffic. The ambulance's red lights weren't on, so this wasn't illegal. Why are those cars and ambulances following us, Jeff? They're coming to say goodbye. Trudy Noak sat silently in disbelief. Jean and Jeff unloaded her from the ambulance in her driveway as a host of CRVA employees drifted over from the street. Even more employees showed up than had last Christmas, when everyone had the chance to say goodbye to the company's favorite patient. Jean and Jeff escorted her to her front door. Nancy Noki stood there to help her mother inside. Nancy was in awe of the CRVA employees silently standing vigil in the driveway. Trudy turned to Jean and Jeff with tears in her eyes. Auf Wiedersehen, mein Eugen and mein Gottfried. Alles Gute, all the best. Jeff answered for both of them. Auf Wiedersehen, Frau Noka, alles Gute. There wasn't much to clean out of his locker at CRVA, just a spare uniform. So Jeff left it hanging in there. He'd drop the rest of his uniforms off tomorrow anyway. You've got our address? Jean asked him as they walked out to the parking lot together. Yeah, you've got my parents? Jean nodded. What are you going to do now? I heard you were one of the people who pulled their application. Yeah, Jean would have killed me if I went to work for those crooks at REMS. Jean snorted. Western General's adding a BLS division to their EMS department. I'm going there. The hospital's got good benefits. If I want, they'll send me to paramedic school too once I have five years of EMS experience and after I've been with them too. And you can move up to their paramedic units with your seniority intact. Good deal. Jeff held out his hand. Good luck, Marine. Take care of those ladies of yours. I'll see you down the road. Jeff loaded the last of his things into the bed of his new pickup. He noted again that he needed an army-related sticker on the back somewhere. You don't have to go, Jeff, Steve Bilzerian said as Jeff closed the truck's tailgate. Yeah, I do, Steve. Plus, you can have Charlie move out of the dorms and into the apartment upstairs, where you can keep an eye on him. God only knows what kind of trouble he's getting himself into over at UMass. Jeff was kidding. A very proud Steve told him that Charlie made Dean's list both semesters of his freshman year. At least let me pay you for the furniture you're leaving behind. Jeff shook his head. You can rent the place out as a furnished apartment. I don't know where I'm going to land yet, and I don't have a place to store all of that stuff. Plus, 
You haven't charged me a dollar in rent since I moved in two years ago, so we'll call it an even trade. How's that civil suit going? Slowly, it's civil, not criminal, so it's on a slower schedule. That company will likely be out of business before it even goes to trial. People are leaving so fast they can't keep trucks on the road. People aren't applying because the word's gotten around about what they tried to do to me. I'll be surprised if I can find the general manager at that point. We named him in the suit individually, too. It'd be nice to squeeze that bastard. Is he why you feel like you have to leave? I want to keep being an EMT or paramedic, but I don't want to be a firefighter to do it. No offense to them. It's the medicine that interests me, not the firefighting aspects. If I want to keep doing only the medicine, I about have to leave, despite how hard Chief Ozalink and Jack Dwachik are working to clear my name. Rems poisoned the well for me. It would be an uphill battle. Hopefully, ambulance services near Boston aren't going to care about a letter from a small service in Western Mass. What did they do? Send a letter to every EMS company in the state? Anyone with an ambulance service license that includes private and municipal services. They were getting ready to mail services in other states at his direction, too. So back to your parents' place? Only for a little while. I need to clear my heat so I think I might go on vacation. At June 1993, Wood End, Provincetown, Massachusetts. This is what I needed. Jeff sat in the sand on Provincetown's isolated, sandy southernmost point. Jeff made his trek to Wood End via breakwater walk, a path across a rock dike at the west end of Provincetown Harbor. Jeff made a game of his earlier trip across the structure, hopping from rock to rock like a billy goat as quickly and safely as he was able. Jeff's reward for the journey was the private, calming vista in front of him. He sat in the sand at the edge of the dunes, trying to figure out the next move in his life. He gazed west, out over the waters of Massachusetts Bay towards Plymouth, as he reclined against his day pack. Jeff wondered if he was as hopeful for a new start as the Pilgrims. He hadn't known they landed at Provincetown first in 1620 before continuing to Plymouth. Jeff understood why people liked to sit by the water so much. The light winds produced a soft lapping sound as the water came ashore. Jeff checked into an inexpensive motel in the neighboring town of Truro two nights ago. It was as affordable as one could get for the area during the height of the summer season. At least it was clean. The drive from Enfield should have taken Jeff four to five hours. The only highway to the end of Cape Cod, US Route 6, alternated back and forth from four to two lanes. It produced impressive traffic from the Cape's elbow to its fist every weekend during the summer. Jeff's drive took over seven hours. Jeff spent yesterday exploring Provincetown, but he only scratched the surface in walking Commercial Street, the main road in town. Homes lined the two outer ends of the street. The downtown area was a riot of restaurants, galleries, shops, and performance venues. The people walking that street ran the gamut. Old, young, gay, straight, couples, groups of friends, or, like him, single explorers. Infinite diversity displayed in infinite combinations. Jeff heard laughter behind him, snapping him from his daydreams. A pair of women ran down the beach toward him. They stopped in front of him and began to make out. Jeff was sure they didn't know he was there. He was all but hidden from view by beach grass in front of him. Jeff cleared his throat to get their attention, and one of the women screamed. Sorry, ladies. He apologized as he stood, his palms out in a calming manner. The women retreated a step. I didn't mean to startle you, but I didn't want to see me and think I was being a perv either. The taller of the two studied him closely before retaking a small step toward him. Jeff, Jeff Knox, she exclaimed with a smile. Jeff stared at the woman who knew his name. Her hair was shorter and her skin tanner than Jeff remembered, but he soon recognized her. Charlene Flaherty, how have you been, Charlie? Charlie bounded over and hugged him tightly. The feel of a woman in his arms always made him feel better. Jeff, you look great, Charlie said. Have you gotten bigger? She asked, squeezing his bicep. Only my ego, Charlie, he joked. Only my ego. And you look great. Your hair looks terrific, short like that. Charlie ran a hand through her short black hair and smiled wider. Ego? You mean you finally found one? They shared laughter. Hey, Emily, she called to her friend. 
Come on over and meet Jeff. The blonde woman hesitated before walking over and wrapping her arm around Charlie's waist. Jeff, this is Emily Davril, my partner. Emily, this is Jeff Knox. Jeff was a year ahead of me in high school, and I was in the same class as his younger sister. It's nice to meet you, Jeff, Emily offered. Jeff caught the French-Canadian accent in Emily's voice. However, he also saw the distrust in her eyes. Enchanté, mademoiselle, he replied, drawing a smile and nod from Emily. The smile didn't reach those eyes, however. How is Kara? Charlie asked. Jeff's gaze shifted back to Charlie. Kara's good, thanks. She's working for a graphic design firm in Springfield and dating a former co-worker of mine. What brings you out here to the province lands? <laughs> Jeff blew out a breath and looked across the water again. Still running from my problems, Charlie. Still trying to figure stuff out. Charlie raised an eyebrow at him. Jeff waved at his towel as an invitation for the women to sit. They sat. He dropped to the sand facing them. I left the army after four years in mid-91 and moved home. I moved into the apartment above Bilzerian's hardware instead of back into my parents' house. While I got my EMT certification that fall, I did some assistant coaching for Coach Kessler back at Tompkins. We won a state championship in hockey and made it to districts in baseball last year. We didn't do as well this year, though. I began work as an EMT last Memorial Day, and I'd been at an ambulance service out of Springfield since then, but I just left that job. Now I'm here trying to clear my head and decide on my next move. There's a situation back there I'm trying to get away from. What kind of situation? A former co-worker went off the deep end. Just for fun, she dragged some of my friends and me along for the ride. Then my company merged with another ambulance company. Unfortunately, the co-worker's cousin manages the other company, which is now in the driver's seat. The manager blamed me for his cousin going off the deep end. He also mailed a letter to every ambulance service in Massachusetts, blacklisting me, telling people not to hire me. Can he do that? Our assertion is no, not without consequence, but he did mail the letters. Our? My lawyer and I. We filed a defamation suit against the manager and the ambulance company both jointly and severally, as the lawyers like to put it. We're suing the manager personally for his actions as an individual. We're also suing the company because the manager acted on their behalf. Many of my co-workers decided they didn't want to work for them after that too. Well, I hope you have their balls for breakfast, Charlie said. Jeff winced at the phrase. Jeff. You didn't react at all when I told you Emily was my partner. I usually see some sort of reaction from people, especially people I know, but it was like I'd just told a stone from the reaction I didn't see from you. Charlie, I realized after I left Tompkins that life is way too short to worry about who is doing what with whom, especially when it doesn't affect me. When my best friend died in the Gulf War, it underscored that point for me. Life is too short. Like Wheezy, a friend at my ambulance company lost everything when her apartment building burned back in January. I didn't care that she was gay when I offered her a spare bedroom at my apartment. All I cared about was that she was my friend and she needed help. Are you? Gay. Not even a little, Charlie. That first summer I was home, Allison Newbury and I lived together for two months, sharing the same bed. I'm still as straight as I was in high school. I've heard about Provincetown and its beauty all my life, but I've never been out here, that's all. Your friend from work? She wasn't the co-worker who went off the deep end, was she? No, Jeff sighed. He looked away across the water again. She's one of the friends who got sucked into the drama surrounding that other one. She was the lightning rod for the crazy girl. What happened? The crazy girl was fixated on me for some reason. I couldn't stand her. Something turned me off right away. I can't prove it, but I believe she broke into the ambulance company's personnel office to get my address. I started feeling like someone was watching me not too long after that. I found footprints outside my bedroom window soon after, and I lived on the second floor. Then, before Connie moved in, things seemed to settle down. I was on a much different schedule than Dawn, the crazy girl, so I hardly saw her. I think that may have lessened her interest in me somewhat. A month after Connie moved in, Dawn got fired. She wasn't doing her job very well. 
and they hoped to offer her a longer training time at an evaluation meeting. But Dawn verbally attacked my friend Connie during that meeting, so they shit-canned her. Then, a month after that, Dawn torched our cars in the parking lot at Bilzerian's, trying to lure us outside so she could attack Connie and me with a softball bat. Dawn's going to be serving 20 to 30 years at Framingham, after pleading guilty to all the charges from that night. She drove Connie away because of that night. Connie heard the hate Dawn spewed when the cops arrested Dawn, and it scared her. So while I was at work the next day, Connie packed her things and left. She left to escape the hate someone held for who she was. I don't know where Connie is, I don't know if my friend has landed somewhere yet, or if she's even alright. Connie leaving is just one part of my comfortable life in Enfield coming apart at the seams, but it's certainly the most painful. <laughs> Je m'excuse, ma chère, but we need to go so that you can get ready for practice, Emily broke in. Practice? Jeff asked. I'm in a band. I sing and play guitar, Charlie answered. I remember your singing now, Jeff said. You had a great voice back in Enfield, and I'm sure it's only gotten better. I like to think so, Charlie smiled. Jeff, you should come to the practice, yes? Emily asked. Jeff saw something different in her eyes now. Acceptance. Charlie nodded. Yes! Please come, she pleaded. I think you'll enjoy it. He looked from Charlie back to Emily. She gave him a genuine smile and a nod. How can I refuse an invitation from two such lovely ladies? I won't be bringing unwanted testosterone to the scene, will I? Both women laughed, shaking their heads. No, Jeff, Charlie said. It won't be a problem. What time does your practice start? I'll need to run back to the motel in Truro to clean up first. How long are you here for and where's your car now? I'm here until Friday. I couldn't get a room for next week without paying much more than I wanted to. I lucked out with the parking today, though. I found a spot back at the Rotary by Pilgrim's First Landing Park before walking across the breakwater. Charlie looked at Emily and received a smile and nod. Jeff, check out of your hotel and come to our condo. She gave him the address. We've got two parking spots and a guest room, and you'll have plenty of time to get over to our place and get washed up before I need to be at practice. We have to get going now because we were supposed to bring a fruit salad to practice, and it's still not made. What, are you both sure? Jeff, I know you, Charlie said. I know the kind of person you are. I doubt that's changed in the three years since we've seen each other. I can tell that Emily already feels comfortable around you which isn't the norm for her when strange men are involved. And we both know I'm strange, Jeff laughed. Emily did as well while Charlie rolled her eyes. Jeff, you should be comfortable here, Emily said while she showed him the second bedroom. Merci, Emily. Durian, Jeff, she smiled. Charlie, she tell me more about you on the walk back here, how you were in school. And you're still letting me stay? He asked in shock. Jeff wore a smile on his face when he asked. Emily laughed again. The women, they must like you. It is easy to laugh with you. Shrugging, Jeff said, I try to be friends with people. If that evolves into something else with women... He shrugged again. If it doesn't, then I have a new friend. That is an excellent approach. I am finding that I already like you, Jeff. What you told Charlie, it broke my heart and showed me who you are. That is why I agreed with Charlie to offer you a place to stay even though we had just met. There was an incident with a man back in Quebec, and I left Canada because of it. So I moved to Boston and met Charlie there. I do not feel comfortable with men very often, but with you, I am instantly at ease. I'm sorry you had that experience, but I'm glad you're here to make Charlie happy. She was happy enough at school, but she glows now. I'm sure that's because of you. Emily shocked them both when she gave him a kiss of thanks on the cheek. Jeff laughed when he met the rest of Charlie's band. I can see why I wasn't bringing unwanted testosterone to the scene, Charlie. You've already got plenty here. Everyone else in the band was male. Oh, did I forget to mention that part? That Emily and I are the token estrogen in the mix? Charlie, did you bring treats? The drummer asked. Simmer down, Randy, Randy, sorry to disappoint you, but I believe Jeff plays for the other team. Hmm, pity. Randy looked Jeff up and down. Any chance you're a switch hitter? No, sir, not a one, 
Jeff answered. Randy frowned. You, Charlene Flaherty, are cruel, he grumbled while pointing his drumsticks at Charlie. What is this? The carrot and the stick? You dangle this morsel in front of us to get us to play better, and then you hit us with a switch if we don't. And when have I ever done that, Randy? Come on, Randy, let it go, the keyboard player said. Hi, I'm Paul Aspinall. How do you know Charlie and Emily? Jeff Knox. Charlie went to high school with my sister, and I graduated the year before them. I just met Emily today. Good to meet you. The rest of the band introduced themselves. Let's play some music, folks, Paul said. The band ran through their set list over the next three hours. They were a rock cover band, though they strayed off course into other genres a few times. They played pretty clean, only having to back up a couple of times to rework something. Emily introduced the band's significant others, who also came to the practice. It was a social event for the ones not playing. They're outstanding. How often do they get together? Jeff asked Emily while they watched and listened. We all live north of Boston, so they practice almost every weekend. The band went to school together and formed their freshman year. Except for the original keyboard player, they stayed in the area when they graduated. Paul also plays guitar but switched to keyboards full-time last year. We coordinate our vacations to take two weeks at this time of year so that they can perform during the weeks around July 4th. We drive down every other weekend during the summer too. They've got a loyal following down here that they built over the last five years. They've been playing down here that long? The first summer was during an open mic night with borrowed instruments. The club's manager booked them for a few dates at the end of that summer and then encouraged them to return the following year. Playing gigs helps offset the rents and mortgages down here. You know, I don't think I've asked what the name of the band is. Emily laughed, shaking her head. You ready? They're called Charlie Flair and the Queens. Jeff started laughing. An image popped into his head and he began to laugh harder. Finally, he fell out of his chair. All right, Knox. What's so funny? Charlie asked from the back of the garage. I just had an image of you in a dark suit, singing Addicted to Love by Robert Palmer, while the guys danced behind you in those short black dresses with red lipstick on their lips. Randy started snickering. Jace, the rhythm guitarist, laughed. The bass player, Franz, asked, Do you think we can get the dresses and a suit by Saturday's show? Can we learn the song by Saturday? Charlie asked. The rest of the band immediately began playing the song. All that was missing were Charlie's guitar part and the vocals. All right, all right, so the question is, can I learn the song by Saturday? Thanks, no pressure. Jeff drummed his fingers on the table in time with the music. The band was 45 minutes into their set and played Sultans of Swing by Dire Straits. The difference between the timbre of Charlie's voice and Mark Knopfler's was noticeable, but it worked. The acoustic version of Ozzy's Crazy Train they played next did too. Every song they played so far set his foot to tapping harder than the last. They played Addicted to Love, but the band had decided to wait on the dresses. Man, Charlie was good in school and the practice sounded great, but this is amazing. This is how we met, Emily said as she nodded in agreement. They were playing a show in Cambridge one night. I went up to Charlie and complimented her after they finished their show and were packing up. She invited me out for coffee, and we've seen each other ever since. We've been sharing a place in Malden for three years. We bought the condo here together last year. I've been thinking a lot about heading to the Boston area and working there since things started falling apart. Are rents as bad as I've heard? Sadly, yes. Probably worse than you've heard. <laughs> I don't want to spend my savings on rent, but I can't stay in Enfield. So what do you and Charlie do for work? Charlie is a nurse at a hospital near Boston. I'm a copy editor at a publishing house outside the city, so Malden is very convenient for both of us. Where is Malden in relation to Boston? Just northwest, only a few miles away, but the traffic makes it seem farther at rush hour. Jeff? Your shirt? What does this school of hard knocks mean? I joined the army right after high school, he explained. My unit had a few hard knocks during the invasion of Panama in 1989. We lost five of our comrades. That's what the five stars on the front and back symbolize, the friends our battalion lost. The reason the shirt gives the location of the school is Panama City, 
Panama is because that's where my unit fought during the invasion. And the 504X1 on the back? What does that mean? 1st Battalion, 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, my unit. The X is a pair of crossed rifles, the infantry symbol here in America. My regiment is part of the 82nd Airborne Division. The pair enjoyed the music for a few minutes more until the band took their first break. You guys were terrific yesterday, but tonight is beyond description, Jeff exclaimed when the band came over to their tables to sit. Emily says you're a nurse too, Charlie. You're a nightingale in more than one sense of the word, that's for sure. Charlie beamed at the praise. The new friends chatted for about 15 minutes until the band retook the stage. Their first song after the break was Stairway to Heaven. Emily, this was always the last song at school dances when Charlie and I were at Tompkins. It's one of my favorites. May I ask you to dance? Emily hesitated before nodding yes. She rose when Jeff offered her his hand. He led her to the dance floor, half filled with couples of his approximate age. There, Jeff guided her into a dance hold and swayed in time to the music. Emily relaxed as the song continued when Jeff did nothing but hold her. She scolded herself for thinking Jeff might be like the other men who caused Emily trouble. An unwelcome voice interrupted Emily's feeling of peace. If you're going to try the other side of the street, Emily, you should come with me. Jeff and Emily both turned to the voice and saw a large man in a too tight shirt and shorts smirking at them. No, thank you, Richard. Emily responded in an unfriendly voice. Jeff sensed her unease and moved to shield her from the man. Oh, come on, the man persisted. You know you want to. Go away, please. Emily's tone turned into a pleading one. Richard snorted and reached for her. He never touched her. Jeff swatted Richard's arm away and followed up with a strike to the solar plexus. Richard's breath exploded from his lungs when the heel of Jeff's hand connected. Hey, Dick, the lady said no, Jeff explained to the man who now knelt on the floor. Richard caught his breath and launched a meaty fist at Jeff's face. Jeff stepped outside the punch, then grabbed Richard's forearm and twisted. Richard's elbow tried to bend in a direction it wasn't meant to, and the pain forced Richard to the floor. Jeff pressed his knee between Richard's shoulder blades. There's always one, Jeff sighed into the deafening silence. Jeff expected a bouncer or the man's friends to grab him, but no one interrupted. So instead, Jeff used the opportunity to hold an impromptu class. Hey, Dick, he asked, slapping the man's face. That's what's known as a bad move. You caused my friend fear, so that's assault in this fine commonwealth. The pain you're feeling is known as a consequence of your aforementioned bad move. You seem to be unfamiliar with the concept. In case it's unclear, I don't like bullies. I haven't for years, and I've been taking them to task since I was 14. You might try interacting with something other than steroids. They seem to have shrunk your brain along with your balls. Sir, if you'll release him, we'll take care of this, said a new voice. Jeff looked towards the speaker and saw two bouncers. Jeff got off Richard's back keeping hold of his arm, and offered it to the men. One nodded at him, and they removed the miscreant. Jeff turned to see Charlie comforting a crying Emily. The band stopped playing when the confrontation began. Emily, are you okay? Jeff asked. Emily nodded at him. He didn't touch you, did he? She shook her head. Ms. Flair, do you need to take Ms. Davril home? Asked the manager. He came over after his bouncers had removed Richard. I assure you that your group will receive the full agreed-upon fee if you feel the need to leave. None, Emily declared with some heat. I will stay here with our friends and we will enjoy Charlie's music. I will not allow that, commented on, that asshole to ruin everyone's evening. Peter, you've been very good to us over the past few summers. Your guests shouldn't suffer. Emily, are you sure? Charlie asked before Peter could. Emily nodded emphatically. Charlie turned back to Peter. Peter, we'll stay, and there's no need to be all stiff and formal with us. This isn't your fault. Could we ask for a short break, though, so we can grab a little fresh air first? Of course, Charlie. You know the band is one of our biggest draws of the summer when we're able to schedule you, right? So take all the time you need. Peter turned to Jeff and held out his hand. I'm Peter Willington, the manager here. 
Your drinks are on the house tonight. Thanks for keeping Emily safe. Jeff shook the man's hand before he escorted the two women outside. Gravel crunched behind the group after they stepped out of the doorway. Jeff spun towards the sound and moved to protect the women. Richard the Dick bore down on them, his face an angry mask. A massive roundhouse right hurtled towards Jeff. Jeff ducked under the swing. He delivered a right to Richard's stomach, which stopped him. A short left to the kidney stood Richard up, and a right cross to Richard's jaw shattered it. Richard spun from the final impact, already unconscious. He dropped face first to the sidewalk like a felled tree, breaking his nose. The bouncers ran up along with Peter and the rest of the band. Jeff straightened his shirt and stretched his neck, popping the vertebrae loud enough that everyone heard the sound. He looked at Peter. I'm a paratrooper, you might want to order more alcohol. The three friends returned to the ladies' condo at 2.30 in the morning. Despite the altercation, the band had a very successful night for the band. They emptied the tip jar five times, pocketing an unprecedented amount for themselves. Many people came up to Jeff during the night to shake his hand for how he handled Richard. The man seemed to be very unpopular. Jeff dropped onto a kitchen chair to untie his shoes, weary. Twenty hours was a long time to be awake, especially with two adrenaline surges so close to the end of that time. When Jeff straightened up from that task, a body slid onto his lap. Arms hugged him tightly. He registered Emily's blonde hair while she pressed her lips to his in a firm, warm kiss. Jeff, thank you for a wonderful night. You helped bury many demons for me tonight with how you treated me and protected me from Richard. She kissed him again before sliding off his lap. Charlie took Emily's place and gave Jeff a deep kiss also. The kiss rivaled the best he'd had in the past. Charlie gave him a look of adoration mixed with thanks before sliding off his lap and walking to the bedroom she shared with Emily. Jeff sighed, collected his shoes and collapsed into his bed, fully clothed. He was asleep in seconds. Jeff gulped air while he stepped back onto the path leading out of the dunes his legs shaking. He made his way back to the road after his 45-minute run on the pebbly beach. Jeff needed a hot breakfast, hot coffee, and an even hotter shower, though they didn't need to occur in that order. Jeff should probably burn the clothes he wore during his run. Jeff walked back to the women's condo complex. He unlocked the door as slowly as he could, trying not to wake them. Charlie and Emily greeted him with chuckles when he opened the door, knowing what he tried to do. You couldn't sleep late either, Charlie asked from the couch where she curled up with Emily. Glancing at the clock, Jeff saw that he'd been out for two hours, and it was now 10.30. Ah, hey, I got five and a half hours of sleep, so that's a full night for me. Anyway, do either of you ladies need the bathroom before I run through the shower? No, we're both good. What do you want to do today? Charlie asked while holding Emily's hand. The weather looks like it's going to be good. It already feels like a beach day. Sounds good to us. So we'll get ready, and we can leave when you get out of the shower and get dressed? Sounds like a plan. Jeff did something he was quite unaccustomed to doing. Nothing. Additionally, he soaked up the sun while lying on his towel on Herring Cove Beach, trying to eradicate the farmer's tan earned in the front seat of his ambulance. The gentle sound of the waves mixed with the laughter of children. Jeff drifted in and out of sleep. Jeff could afford to catch up on his sleep after his long day yesterday, but not the lobster-like sunburn that would come with a prolonged nap. Jeff registered the sound of someone greeting Charlie and Emily and looked up. The man greeting his friends did so in a much friendlier manner than the dick last night. Both women wore smiles on their faces, so Jeff wasn't worried. He sat up. Bax, this is Jeff Knox, said Emily, handling the introductions. He was our knight in shining armor last night. Jeff popped to his feet. Jeff, this is Chris Bandixall, one of the owners of the Draft House. The Draft House was the venue for last night's entertainment, both planned and unplanned. Jeff extended his hand for a shake. Jeff, good to meet you, boomed Bandixall. He noticed the scars on Jeff's left shoulder and the tattoo on his right. Panama? Panama, Jeff confirmed. 504th Pure. Bandixall nodded. I was in the 325th Air during Grenada. Nice job last night. 
I hear you took care of business. Jeff shrugged. I was lucky to have a thoughtful opponent. He brought his glass jaw with him. Bandaxol laughed. Well, whatever you attribute your success to, thank you for keeping these ladies safe. Girls, there's a table for three reserved under your names at Maxine's for 530. It's the ownership group's way of apologizing for last night and thanking you for staying. Charlie and Emily explained that Maxine's was the Outer Cape's newest upscale eatery, located in Provincetown's East End. Jeff was glad he'd thought to pack good casual clothes. Since it was three in the afternoon, the friends thanked backs and began to gather their things. Jeff trailed three women while they wound through Maxine's, the restaurant's hostess, Charlie and Emily. The hostess led them to a large table next to a bank of windows overlooking the rear garden. Jeff seated both women before sitting. You clean up even better than I remember, Jeff, Charlie joked. We oui, Trebo, agreed Emily. Like I can compare to you two ladies? Jeff offered in return. You do own mirrors, right? Both blushed at the compliment and looked back down at their menus. They ordered their meals when the waiter returned with their drink order. Jeff raised his glass of beer when the server left. Ladies, may I propose a toast? A toast to the kindness of the fates in bringing me to the right spot at Wood End yesterday? For allowing me to start a new friendship with Emily while renewing one with Charlie? And for allowing me to experience a terrific night with new friends last night, un verre à l'amitié, a toast to friendship. To friendship, replied Charlie as their glasses touched. À l'amitié, Emily repeated as her eyes watered, grateful at being included. They sipped at their drinks to complete the toast. Emily addressed Jeff after the drinks were back on the table, grasping Charlie's hand. Jeff. In 36 hours, you've managed to charm someone deathly afraid to be around men. You didn't hold me at arm's length or treat me differently because you just met me. You didn't bat an eye before you'd accepted me and my place in Charlie's life. You've given me back the chance to live a normal, relaxed life without the fear that half the population is evil. Jeff, Charlie and I talked about this while you took your shower. We want to offer you the empty bedroom at our condo in Malden. Jeff was stunned to silence, reduced to blinking in disbelief at the two young ladies who shared his table. Emily, he croaked. He took a sip of his water and tried again. Emily, Charlie, I am deeply humbled by your offer. Are you both certain about this? This is a little more than letting a friend crash at your place for a few days. Jeff, we are sure, Emily assured him. I didn't quite believe Charlie at first when she told me of how you quickly make people feel at ease even after I'd experienced it myself. Being around you yesterday, however, I began to understand. By the time we left the draft house last night, I was a convert. You need a place near Boston, a way to escape the current situation back home, and we are happy to offer that to you in this way. Jeff couldn't do anything but accept the women's offer. He had his way out. Source August 1993, Bent Avenue, Malden, Massachusetts, Charlie and Emily both moaned when they tasted their first forkfuls of dinner. Jeff chuckled while he watched the two women. They ate like they'd be getting an ambulance call any second, shoveling food in madly. Jeff could hear his drill sergeant in his head. Eat it now, taste it later. May I safely assume that you ladies like dinner? He asked. You can't ever move out now, Emily exclaimed between bites. You're gonna stay right here and be our chef. I think Mr. Brophy might be a little upset if I don't show up for my first day of work tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Brophy will live, Charlie mumbled, her mouth full. I'd like to have an EMS career before I torpedo it, Charlie. Will I see you tomorrow, do you think? Charlie nodded as she finished chewing. They usually bring the new people through to see the ER during the day shift, so probably, yes. Want to have a little fun? Why am I nervous? Jeff explained his idea. Charlie shook her head, casting a glance at Emily. Her partner was trying to laugh with a mouthful of food. Such a troublemaker you are. Troublemaker? Moy? Surely you're joking? No, I'm not. And don't call me Shirley. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know why they're making you ride for three weeks, Aaron Steele commented the following day. Jeff was riding third with the crew he met two weeks ago when dropping off his application. 
I mean, it's not like you don't know the job after a year full-time. Well, I don't know the area, or how things are done here versus back in Springfield. But hey, if they want to pay me to ride third, who am I to argue? I'll get some good practice writing Brophy's version of run reports, too. Jeff, you're about the only person we've had ride with us who hasn't bitched about paperwork, Robin Fisk commented from the back of the truck. Or about having to ride third for as long as you are. They let Jeff ride in the front passenger seat so he could see where they were going. Jeff would need to drive around by himself to learn the area. Guys, if I'm going to stay in EMS, which seems pretty likely I'll be writing paperwork for some time anyway, it seems to be the one constant across all career fields. Even with a year's experience, I'm the FNG, plain and simple. My ride time won't last forever and you guys can get back to your routine. You already bought us each a coffee, so we're not exactly about to throw you out at the next light, Aaron chuckled. Okay, here it is in all of its glory. Malden Hospital. We get along well with the ER staff here. The staff upstairs can be a little pricklier, however. Aaron parked the truck, and all three piled out. The trio walked into the ER through the ambulance entrance, each taking off their sunglasses. Robin and Aaron introduced Jeff to the staff in the ER. They were friendly, but reserved around a new person. Another nurse walked into the main ER from the triage area, and her eyes locked on Jeff. They bored into him. The nurse abandoned all pretense of professionalism and strutted towards him. Jeff stared back, smirking at her. She stopped a foot from him, gazing up into his eyes. Jeff grabbed the woman in a tight embrace. He bent her into the famous pose of the sailor, kissing a woman in Times Square on VJ Day. For long seconds, they kissed passionately. Her colleagues stared in shock. Aaron and Robin watched with mouths agape. Jeff pulled back from the woman. Anything? Nope, sorry, Charlie responded. Oh well, he muttered while he helped her stand upright. You can't blame a guy for trying. That was a pretty good kiss, I have to admit. She looked at their audience. What's with them? I think they're in shock. Did you tell your co-workers you and Amelia have a new roommate? Sure, but I think I forgot to tell them you were male. Did you tell the guys you're riding with where you live? Only that I live behind Malden Catholic in vague terms. Jeff looked at their respective co-workers again. I think we broke them. One of Charlie's co-workers found her voice. What? What was that? Acting. Charlie said, mimicking John Lovitz from Saturday Night Live's master thespian skit. Her hand rose above her head with a flourish. Brilliant, Jeff exclaimed, playing along. Thank you, Charlie responded before taking a sweeping bow. Jeff hooked a thumb at her. We cheated a little. Charlie was the president of the drama club in high school. Hey, you were pretty good just now, but of course you'd have been a great actor back then if you stopped playing sports long enough. Oh, a prankster, huh? Robin asked. I think the gloves just came off. Jeff found the thing he had the most difficulty with, other than the traffic volume, was telling when he entered another city. While he drove around, trying to learn the area, he noted how the cities blended here. Back out by Enfield, the towns had defined centers, long stretches of low population density, and clear posted signs when crossing town lines. In Massachusetts, there is no unincorporated land. All lands belong to a city or town. The cities inside 128 I-95 drove that point home. Metro Boston is home to a staggering amount of hospitals and other healthcare facilities. In addition to the six level one trauma centers in the city of Boston, there were smaller acute care hospitals, specialty hospitals, clinics, two VA hospitals, and numerous psychiatric facilities. Harvard, Tufts, and Boston University each have medical schools that partner with many surrounding hospitals as training grounds. North of the city, nearly every municipality sported a small hospital or nursing facility. Jeff was sure the same was true to the South. He knew he'd learn them all at some point. As someone new to the area, however, it was overwhelming at the moment. Even with Brophy headquartered in one of the municipalities with a functioning hospital, the sheer number of cities they covered meant that Jeff transported patients to and from many others during his orientation. As with any combination, 
Some places were welcoming while others weren't. Malden Hospital ER was by far the most welcoming of them all, primarily due to the performance he and Charlie put on his first day. At the end of his third ride time, Jeff learned that Robin and Aaron's schedule had been split, with Robin headed off to a schedule full of night shifts. Aaron assured Jeff that Robin was the person who initiated the change. Robin's kids' schedules needed someone with the schedule flexibility Brophy could provide. In addition, Robin's wife worked in a bank, and banking is not a profession known for overnight hours. What, do you want to work nights? Aaron asked him. It wouldn't be my first choice, no, Jeff admitted. I'm guessing you'll be headed to paramedic school eventually. That's what I'm thinking within the next couple of years. Depending on where you take your classes, you'll likely have to change your schedule to accommodate them. But at least they're willing to work with you on that here. They even let employees do their field hours here if needed. Of course, those hours don't count as work hours, and you can't get paid and get credit for your required skills at the same time, but people make it work. It's not like I'm not used to working and going to school, Jeff explained his schedule during high school and once he left the army. Aaron nodded. You'll be used to it, that's for sure. At the end of August, Jeff wrangled a weekend off to fulfill a promise to a friend. Jeff practiced deep breathing techniques and calming exercises when thinking of what he agreed to do. There is no accurate description of the chaos of move-in day in Boston for anyone who hasn't experienced it. An estimated 65 to 70 percent of Boston's rental leases turn over on September 1st each year. Upwards of 50,000 students descend on the narrow and confusing streets of the city many of them from out of town. Many move into substandard or illegal apartments, but don't know any better and don't say anything. Boston's Storo Drive, which is off limits to trucks, can't accommodate vehicles taller than 10 feet high. This leads to more traffic jams while the police try to clear the stuck trucks on the Riverfront Parkway. Jeff fell to his knees to give thanks that Heather found her apartment well in advance and that it was clean and safe. He was also grateful that he took the MBTA system to her apartment rather than drive into town. Charlie and Emily both came with him since they weren't working that weekend either. The three friends arrived at Heather's building about 30 minutes before Heather and Tom Cavanaugh arrived in the rented moving truck. Tom arrived early enough to find a parking space in front of Heather's building just off Commonwealth Avenue. Jeff and his roommates stepped out of the coffee shop where they'd been waiting. Jeff made the introductions before he and Tom walked up to the second floor to scout the move. At least the staircase isn't too bad, Tom muttered while he looked over the apartment's floor plan. Thankfully not, Jeff said in agreement. We can put most of Heather's things in the front room, and she can sort from there. Let's get to it. This city's going to be a madhouse in a few hours. Could be worse. The Sox could be in the playoffs today. Right. They'd have to not be terrible first. The 90s looked as if they'd be lean years for the Red Sox after their success and heartbreaking collapse in 1986. The heaviest items to move were first out of the truck, Heather's living room and bedroom sets. Tom loaded them into the truck last in Greenwich. Two hours of hard work by the friends saw Heather's things inside her one-bedroom apartment. Boston University was only a 10-minute walk away. Tom tried to bid the youngsters farewell after emptying the truck. Grampy, we were going to go get some lunch. We owe you that at least. Munchkin, I want to get out of this damn town before it's gridlocked. I'll stop someplace I can park that beast without a hassle outside 128 and eat there. You be careful out here. And kick some tail in the classroom. Grampy, Tom kissed his granddaughter. You don't need some old man hanging around. You kids eat while everyone else is still trying to find a parking space. Jeff, good to see you again. Ladies, a pleasure. Tom climbed into the rented truck. The four young friends waved goodbye while the truck disappeared down the narrow side street. Who's hungry? Jeff asked when they walked back into the apartment. Typical male, all three women said as one, shaking their heads. Hey, this body takes work. It's not my fault none of you appreciate the effort I put into maintaining it. Listen, bub. We can appreciate a thoroughbred horse without buying the damn thing, Charlie retorted. Jeff looked pleased. I'm a thoroughbred? 
I think I like that. I'll geese, Charlie. Now look what you did. Heather grusid. She and Charlie frowned at him, crossing their arms at the same time. Emily laughed while she hooked her arm through his. Let's go, boyfriend. We can hit that pizza place by the corner while these two look like they just bit into lemons. Mais bien sûr, mademoiselle. Jeff escorted Emily out of the apartment, while Heather and Charlie scrambled to follow. So how was the night? Not bad, Jeff, replied Robin Fisk. We only did one. The truck should be good. Cool, thanks. Is Aaron outside already? Yeah, he got in five minutes ago. He's checking the truck. Okay, see you Friday morning. Jeff walked out to the garage to help Aaron finish checking their assigned ambulance. They would work Malden BLS today. After checking their ambulance, the two collected the coffee order for the office folks. This was a tradition for their shift. Aaron slid behind the wheel while Jeff hopped into the passenger seat. Jeff felt some sort of fluid hitting his neck and running down his back. He jumped out of the truck. Jeff spotted the end of an IV's drip set pointed at his seat. It stuck out from the truck's headliner. That dirty son of a bitch, Jeff muttered while he followed the path of the IV line. It ran under the seat cover where it connected to a one-liter bag of normal saline. Aaron finally caught on to what the problem was and began laughing. Oh, he got you good. Yeah, he did. Jeff removed the booby trap from the seat. Jeff checked the vents in the dashboard to ensure there wasn't any baby powder lurking inside, waiting for someone to turn on the air conditioner. So, what's next from you? Oh no, I've been in a prank war back in Springfield. Baby powder and navy blue pants don't mix. Neither does D-50 on your uniform, not a professional image. Yeah, our dark green shirts and gray pants wouldn't hide things much better, Aaron laughed as Jeff tossed the prank's apparatus into the trash. Jeff and Aaron did a few routine calls during the day. They were even able to spend half an hour chatting with the staff in the Malden ER after one such call. Murphy, however, visited them just before the end of their shift. Ambulance 22? Aaron and Jeff both sighed. Aaron picked up the microphone and answered dispatch. 22 assist paramedic 27 on the unknown. City Apartments, 630 Salem Street, apartment 517. 27 responding from the station. 22 we have 630 Salem, apartment 517. Are we going to beat them there? 50-50 on that, depends on the traffic. If we get there first, we'll grab our stretcher and stuff. If they get there first, we'll ask what they need before we go in. Sounds good. A-22 pulled up to the apartments before P-27. Afternoon traffic near Malden Catholic delayed their response. Aaron and Jeff loaded up their stretcher and walked to the entrance. They pressed the buzzer for apartment 517. See? Came a voice through the speaker. Ambulancia, senora. Jeff responded. The buzzer to unlock the door sounded. You speak Spanish? Aaron asked. Yeah, some. Yep. I should have taken that instead of French in high school, Aaron said as they steered the stretcher into the elevator. Oh, I took French too, Jeff mentioned as the elevator rose. Fuck you, Aaron replied with a smile. Five minutes later, Aaron knocked on the door to apartment 517 as he turned the knob. Ambulancia, he called, remembering the word Jeff used downstairs. See, si, a voice called. A key, came next after a short pause. We're in the right place, Jeff said as they stepped through the door. He smiled at the woman sitting in a comfortable looking chair. Buenos dias, senora. The woman nodded at them. Aaron and Jeff could tell the woman was having difficulty breathing and was anxious. Jeff knelt next to her chair and placed his hand on her wrist. Doing this gave him an immediate sense of her temperature, skin condition, and pulse. Hablas inglés? Jeff asked the woman. Hablo un poco de inglés, pero no muy bien. Yo prefiero el español. In Spanish, he said. Ma'am, I'm Jeff, and this is my partner Aaron. Are you having trouble breathing? She nodded. Carmen, she whispered while pointing to herself. A nasal cannula sat in her nostrils, looped around her ears, and ran into the corner of the room. Fifty feet of tubing connected to the cannula through an inline connector. Jeff patted Carmen's hand and reassured her. He also told her he'd ask yes or no questions as much as possible. Two liters? Jeff asked, pointing at her cannula, 
asking if her oxygen flow was set to two liters per minute. Jeff turned on their oxygen and set the flow regulator to four liters per minute when she nodded. He disconnected her cannula from the inline connector before plugging it into his regulator. Aaron turned off the oxygen concentrator in the corner of the room. Jeff continued to assess their patient while Aaron looked for her medications. Aaron found them in her bedroom. Carmen's lungs sounded clear, though Jeff heard diminished air movement through his stethoscope. Carmen, does your chest feel tight? She shook her head. Like, you can't get enough air. This time, she nodded. Aaron returned with a list of Carmen's medications, as well as a hospital discharge summary. The discharge summary documented Carmen's recent stay at Malden Hospital for a flare-up of her COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Carmen, do you want to go back to Malden? See, si, she answered, looking more comfortable. At this point, the crew from Paramedic 27 knocked and entered the apartment. Jeff switched back to English and gave them a report on Carmen's condition. Alan and Sue, the two paramedics, both spoke passable Spanish, so Jeff didn't need to translate for them. Jeff and Aaron helped where they could and settled Carmen on the stretcher. Alan and Sue packed up their equipment for the move out to the ambulance. The medics took Carmen down in the first elevator, while Jeff and Aaron took the stairs, carrying the extra equipment. They exited the building before the medics got off the elevator. Aaron and Jeff put their gear away in their ambulance and were swapping stretchers when the medics emerged. You guys need a hand with anything? Jeff asked. No thanks, Jeff, Sue replied as she climbed into her ambulance and sat next to Carmen. We should be okay. Jeff, you're not coming, Carmen asked in Spanish. No, Carmen, Jeff replied. Susan and Alan are paramedics, so they can do more to help you. Carmen looked anxious again. Tell you what, Aaron and I are heading back to our station from here to go off duty. I'll come over to the hospital and check on you in a half hour or so, okay? That will give the hospital time to get you settled over there. Will the staff there be able to call someone for you? My granddaughter, she's about an hour away. Okay, I'll see you over there. Aaron and Jeff climbed back into Ambulance 22 for the ride back to the station. Are you really going over there? Aaron asked. I told her I would. Plus, Charlie is working until 7 tonight, so I'll call her and see if anyone wants coffee before I head over. You're too much, and you're fluent in Spanish, by the way. Yeah, some. My ass. Jeff laughed. The partners returned to the station, cleaned and restocked the ambulance, and punched out. Jeff stopped at a coffee shop and picked up the order Charlie gave him. Jeff walked into Malden Hospital's ER carrying the coffee, and the staff greeted him like the Messiah arriving. You are the best, exclaimed Ann Normington, one of the other nurses. You think Paul might have an issue with your statement? Jeff replied, referring to Ann's husband. He doesn't bring me coffee. You're gonna get me in trouble anyway, is it okay if I poke my head in on Carmen Vasquez? I told her I'd stop by. She told us, interjected Sylvia Phillips, her nurse. She's in four, go on in. Jeff carried his coffee with him and stuck his head through the privacy curtain. Carmen smiled and waved him in. Jeff sat in the chair next to Carmen's bed, and the two began to chat. She was doing much better, but would likely need another admission for recurrent bronchitis. Jeff took care not to rush her while she spoke, so he didn't make her worse again. Jeff, where did you learn to speak Spanish so well? When I was in the army, there were a few guys who only spoke Spanish to me. That helped a lot. My first Spanish teacher in high school helped me learn how to learn languages, though. She took the time to work with me when I ran into difficulty at first. I got too hung up on trying to be perfect right away. Sounds like a great teacher. She was. I was disappointed to hear she'd moved on to another school while I was in the army. Sylvia stuck her head through the curtain. Mrs. Vasquez, your granddaughter is here. Okay to bring her back? Si, sí, gracias, Sylvia. Jeff rose from the chair. I should go, Carmen. I'll be interfering with your family time if I stay. At least stay and meet my granddaughter, Jeff. Okay, Carmen, but then I'll go. I still have dinner to make when I get home. The curtain parted revealing the woman who was Carmen's granddaughter. Jeff's eyes widened before he started laughing. Oh boy, I knew this was a small state, but not this small.
Carmen, remember when I told you I was lucky to have a great first Spanish teacher? May I introduce my teacher, your granddaughter, Isabel Alcala, 18th October 1993, Bent Avenue, Malden, Massachusetts. Jeff relaxed on the couch in the condo's living room before his shift. His shift would be a backward double, a 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift that started in two hours. It wasn't very often Jeff could enjoy any downtime, and the phone startled him when it rang. Jeff glanced at the caller ID box next to the phone and picked up the receiver. Harry, is that you? He asked. Hey, Jeff, you've got caller ID, don't you? Sure do, buddy. I know you didn't call to chat at $150 a billable hour, so what's up? What, I can't call to say hi. Hi, Harry. Now, I say again. What's up? Okay, okay. I think I know what your answer to this will be, but as your attorney, I am required to present this offer to you. Get to the point, counselor. Hey, that was pretty good. You sounded just like some judges I know. You're charging me by the syllable, aren't you? Geez, a guy can't have a sense of humor? Anyway, Rems has made another offer to settle out of court. Great. I'm sure it will be as insulting as their last one. Okay, let's hear it. 500,000 and a bilateral non-disclosure agreement. Jeff closed his eyes and took some slow, deep breaths. Harry, when I say this, please understand that I am not angry at you. I am not going to kill the messenger. I'm a big boy, Jeff. Let me have it. Here goes. You go back to those assholes in Westfield and you tell them that their offer is even more insulting than the one they made back in August. What I really want you to say is that they can shove their offer up their collective asses like a rolled paper enema. I know that's not polite language, so I'll let you clean up the wording of my refusal. My counteroffer is this, 10 million, and that's 10 million net, Harry, not gross. They're going to pay the taxes and court costs. Jeff heard Harry inhale sharply. Harry, those bastards tried to take my livelihood away. 50000 is two years' salary at a good-paying company, like where I am now. 500000 might cover my potential salary over the length of a 20-year career, but not the defamation of character I endured, nor does it cover the pain and suffering caused by their company. I fully understand that their former general manager was at the heart of what happened, but he's disappeared, so they're left holding the bag. They hired him to represent them at one time, and he acted in their name. Someone's hide is getting nailed to the wall, and theirs is the one currently in my sights. This is a bit of a gamble, Jeff. I'll present this to them, you know that. But they're already on shaky ground financially. Other than seeing you get something out of this, Harry, I don't care. Do they think they can throw some money at me and make me go away? If they don't realize the story of what that numbnuts tried that day isn't already out there, then they're too stupid to stay in business. They should fold now so that any good folks still working there can find decent jobs. I'll go as low as four million net. Harry, so that you get an even million. Remind me never to piss you off. Go big or go home, Harry. I do have to go. Unfortunately, I'm working at three, or I would chat longer. No worries, Jeff. I'll keep you in the loop on this. Talk to you later. Bye, Harry. Jeff shook his head after he hung up and walked upstairs to get ready for work. A month later, Jeff and Aaron got a present, a new EMT to train. The newbie was named Sean McNeil. Sean was a 22-year-old man who was not from New England. How far south of the Mason-Dixon line are y'all from? Jeff asked. Clinton, North Carolina, sir. Hey, I've been there. I was stationed at Fort Bragg back in the late 80s. And don't call me sir, Sean. I was a sergeant, and I worked for a living. So how'd you wind up here among all us Yankees? I just finished my business degree at Duke. I've always been interested in EMS, so I also picked up my EMT down in Carolina. I want to get into the business world, but I think I'd like to be in the EMS part of it. It took me all summer to get everything accepted by Massachusetts. I got everything finalized last week. I wanted to move out of Carolina, and I picked the Boston area. Where are you living? Up in Melrose. Did they give you the grand tour during your orientation day? No, I filled out all my paperwork, but then I had to scoot. The gas company had to check the fitting on my stove that day. Well then, let's get that done. Come on. Jeff showed him the layout of the base and walked him through the office area. 
Then, knowing Mr. Brophy would want to meet a new employee, Jeff knocked on the open door to his office. Seamus looked up. Hey Jeff, who do you have with you? Mr. Brophy, this is Sean McNeil. He's starting today. Sean, this is Mr. Seamus Brophy, president and owner of Brophy EMS. Welcome, Sean, Mr. Brophy said, extending his hand. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. The portable on Jeff's belt crackled with the sound of dispatch hailing his ambulance. Sorry, sir. We have to go. I'll see you boys later. He seems pretty down to earth, Sean commented as they walked back to the garage in Ambulance 22. He knows everyone's name here. He'll even remember your kids' names if you have them. I've been here three months and I already don't want to leave. Most of us here feel that way. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Tim, Jeff replied to Malden Catholic's track coach, Tim O'Halloran, while he tied the laces on his running shoes. You guys using the track? Jeff asked, surprised. It was the first week of December, and the light was already fading in the early afternoon. No, I'm just doing some running of my own. I like to run on the track once in a while, not on the road, so you can kind of zone out, you know? I do, plus I can get interval workouts in. I'm glad the snow's gone. Running on the treadmill in my basement's not quite the same. No, sir, it is not. Jeff planned to run a punishing six miles of quarter-mile sprints, alternating with a quarter-mile of jogging. Tim waved goodbye after Jeff started his third mile. Jeff was exhausted, though he also felt better after he completed his run. Jeff walked back to his car to cool off before driving back to the condo. What? They're splitting up the band? Afraid so, Jeff, Aaron said the next day. Sean had the day off. With Frank leaving for Somerville Fire, they need someone to work with Carly. She'll need more work than Sean. Who's going to be working with Sean then? You are slick. Me? They're gonna let me work without a net? I've only been here five months. Yes, but you've got a year and a half of working EMT experience. That practically makes you a grizzled veteran in the world of private EMS. Plus, you were an NCO in the Army. You've got a good head on your shoulders, you're decisive, you've got great skills, and you're great with the patience. You're ready. Jeff broke the news to Sean when they both reported for their next shift three days later. Ready to ride, Sean? What about Aaron? You're off your third ride time, remember? So it's just you and me in the 22 bus from here on out, kid. You ready? Sean looked uncertain. I don't know. Aaron and I told Marty you were ready last week. You'll be fine. Marty was Marty Friedman, the training coordinator for Brophy. Come on. We've got to get the coffee order and get over to Malden Hospital for our first call. Sean was quiet when they went to get the coffee for the office staff. He was just as silent on the ride over to Malden Hospital for their first call of the day. However, Sean was more animated with their patient, while returning her to one of their contracted nursing homes in neighboring Medford. You better now, Jeff asked after they'd cleared the call. I guess, what if I mess up, Jeff? You will. Sean looked at Jeff sharply when he said that. Jeff shrugged. We all did when we started, Sean. You're going to make mistakes, that's part of being human. But are you going to make the same mistake more than once? That's the real question, Sean. I try not to do that. There you go then. This job is tough on people. You may have already seen some of that, maybe not. You've got to be able to have fun while we do this. Don't let it eat you up. Have you seen a lot of that since you started? I hear about it. People stick with this about a year then get out, or they're in it forever from what I've started to notice. I also hear that this job can be like carpal tunnel syndrome, repetitive strain, police work, firefighting, and emergency nursing are all the same way. How have you dealt with it? Mainly by working out. I hang out with friends who would understand, friends I've made here, or the other place I've worked. Have you met Charlie at the Malden ER? She and I went to the same high school. She graduated the year after I did. We're pretty comfortable with each other and we can relate somewhat to the stresses the other experiences. You're making me nervous now. How do I know I'll be able to handle it? We need to be somewhat nervous. We have to stay vigilant to watch out for ourselves and our coworkers. And how did I know I'd make it through basic training? Through airborne school? Panama? I shared experiences with people I knew. 
Losing my best friend during the Gulf War hit me pretty hard, but I got through it because I could talk to people who understood my pain. I spent a week with Ken's family and had friends in Enfield who could relate. Fellow combat vets, I think people who do this job need to talk about what we see. The Stoic Act is bullshit, in my opinion. Sean looked thoughtful while they drove down Route 60. Just after New Year's Day 1994, Jeff and Sean worked together as they had been for the past month. They received one last call toward the end of their Tuesday double, a 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. shift. Ambulance 22, the Malden Center MBTA Orange Line Station, Commercial Street side, for the man down. 22, we have the Center T Station on the Commercial Street side, Sean answered. Gee, the T Station at 9.45 at night. I wonder what the problem is, Jeff asked. Second. I haven't been doing this very long, but I'm guessing he's out of alcohol. Listen, pal, there's room for only one cynical, sarcastic bastard in this truck, and I have seniority, Jeff laughed. Sean chuckled along with him. The weather on this night was no joke, however. Below freezing with a 15-mile-an-hour north wind, it was the kind of weather that could suck the heat out of you in a hurry. Sean parked their ambulance behind the two police cruisers, one from Malden, one from the MBTA, and the Malden engine. The MBTA police officer met them and helped them access the elevator. It was typically restricted, but they didn't have to worry about passengers at this hour. They emerged onto the platform and approached the nod of first responders. Scott Nyquist, the Malden police officer, saw Jeff approaching and said, It's George. George was George Adler, a member of the small homeless population in Malden, a frequent flyer, and an angry drunk. George was in his late 30s. Jeff could smell the booze and piss covering George from 20 feet away. Jeff positioned the stretcher next to George with Sean's help. When they lifted him onto it, George made a fuss but settled down when they bundled him up against the cold. Jeff tried to ask George some questions, but George ignored him. Jeff then tried to help George out of his coat, which was wet, once in the ambulance. George became agitated and pulled violently away. Okay, George, relax, Jeff said in a soothing voice. <coughs> Sean sat in the driver's seat waiting for Jeff to sign it was okay to go or that he needed help. Relax, I'll need some information first. Just the basic facts. Can you show me where it hurts? Jeff asked, quoting Pink Floyd. George did something unexpected when he heard that. He smiled. Then, he sang back in a clear voice that hinted at the power behind it. There is no pain you are receding, a distant ship's smoke on the horizon. You are only coming through in waves. Your lips move, but I can't hear what you're saying. Jeff joined in with a somewhat less melodious voice. He gave a startled Sean a thumbs up that he was ready to go, then another one when Sean asked if they were going to Malden Hospital. Jeff and George finished singing Comfortably Numb while Jeff obtained vitals and called Malden ER. George, that was pretty awesome. Do you sing a lot? George stared out the back window of the ambulance. I used to. Why did you stop? George looked back at Jeff. Not much left to sing about. I'm a drunk and I'm homeless. I lost my job and wife due to the first, and then I became the second. Do you want to be those two things? George looked at Jeff like he was crazy. No, he snorted. Ask the folks at the ER for help and let them help you then. They can get you into a place where you can start to change. I've treated them like shit for too long. They won't help me. Apologize to them. Be sincere and own up to your behavior. Don't blame it on the alcohol, either. Point the finger at yourself, not the bottle. George shook his head, looking defeated. Tears began to leak from his eyes. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, George. You can do this. Why? Why what, George? Why do you care? I know I've treated you like shit in the past. George, all of us, police, fire, EMS, the folks at the hospital, we all got into our careers because we want to help people. We get frustrated when people reject that help and keep getting themselves right back into the same situations over and over. We react when people lash out, and we react badly because we care. If you show the folks at the ER tonight that you want the help, they'll give it to you. It'll be up to you to make the most of that help. George nodded, wiping his face. God, I stink, he whispered to no one in particular. 
I wish I still had my guitar. Guitar? It used to help me think. I'd play and the music seemed to help me think more clearly. Jeff patted him on the shoulder while they backed into Malden's ER bay. George looked scared when he saw his ultimate fate bearing down on him. George's actions in the next two minutes would determine if he ever saw age 40. First, George did something he hadn't done in years. He thanked someone for helping him. George turned to both Jeff and Sean and thanked them before they walked into the hospital. The hospital staff made sounds of resignation when they realized who A22's patient was. George's head dropped. None of the staff recognized that George wasn't his usual loud, defiant self. All they saw was the dirty, abusive, drunk George. Sylvia marched into George's room with the storm clouds already gathered over her head. Jeff started to give his report, but saw she wasn't interested. She threw a gown at George without a word. Jeff saw the resignation cross George's face. He gave up in the moment the gown flew through the air. Jeff caught his attention and held up a finger, signaling for him to hang on. Sylvia, could we talk in the hall? Jeff asked in a quiet voice. She rolled her eyes but joined him outside the room. Sylvia, give him just one more chance, please. She looked at Jeff as if he'd just asked her to roast her firstborn on a spit. I know I don't have any cause to ask you for this favor, but I'll bet anything that if you give him a chance, he'll apologize to you and ask for help. I bet that he'll apologize to every staff member here tonight, and that includes housekeeping staff. Fine, she said in an exasperated voice. He gives me any shit and I'll roast him on a spit. If he disrespects you guys in any way, I'll shove the spit up his backside for you. Sylvia snorted and smiled, shaking her head. Thanks, Sylvia. Jeff walked to the EMS charting area, where Sean sat with the hospital admission sheet in hand. Jeff took it with a thank you and began writing his paperwork. How'd you get through to him? By accident, Sean. That was pure luck. I was goofing around expecting him to be his normal self and started quoting Pink Floyd lyrics at him. He surprised me when he started singing back. Man, is his voice something or what? Shocked the hell out of me, that's for sure. That gave us a connection I could use to get him to open up to me. I don't know what demon is chasing him, but I can see how I could have wound up where he is. There but for the grace of God go I. What do you mean? If my family and friends hadn't been there for me after Ken died, I can see how it could have eaten me up. I suppose I care too much in a sense. It's too easy for folks to lose sight of the fact that the answer they're looking for isn't at the bottom of the bottle. All that's there is a road to more pain and heartache. Jeff spent the next day at the condo doing minor repairs. The ladies wanted to repaint the living room and he needed to do some prep work before starting that the following day. Jeff had put his tools away and started dinner when Charlie came home. She worked the 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. shift at the ER today. She put her bag down before wrapping him in a tight hug and giving him a solid kiss. Hi, he said in a slight daze. What did I do to deserve that? And can I do it again? George was still in his room when I arrived this morning. He wasn't transferred to detox until about 10. He looked me in the eye when I went in to check on him and apologized for how he'd treated me personally over the years. Overnight, he went from being the most hated ER patient to someone we're rooting for. How did you do that? I talked to him, Charlie. Jeff told her of their impromptu karaoke session in the back of the ambulance the night before. I've got to see where he lands after detox. Then I have to get a guitar into his hands. Guitar? She asked, unknowingly echoing his question from the night before. He sings and plays guitar like you, Charlie. He told me he used to think better when he could play. Charlie said nothing and opened the door to the basement. Jeff heard her descend the stairs before rummaging around in the basement. Charlie found what she was looking for and walked back upstairs. She stepped back into the kitchen, holding a guitar case. Charlie put the case down on the floor and extracted a bare-bones, six-string acoustic guitar. This has been downstairs since we moved in, meaning her and Amelie. I forgot about it until just now. This guitar doesn't hold any sentimental value for me, and it's going to waste down there. If we can figure out where he's going to be after he dries out, 
we can give him this one. Toward the end of January, Jeff ran once again on Malden Catholic's track. He picked up overtime at Brophy earlier, covering a seven to three day shift. As a consequence, Jeff wasn't able to start his run until after dark. The temperature hovered around freezing, warm for that time of year, and Jeff had dressed for it. A Malden police cruiser flicked its lights on in a brief hello as he finished the first lap of his run. Jeff waved in acknowledgement. Jeff dropped into automatic mode, zoning out as he ran. Part of him was lost in thought as he ran. A small portion of his brain kept him on the track and out of the snow. He ran through possible work schedules that might fit with his likely fall paramedic school schedule. He had finally decided to apply. If he could get in, classes would start just after Labor Day. Jeff entered the turn on the far side of the track. He was on his slow lap and would kick back into high gear when the straightaway started at the end of the stands. Jeff vaguely registered a figure wearing a hooded sweatshirt emerge from the dark shadows near the stands. The figure passed through the perimeter fence's gate as Jeff came out of what he thought of as turn four. Before Jeff began his next sprint lap, the figure stepped in front of him and pulled a knife. Oh, for love of... So he went to June 1994, West Ware Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. Jeff's smile threatened to split his face wide open. He'd never seen his little sister look lovelier or happier. As one of Stu's groomsmen, Jeff stood next to Stu and Maddie Masterson, Stu's almost eight-year-old son. While Maddie was Stu's best man as far as Stu was concerned, the state required an adult as a witness. Jeff's name would be on the marriage certificate. Kara looked at her soon-to-be husband with pure adoration. She smiled down at Maddie next. The two forged a special bond while Kara and Stu formed their own. Kara understood that she'd inserted herself into a very special dynamic. Stu Masterson met Jenny Kim early into his first Navy enlistment in March of 1983. She was a 19-year-old waitress at Stu's favorite breakfast place outside the gates of Naval Submarine Base Bangor, Washington. Her parents were not fans of Stu. Stu and Jenny fell in love and married by the end of that enlistment. Her parents cut off all contact shortly after the young couple announced their intent to marry. Jenny and Stu didn't tell her parents when Stu received orders to NSB New London, Connecticut and the Submarine Training School in 1987. Jenny's parents made their decision, which made the young couples easier. They moved without informing Jenny's parents. They didn't notify them a year earlier when she gave birth to their grandson either. Stu only called his family three and a half years later when Jenny died. A drunk driver hit Jenny's car head-on while driving home from work in 1991 and before Stu re-enlisted for a third four-year hitch. Instead of receiving transfer orders, the Navy granted Stu a hardship discharge. Soon after, he and Maddie landed in Wilbraham, Massachusetts, the hometown of a buddy from New London who recommended it as an excellent place to live. Stu was the youngest of five children, fully a dozen years younger than his next oldest sibling, an oops baby. Stu's parents held the Masterson family together. When they both died within six months of each other, his mom of cancer and his father of loneliness, he and Maddie found themselves alone. With no common ground between Stu and his siblings, they drifted out of contact. Stu's life focus narrowed to Maddie's well-being. He found a local EMT class offered during the early evening and a babysitter available those two nights of the week. Stu signed up. By the end of 1991, Stu earned his certification as a Massachusetts EMT. He found a home-based daycare that could accommodate his unusual schedule once he started at CRVA. Both the daycare and Stu's employer did their best to help out the single father. While working at CRVA, Stu started to make good friends again, Connie Willis, Bill Harris, and Gene Chomsky. Stu added Jeff Knox to that list after Jeff began work there. Stu helped train Jeff and partnered with him for a July 4th detail in Jeff's hometown. Jeff introduced Stu to his family there. It was in that instant that Stu's life changed. A pair of hazel eyes froze him in his tracks when Jeff introduced his younger sister, Kara. Stu's mind registered on some level that the eyes owner looked a lot like Jeff. Stu couldn't help but stare at her. 
Something about her reminded him of Jenny in a way that no woman had since Jenny's death. Stu spent the entire cookout portion of their standby detail talking with Kara, and then another three hours doing the same at Jeff's apartment. Following their assignment, the drive back to the CRVA garage was the cherry on top. Jeff suggested that Stu should go out with his sister if Stu wanted to. It was like an invisible wall crumbling away. Stu helped Jeff put the ambulance away and then rushed home to Maddie. Maddie, I think I've just met someone important. You need to meet her too. At her insistence, Stu and Kara's first date was at his apartment with Maddie there. Kara won Maddie over right away by talking to him like an adult, not as an almost six-year-old boy. Maddie was a young man who learned too much about the world after his mother died. Maddie gave his dad a nod during dinner. Later that night, Maddie told Stu, I like her. Stu and Kara began dating after that. On most of their dates, they spent hours talking. By October, Kara offered to watch Maddie on the evenings and nights when Stu worked. That's when she and Maddie bonded even more. By July of 1993, Stu proposed to Kara with Maddie's urging and Joe Knox's blessing. Kara and Stu opted for a small wedding in her parents' backyard rather than a large church wedding. Maddie Masterson hugged his father after the new husband and wife walked down the aisle with their son following behind. Then, turning to Kara, he gave her the same fierce hug and then whispered into her ear. Kara's hand shot to her mouth as tears leaked from her eyes. Really? She sobbed. Maddie nodded and Kara wrapped him in a violent hug. Babe? Stu asked with concern. Stu? He asked if he could call me Mom. Jeff was glad Stu and Kara's wedding invitations asked everyone to dress comfortably and for the weather. Jeff was more than happy to forgo the regular dress clothes for such an occasion. Even the bridal party dressed down for the ceremony, wearing casual summer clothes. Jeff sat in a lawn chair with his feet up, holding a beer, while the party continued around him. A plate of barbecue chicken, beans, coleslaw, and potato salad sat in his lap. Jeff soaked up the sun, happy his sister and his friend had found someone to spend their lives with. The fact that someone turned out to be each other was pretty cool. The almost 10-year age difference didn't matter to them or Jeff's family. Jeff looked over at the person who dropped into the chair next to him. This meal isn't going to do anything for my figure. There's nothing wrong with your figure, Heather, and you know it. You're 26 and an absolute beauty. But geez, woman, stop fishing for compliments. Maybe something needs to be wrong with my figure. I keep attracting every numbnut and dickhead in the metro Boston area, and that's at the BU Library. Well, you do look fabulous, Heather, all kidding aside. Thanks, and thanks for being my date today. I didn't want to come solo. I thought you were my date. Potato, potato. How have things been in Malden? Busy. I'm about to change my work schedule in advance of paramedic school. The good news is that Sean wants to keep being my permanent partner. I would imagine being the owner's son helps with scheduling too. Has anyone else figured out who he is? No, which is shocking to the both of us. We figured someone else would have figured it out by now. I don't think even the HR person knows. And that ties into his scheduling too. We requested to keep working together in an open schedule slot. That's why we'll still be together, not because he's Seamus' son. I have to give the kid a lot of credit. He wants to know the job before he tries to run the company. Kid, he's only two years younger than you. Potato, potato, how is the quest for your masters going? I'll finish in time for the October commencement ceremonies, which is fine with me. I'll already be working on my doctorate by then. And speaking of doctorates, any word from Allison? I know Kara sent her an invitation. It would have been cool to see Allison again. She sent a card and a gift, Jeff shrugged. She's already started working on her PhD, which doesn't surprise me. Allison said she was sorry that she couldn't make it back for the wedding, but that she might be up later this summer, by Christmas at the latest. It's too bad the timing hasn't worked for you with any of us. Pauline, Allison, me? I'm surprised you have any capacity for love left in you sometimes with how we left you high and dry. Mac Jeff's feet dropped to the ground and he sat straight up. Whoa, where is this coming from? Is that what you think you've done? Left me high and dry? Jeff asked, surprised. 
Don't I tell you enough how lucky I've been to know all you ladies, and to count you as friends still? You're here with me now, even though there was no spark when we dated. Allison, Pauline, and I are still in touch with each other on a semi-regular basis. How can I complain about any of that? Heather had no answer for Jeff. Instead, she sat in her chair, staring out at the woods. Heather, Heather, what's going on? What? What if he's not out there, Jeff? What if I've already met him and don't know it? Heather, this isn't like you. What's the matter? Heather didn't answer him again and only shook her head while her eyes watered. You think fate wants you to be an old spinster or something? You think you're going to be alone, is that it? She continued to stare at the trees. It amazes me how often smart people can be so dumb. Heather, as I said to you five years ago, some guy is going to be very lucky when he gets to date you long term. You just haven't found the guy who is good enough for you. So, as a sage woman said to me five years ago, cut this I'm feeling sorry for myself shit out, or I'm coming over there to kick your ass. She barked her trademark laugh. Yeah, good luck with that, I fight dirty. If it isn't dirty, you're not doing it right, he responded while he leaned towards her and wagged his eyebrows. Heather barked another laugh. Keep dreaming, hotshot. I'm a double black diamond ski trail, not a bunny slope. You ain't ready for all this. That's the Heather I know. Yeah, yeah. Hey, have you heard the latest report on the World Trade Center bombing from last fall? No, I've been busy with helping Mom and Kara out with today. So what's the report say? The Fibbies are saying that the Arab terrorists who attacked us are angry with the U.S. for being in Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War. We're all just dirty infidels, that kind of thing. Yeah, and they're mad at us for bringing our unclean water purification technology, too. Jeff shook his head. So we're damned if we do and damned if we don't yet again? If we had stayed out of the Gulf War, we'd have been called selfish. And because we went, at Kuwait and Saudi Arabia's request, mind you, we're still targets? Great, they can do it themselves next time. You'd think between the Soviets and us we could keep a lid on these extremists. Jeff snorted. The Soviets can't even keep a lid on their troublemakers. So many of the power brokers welcomed the hardliners back in 1991 when they deposed Gorbachev. Now those same power brokers are fed up with the empty promises the hardliners keep making. The fact that the hardliners touted how good their military hardware was before we blew it all to kingdom come in the Gulf War hasn't helped. The Soviets can say the Iraqis screwed up all they want, but the truth is, we cut through the Iraqis like the proverbial hot knife through butter. It wouldn't have mattered who was using it. Stu and Sean walked into one of Brophy's contracted nursing facilities in early August. The Malden house wasn't as bad as the River House in Springfield, but it wasn't the Ritz-Carlton either. The nursing home odor was mercifully faint here. This call would be Sean's tech, that is, he'd ride in the back of the ambulance with the patient. Jeff and Sean stepped up to the nurse's desk and asked for the patient's chart. The nurse behind the desk dropped the chart on the counter and turned back to her television. Jeff and Sean shared a look before Sean started his paperwork. Then, another nurse walked behind the desk. Who are they here for, she asked the first nurse. The gorked gook, she replied. Sean frowned at Jeff. The first nurse looked up. They told us she spoke English when she came here, but she hasn't said anything in the last week. Just some gibberish when she first got here. What room? He asked Sean, ignoring the two women. Sean flipped the chart closed and looked at its spine. Seven, bed by the window. Jeff noted the patient's name before he walked away. He pushed the stretcher down the hall to room seven. Peering inside, Jeff saw an older Asian woman staring out the window. Her roommate wasn't in the room. Given the patient's last name and the report that she spoke gibberish, Jeff took a chance. Hayashi-san, Jeff asked when he stepped into the room. She looked back at him, surprised that someone in the Malden house would speak Japanese. He bowed to her and continued in that language. Konnichiwa, Hayashi-san. I'm Jeff. My partner Sean and I have come to take you to your appointment. Mrs. Hayashi continued to look at him in shock. It's been some time since I've spoken Japanese, so I apologize for my pronunciation, he said. Your pronunciation is perfect. 
I am shocked to find someone here who speaks Japanese. How is it that you know the language? My best friend, ma'am. He taught me while we were roommates in the army. <laughs> he taught you well. Thank you, ma'am. How long have you been here? A week. My loving daughter and her good-for-nothing husband found a way to dump me here after my leg surgery. They're off on some year-long cruise around the world while this place sucks my accounts dry. You can't return home once your rehab is complete, she snorted. After my husband died, our daughter convinced me to sell our house and move in with them. My grandson was in college at the time, so there was plenty of room for me. Now Tim's graduated and in Korea for a year with the army on his first assignment. My daughter and son-in-law sold their house and arranged to put me in here while I was in the hospital. I don't have anywhere left to go. I speak English very well, but I chose not to speak a single word of it to anyone here. I'm not sure who I can trust. Jeff nodded, trying to wrap his head around the situation as Sean entered the room. Jeff put his forefinger to his lips in the universal sign for quiet. They helped Mrs. Hayashi onto the stretcher and removed her from the facility without a word. Jeff offered to tech this call and to explain everything to Sean later. Sean nodded, trusting his partner. They dumped her there, Sean asked as they waited at Brigham and Women's Hospital for Mrs. Hayashi's appointment to finish. I can't believe anyone would treat a parent like that. He was pissed. Calm down, Sean. I know you want to help her, but we need to research her situation a little more. Can you talk to your dad? See if he has any ideas what we should look for and who else we should potentially talk to. I'll call him tonight when I get home. We can put those two nurses on the list of people I'd like to see fired after all is said and done. Agreed. It looks like Aiko's done. Let's bring her back. Jeff looked around the classroom while he settled into his seat. It was the day after Labor Day and his first day of paramedic school. The other students seemed to be slightly older than him. Jeff figured he was on the low end of the experience range compared to his classmates and wondered if his army experience helped sway the admissions committee at all. The textbook for the class looked about two inches thick. It contained a bunch of photos the average person would find disturbing. Jeff found them fascinating. After working in EMS for a while, this confirmed something that he'd noticed about EMTs and paramedics. They were all a little sick. Jeff and Charlie often joked about things they saw at work, but they waited until they weren't around regular people. Those people wouldn't understand the need to joke and blow off the pressure that silently built up inside. An actual weekend off was a foreign concept to many in public safety or other 24-hour professions. The Monday through Friday daytime class schedule would take some getting used to again. EMS was not a Monday through Friday 9 to 5 job. There'd be days where Jeff would go to class from 9 to 5, drive home and nap, report to work for the overnight shift at 11 p.m., and then drive back to be at class for 9 the following day. Jeff would have to do that twice during the week and work a 24-hour shift every Saturday to get his 40 hours. While Sean would work the same schedule as Jeff, the younger man would have days off during the week. As a result, Sean could do his errands while Jeff had to sit in class. With any luck, Jeff might be able to take care of any needed errands except shopping while at work on Saturdays. The first day of class, as with his EMT class, covered administrative requirements. Instructors went over the syllabus and required books. There weren't many books other than the textbook, but a couple of them raised some eyebrows. Jeff wasn't the instructor and figured the woman teaching the paramedic students knew better. Jeff had already read the first three chapters of the text and was well ahead of the curve. He knew he would carry the text and other books to work with him often over the year of class time. By the end of the academic year in May, Jeff and his classmates would start their hospital clinical rotations and ambulance field internships. Is she ready to go? Jeff asked Sean one night two months later. Yeah, whenever we can move her. Mrs. H says her leg feels strong enough for those few stairs at my house. It was cool of you to offer her a place to stay, at least until her grandson gets back. She's a nice lady. She reminds me a lot of Mammy. I can truthfully say that I would have never put Mammy in a place like that, Sean explained. So we're ready to move if they call tomorrow? Tomorrow was Monday, and Jeff didn't have class. 
Instead, the instructor would be at her son's school that night. Jeff and Sean would work later that night, but they'd gladly forfeit some sleep to make sure Aiko Hayashi was out of the Malden house. Yep, the troopers will call once they've made their arrests. We'll go in there like we're taking Aiko to an appointment while they tear the place apart. I'm going to crash in the bunk room tomorrow during the day in case the troopers do call. Do you want to crash at my place instead? It'll be quieter and I know Charlie and Emily won't mind. Okay, thanks, I'll do that. Sean grinned. The partners swung by Sean's place in Melrose to get an overnight bag for him while on duty. As soon as their relief took over in the morning, Sean and Jeff headed to Jeff's condo. Charlie was already at Malden Hospital, but Emily was still making herself breakfast when they arrived. Jeff and Emily got Sean set up in the guest room upstairs, before Emily needed to get ready also. Sean and Jeff were both asleep soon after Emily left at 8. Sean woke around 1 in the afternoon, wandered downstairs and found Jeff at the dining room table, with a coloring book, of all things. What the hell is that? Are you back in kindergarten? Har har, wise guy. This book is homework for paramedic school, an anatomy coloring book. There's one on physiology too. I thought I'd be wasting my time with them when class started, but coloring this anatomy book is already paying off. It's helping me memorize things a lot easier. As one of my favorite sayings goes, if it's stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. At least you're using colored pencils and not crayons. I already wore out my box of crayons. Sean shook his head at his partner's sarcasm. The phone rang. Sean stepped into the kitchen and saw from the caller ID that it was Brophy calling. It's Brophy, you want me to pick it up? Yeah, go ahead. Hello? Hey dad, it's me, Jeff's right here, did MSP call? We'll be there in 15 minutes. Okay, thanks dad, bye. Sean hung up and turned to Jeff. The balloon's going up, as you like to say. Dad's going to have one of the crews get 25 out of the garage for us, so it'll be outside when we get over there. Ambulance 22 was the truck they used last night and was now in use with the day shift. Seamus reserved A25 for Jeff and Sean and this scenario. Works for me. I'm glad we decided to shave and shower before taking our naps, just in case. Let's go get dressed. Jeff and Sean drove over to Brophy's garage and up to the Malden house in 30 minutes. The parking lot teemed with state police cruisers, both marked and unmarked. A trooper posted at the lot entrance stopped them. You guys here for the woman they told us about? She asked. Yes, ma'am, Mrs. Hayashi, Sean answered. Okay, we left the ambulance entrance open for you guys. Do you need someone to guide you in? If someone's available, ma'am. It's a little tighter in the lot today than usual. The trooper guided them to the indicated parking spot herself, then returned to her post. Another trooper nodded to them when they entered the building. Sean and Jeff walked down the hall unmolested. Any staff they encountered looked frightened, as they should be. Sean and Jeff knocked on the doorframe of room 7. They stepped in and bowed to Aiko Hayashi, who stood and bowed back. What still needs packing, ma'am? Sean asked in English. The time for subterfuge was now gone. Just my clothes and the few keepsakes I have here on the table. Everything else is already in storage, Aiko answered in English. Your daughter is paying for a storage place for you? Jeff asked, shocked. No, Jeff, she laughed. I am, though she set that up. An automatic payment linked to one of my accounts. The two young men packed her things in no time. Aiko said she'd prefer to walk out of the facility and not ride on the stretcher when asked. Instead, they used the stretcher to carry her things. Sean offered Aiko his arm and escorted her out of the room for the final time. Head held high, Aiko Hayashi walked down the hall of the place she'd considered a prison for the past two months without a care. Aiko pulled Sean into the large common room, where the state police held the nursing home staff, while troopers searched the building. Aiko asked for and received permission to address the nervous employees sitting in the chairs. She released Sean's arm and stepped to the front of the room. This is gonna be good, Sean whispered. Jeff and the trooper by the door both agreed. I have had the misfortune to spend the past two months and 13 days in this facility, Aiko announced in a strong, clear voice. Many in the room blinked when she talked. Many more cringed when she spoke in English. 
99% of the employees I interacted with here deserve every single thing that is coming to you, specifically because your attitudes and behaviors toward the other residents and me were deplorable. That you say the things you say to society's helpless proves that you are in the wrong line of work. It also convinces me that you chose this work to inflict pain and suffering on others. My stay here has convinced me that places like this are America's new concentration camps. And believe me, I spent time in an American concentration camp before. You can all go to hell. To the few of you in this room who tried to provide comfort to us, I say, thank you. Please know that none of you, nor your fellows like you who are not here today, deserve any of what the others will receive. The state police know who you are and that I have vouched for your actions. I know you have been outraged at what you've seen and that many of you have spoken up. Do not let the rest of these bastards sully the name of your respective professions. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep speaking up and speaking out. Have no fear. Heads will roll and they won't be yours. Good luck to you. Finished with what she had to say, Iko walked back to Sean and Jeff. We can go now, boys. Yes, ma'am, they said quickly, following Iko to the ambulance entrance while she strode down the hall. Sean and Jeff loaded the stretcher into the ambulance before helping Iko into the front passenger seat. This was more of a taxi ride than an ambulance transfer. There would be no paperwork and, more importantly, no bill. The drive to Sean's house took 20 minutes. Sean's car sat in his driveway when he backed the ambulance into it. Hey, how'd my car get up here? Sean asked. Before Jeff could answer, Seamus and Colleen, Sean's stepmom, stepped out of Sean's house to greet them. Sean helped Aiko out of the ambulance and escorted her to his waiting family. Welcome home, Mrs. Hayashi, Seamus said while she approached. Aiko, sin please. Sean invited Aiko in to see where she would live for the near future. Aiko complimented Sean on the home's decor. Sean indicated that Colleen, a designer, was responsible, but that he'd learned much from her. The bedroom Sean gave Aiko was as large as the shared one at the Malden house and smelled much better. Aiko was stunned. The surprise at her room was nothing compared to Aiko's surprise when she saw the backyard. The yard, which backed up to a state reservation, made one forget that you were 10 miles from the Boston city limits. It was quiet and shady, with several places to sit and unwind tucked in along the edge of the property. Eco would be able to recover here. The following weekend, a large group gathered in a restaurant in Newton, not far from the Boston College campus. The three dozen friends and family members celebrated Heather's master's degree in history. But Heather decided to forego a more raucous celebration and have a quiet meal with the important people in her life. The restaurant didn't have a separate function room, but they did have room for the group when they arrived at two in the afternoon. BC's October commencement had been the weekend before, and with BU being a few miles down Commonwealth Ave on the other side of Newton, there wasn't a lot of competition for the available restaurant space. Many guests offered toasts to Heather's academic prowess, both serious and lighthearted. Tom Cavanaugh's toast drew tears when he boasted how proud he was of his granddaughter. Jeff's toast drew laughter and prompted Heather to throw a dinner roll at him, which hit him in the back of the head and drew louder laughter. Jeff caught up with Alice and Jane during the celebratory luncheon. They scolded him for not keeping in touch. Jeff put his hands up in surrender before it got too bad. They then scolded him for allowing his schedule to be overbooked while in paramedic school. His argument that he wasn't independently wealthy didn't carry much weight with either Alice or Jane. Jeff shook his head in resignation and realized that he wouldn't win any arguments that day. He excused himself from the table. Jeff used the restroom and took a few extra moments to enjoy the sound of not being reprimanded. He took a deep breath to ready himself for another round of catching up and left the washroom. As Jeff walked into the dining area, a hand grabbed his wrist and spun him around. Before he could react, someone planted a deep, passionate kiss on him. Jeff tried to focus his eyes to see who was kissing him, but she was too close. Her hair and forehead were a blur. Finally, the woman released his wrist. She trapped him in a tight hug, and her kiss continued. Jeff's arms rose reflexively and wrapped around the mystery kisser. 
After many moments, the kiss and hug relaxed, letting him lean back and focus his eyes. Jeff needed a second to focus on the face of the woman. His brain took another two or three seconds to recognize her. Keiko, 